I think I participate. So some of you can recognize where it was. By the way, добрый день. Добрый день. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, good afternoon. Добрый день, Сергей Владимирович. Бранка, hello. Ah, hello, hello. Hi, Branko. Hi. Hi, hi. In fact, we also um, have a slideshow with short talk of Alexei about Hawking. Maybe we will show the second slideshow in the end at uh, European time about um, 8, okay, p.m. And this I will show uh, maybe a couple times. And uh, when was this uh, meeting? So the, the photos are from which meeting? Irina? Sergey, uh, yes, should know. Sergey, can you say these photos are taken on which meeting? Uh, on Is the photo uh, school in Kazan. It was in Kazan. This is some square conference, I guess. No, no, it is the uh, Petrov school in Kazan. Okay. Maybe you can make some comments. Because I don't. It is uh, 2017, I think. To the, uh, some Sergey, Sergey, Sergey Vernov. Hmm? Sergey Vernov. I, I plan also to to show some pictures, your, your pictures from from Kazan. Okay, very good. But very shortly. <clears throat> yes, we can just uh, repeat once again. This is uh, Spain. Yes, it is Spain, Russian mm -hmm. Spain conference uh, in uh, uh, two thousand eleven. The same place, I guess. Yes, the same place. Yes. In Barcelona. In Barcelona, yes. And uh, yes. this. No, I think you could say that group is. I don't know where it is. It is in Barcelona. Oh, it's in Barcelona. Yes, yes. In Barcelona. <clears throat> ah, it is in St. Petersburg two years later. Also, Russian uh, Spain conference. Sure. Ah, it is in Kazan in 2014. What you can see. <clears throat> This again and so oh. ah, that is also in Kazan, some excursion. What is Sergei Sushkov and young participants? This Sergei Chervon. And also in Kazan, uh, I think it Lots is... of photo from Kazan, Sergei. Yeah. Lots 
this is Emilio Esdaude, it is uh, 2017. Francisco Loba. Emilio. Okay. I can stop. Oh. Oh, hello, Alexandra. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Alexandra. We will start in three minutes. Mm, yeah. Okay. Three, four minutes. Okay. If somebody also want to uh, check, to check presentation, please do this. Branko, hi, this is George. How are you doing? Yes, uh, it's very nice to, to after, hear you. After 30 years. Huh? I am, yeah, yes, I remember very well uh, <laughs> our, <laughs> our meeting you, in Bulgaria. Um, yeah, I think it was in, in Primorsko. Yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, 82. Yeah. Yeah, and you are now in Greece, yeah? Yes, I am in Athens, last yeah. uh, 28 years. Very nice, yeah. Maybe you will come to Belgrade also. And you to Athens. Okay. I will send you invitation. Okay. okay. Let me check if everybody is here. Rashid, are you here? Professor Sunyaev, are you here? I think not yet. Not yet. So, because yet. I suppose uh, that he will be the first speaker. Then let me check everybody. Varovich, are you here? Igor? Yes. Are you here? You use your presentation. Are you. The new, okay. The new, let us check the new. Okay. Um, Alexey, could you please make Stepanenko a co-host because he will show Varovich. Uh, Stepanenko. Uh, yes. Hello. Ah, Daniel Stepanenko, okay. Co-host, yes. Sasha Dargov. Mm -hmm. Sasha, are you here? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe he will come. He will join us later. Uh, Branka is here. Yeah, I yes. so, ah, Branka, do you want to show something or not? Or you will just speak? Yes, yes, I will show it. Okay. Uh, photos. So, could you please make him? <coughs> yes, yes, yes. And have you met also Sergei Sushko? Because uh, as I understand him. Yes, yes. Uh, Sergei is already co-host. Uh, is here, yes. And uh, Ludmila, she will no, she will just uh, speak, not uh, not uh, show anything. Okay. okay. And then uh, we will start with uh, more longer lectures. So maybe we will wait for Ashit. 
But wait a second. Uh, actually, I told you that Sunaya will join, but Muhanov didn't tell me that uh, he will exactly join this time. Actually, I even don't know where is he now. Okay. So what do you mean? So mm -hmm. start uh, without uh, waiting here. So we can start. Uh, and when he when he will come, the, he will join us. Okay. Yes, for sure, yes. But I, I Slava Muhammad did, didn't say me whether he will definitely join from the beginning, okay? Uh-huh, uh -huh. So, but when you will see him, just tell him yes. <laughs> to be ready, yes. because maybe I did, I will not <coughs> notice it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, okay. So, now, now I guess, okay, now it's the time to start. Could you please, this is a uh, show, this is a presentation by whom? By Varun? Varun, uh, is this your presentation? Yes, yes. Could, yes. You, please, could you please stop uh, your presentation? Because, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, stop for, for this time and then we will return to it. We will return, for sure. And, uh, okay, um, Daniel Stepanenko, are you ready to show Varoich's presentation? Да, 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 yes, yes. Давайте mm -hmm. показывайте его. Mm -hmm. Мы начинаем с профессора Сюняева. А Сюняева нету. Ирина Ярославна. Ирина Ярославна, а Людмила Викторовна будет говорить после? Людмила Викторовна будет говорить после Сушкова, да. А, хорошо. Так лучше. А, так, да, я, хорошо. У меня будет неограниченное да. время. Да, вот. хорошо. Dear friends and colleagues, let's start our memorial seminar. Today we have some special seminar of a series of our seminar devoted to quantum gravity. Alexei was in the committee, is an organizing committee, and also he was in the advisory committee of this meeting. And time to time, he participated in this seminar. He made very important remark on the talk presented in this seminar. seminar. So today, our program will be the following. We start from very short addresses. Um, uh, we expected to have Rashid Sunyaev, a first speaker, but uh, may something happens, he will join us a little bit later. So the first speaker is um, Igor Varovich, and uh, approximately five minutes for each of you, of, for each of short presentation. So Igor, you can start. Okay. I will tell three short stories about Alexei Starobinsky. First time I met him approximately at 1966, when I was a student in Moscow State University. By chance, I found myself in a classroom where a professor was giving a lecture on gravity. And uh, it was, he was uh, Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich in the audience there were only one student he was Alexei Starobinsky how to explain that that time uh, gravity theory uh, was unpopular among students let us remember that about this time Richard Feynman wrote a famous letter from the Warsaw Conference on Gravity he wrote that in this field of gravity, there were not experiments, and talented people did not want to work in this field. After that, the situation has changed dramatically. And now we have a lot of talented people and a lot of important experiments in this field. Basically, due to the important, very important work by Alexei Starobinsky and other talented scientists. The second story is about deep involvement by Alexei Starobinsky 
in the philosophical and the even religious foundations of natural sciences, science, and even more related with cosmology. We were participating in the meetings, regular meetings in the Saint Philaret Institute about religious foundations of natural sciences. I would like to stress such important properties of Alexei Starobinsky, like patience and tolerance. For example, some participants told for a long speech without, uh, actually without contents, empty sp long speech. Uh, personally, I was, I became nervous and ran away. But Alexei Starobinsky keep passion and uh, uh, trying to convince people in his opinion and his views. The same story happens with him when we participated in the meeting in conference on philosophical foundations of, of physics, where which was organized was organized. The third story is about the so-called club of the first July. In 2013, the government has organized a radical reform of the Russian Academy of Science. And some members of Russian Academy were just opposite uh, these reforms. We organized some, some more, more movement to, to resistance, to resist these reforms. And Alexei Starobinsky was one of the founders of this resistance. And moreover, he was the author of the name of the club of the first July. We miss him very much in our club meetings and discussion. And I would like to finish this short, short talks with the problems of singularities in cosmology, which was deeply interested by Alexei Starobinsky. As we know, there exists the Hawking and Rose theorems of cosmological singularities. Actually, singularities were mentioned directly in the Nobel Prize race release. Recently, as we know, there is a famous Kerr paper where he stressed that actually there is no proof that there exist singularities. But I would like to emphasize that the celebrated Alexei Starobinsky paper about first paper about inflation is called a new type of isotropic cosmological models without singularity. The problem how to build a cosmological model without singularities, which would be the normalizer, it has a without ghost, is an outstanding open problem for future. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Igor, for your talk. And uh, the next speaker is the uh, academician Rashid Sunyaev. Rashid, uh, please, do you need some to show us something or you just tell us? Okay, one second. Uh, can I... Uh, I hope that you hear me, yes? Yes, yes. yes absolutely. Okay. Um, I met Alexei Alexandrovich uh, when I was, when we both were very young, he was younger. And when he practically first time came to Yakov Boris Zindovich. And after that moment, we were meeting 
regularly. He was coming to the Institute of Applied Mathematics to Cecil Dovich and uh, we were meeting also at home of Zeldovich on the seminars in Sternberg Astronomical Institute. And uh, very rapidly, uh, Alexei Alexandrovich become, uh, became uh, very influential uh, among uh, students of Zeldovich because there was field where he was Obviously, everybody understood that he was the strongest among us. Um, and he was very good scientist, extremely successful, and very good as a person and a friend. Um, maybe more than 20 years, he was a um, member of the editorial board of the uh, letters to astrono to uh, to the to the astronomical journal uh, and um, to the letters to the astronomical journal and bulk of this time he, we were working to the together uh, I as a chairman of the editorial board and he was my deputy and excellent deputy I can tell this also to you. Um, yes, I knew the family of Alexei uh, and his wife, and he time to time he was telling me about family, and um, it's very difficult for me to speak. I don't think that he I I am astronomer, I am not professional in the theory of gravitation, and. Uh, it's difficult. I would not speak about his contribution to science, but I can only tell that um, I was working a lot with uh, with uh, American and Euro European, Chinese and Japanese universities, and everywhere people knew name the name of Alosha. Uh, he has very very he had very very high reputation, scientific reputation, and also great authority. People knew that if he is telling, this is practically final work. And for our editorial board, we were on very safe side because fate of majority of papers coming to us to us uh, in the field of fields of gravitation and cosmology uh, were immediately decided after words of uh, short uh, short letter uh, from Alexei, because everybody believes that if he is telling, he is absolutely honest and uh, knows everything precisely. Uh, it's great loss for us, but uh, my own impression that uh, it's very difficult uh, for me to say that something will live ever. Our universe, <laughs> I don't really think so. <laughs> will, something will occur with our universe also. But uh, my opinion is that name of Alexei will be living very, very, very long. And I'm very glad that uh, his friends uh, are together today remembering his memory and okay I don't know but sometimes I'm telling I I, I believe that person about whom we uh, are speaking uh, that he is in the skies and observes us and let us uh, how to say confirm that we all liked Alexei and they remember him. Thank you, excuse me, but he was excellent person, excellent friend and great scientist. Okay, thank you very much. According to our list, the next speaker is Dargov. Is he, is, Sasha, are you here? No, no. If no, let continue according to our list. Uh, in our list, we have, aha. Uh -huh. Maybe Dragovich. Branka, are you ready yeah. on your session? 
Yes, uh, let me do. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I would like to thank Irina for uh, invitation to participate in this uh, event dedicated to the memory of the famous Russian and the Soviet cosmologist and theoretical physicist, Alexei Alexandrovich Strobinsky. <clears throat> uh, just, okay. Um, <clears throat> my first opportunity to meet uh, Alexei uh, directly was during my visit to the Landau Institute for Theoretical Physics in uh, 1989. I think uh, he was uh, at that time scientific, uh, the scientific secretary of the Landau Institute. After that, uh, we met many times, mostly at, con at conferences. And I invited him several times to lecture at the international conferences held in Serbia. <clears throat> and uh, Alexei came to the Jubilee Tense School and uh, Conference on Modern Mathematical Physics. Uh, <clears throat> here uh, it is. Uh, a photo of participants of the 10th uh, mathematical physics meeting, which we call also School and uh, Conference on Modern Mathematical Physics, which was held in uh, Belgrade in, uh, in the Serbian Academy of Sciences <clears throat> and Arts. And this photo is just uh, on the very nice street. Uh, uh, and in the front of the of the academy, here in the middle is Alexei. <clears throat> um, Alexei gave uh, two talks at this uh, uh, conference, uh, and uh, the first talk uh, was entitled Pre-Inflation, Inflation, inflation Post-Inflationary Heating in F of R and uh, Scalar Tensor Modified Gravity. He also, <clears throat> he also gave uh, the second talk at the same conference, the Mixed Higgs R2 Square Inflationary uh, Model. And uh, here is a very nice uh, photo, uh, also in the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts in the hall entrance, uh, with his wife, Ljudmila Viktorovna. And, uh, uh, there was possibility at the end uh, to have together uh, some time in the evening in the one restaurant to drink some, um, some uh, I think it was beer. <clears throat> I think this is very, this is very nice for the... <clears throat> uh, to be short, uh, <clears throat> to be short, uh, I would like uh, to, to add uh, the end of my addressing that uh, I am very glad to be in uh, friendly communications uh, with Alexei and uh, I have a very nice uh, remembering of, of uh, with him. Okay. <clears throat> Are you finished? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Branko. 
Could you please stop your demonstration? Yes. Yes. Uh, ah, I see uh, Professor Galtsov, Dmitry Vladimirovich. Are you ready? Yes. There are a few words. Yes. Let me also... Uh, can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, so, dear, uh, dear family, friends and colleagues, I would like to say a few words about the beginning of scientific career of uh, Alexei. Uh, I uh, first uh, saw, it, uh, saw him in our department in 1969. Uh, in in <clears throat> and uh, uh, that time I was uh, young member of the department, um, I was appointed a curator of the new group of students. And when I met this group, I immediately drew attention to young men uh, who differ from the others <clears throat> in some kind of seriousness. And uh, sometimes he would give you a look that seemed to penetrate inside you. It was, uh, you know this look well. It stayed with Alexei for the rest of his life. And look, uh, which uh, I would... Uh, uh, called uh, the look of insight and pretty soon he became clear that behind this was true ability to penetrate deeply into the essence of things, not only in physics. Alexei was interested in the history and culture of many uh, countries and peoples and loved to travel and always uh, demonstrated deep of knowledge and uh, lively interest. I want to talk um, a little bit about his scientific first scientific works written when he was still a student. His supervisor was Zildovich, a scientist with a great wide range of interests and knowledge, and a man with sparkling eyes and a great sense of humor. Zildovich was able to explain the essence of complex physical phenomena in his fingers, but uh, without resorting uh, to strict mathematical construction. But Alexei, from the very beginning, showed precisely a penchant for deep and beautiful mathematical calculations. He never limited himself to quality of reasoning and speculation, but always found another great rigorous mathematical formulation of the problems. His first work devoted to quantum production of particles in anisotropic cosmological models was published with Zildovich in uh, 71 when he was still a student, and, but it, it was already a mature work. Uh, essentially opening the way of modern understanding of the early universe. The idea was a uh, of mere possibility of quantum creation was just formulated a few uh, years uh, before, and uh, mm, it was just the beginning of this era. But Alexei was one of the first to understand that it was possible to explain the isotropy of the universe using the idea of quantum creation. He was able to perform rigorous mathematical calculations uh, in quantum field theory, for which he, as a student of our department, department had, had not even uh, completely passed the, these exams. His next work, also, work also published in GATP in <clears throat> 73, was the first consistent serial superradiance amplification, amplification of um, uh, some way multiples under reflection from Kerberle holes, which was predicted shortly before by Zeldovich and Misner, but mostly on qu qualitative level. And Sarvinsky was the first to give a rigorous derivation of this effect. His work was notable for uh, mathematical rigor and clarity and provided analytical expression for fields in the kerometric, which subsequently became widespread in the literature uh, on this subject. Then, uh, during a conference in Poland, Alexei uh, told Hawking about his theory. And uh, later in Moscow, a year later, <clears throat> famous Hawking work appeared predicted quantum operation of non rotating black hole, and the causal connection be between these events is beyond doubt. Uh, it is believed that super radius is essentially a semi classical approximation now uh, of operation of black hole, which exists when uh, there is an angular momentum. And uh, this is a discovery of quantum axis in which. Uh, uh, Alexei participated uh, clearly. It is his not uh, less than his uh, 
achievement in comes cosmology. And another important work uh, during this period was the proof of quantum instability of Cauchy horizons present in the classical solution for charged and rotating uh, black holes. An infinite blue shift near Cauchy horizon, which uh, essentially means an instability to external disturbances, but Stravinsky showed that instability can uh, also occur at the level of quantum fluctuations, so there is no need to introduce classical perturbation to prove that the <coughs> Cauchy horizon will be turned to a singularity. And um, now it was uh, just uh, the beginning of his uh, approach to the main discovery proved that vacuum polarization and Friedman models leads to exponential inflation. In 75, Alexei defended his PhD thesis under guidance of Zildovich, and he didn't defend his doctoral dissertation like his teacher, uh, Alexei, was just working. And he was one of the most invited uh, scientists abroad, often visiting the famous DNTP laboratory in Cambridge, Yukawa Institute, and a number of scientific centers in France. But uh, and he always uh, deeply penetrated the history and culture of countries he visited. But he never left Russia for a long period of time. His conscious choice was to serve Russian science. A significant uh, uh, work were published in G GETP, GETP letters and astronomical journals. And he brought to the to these journals many thousands of references. Uh, he wrote articles in very good Russian, in the in best tradition of Russian physical and mathematical literature, Landau, Lipschitz, Gortz, and so on. And uh, uh, always he brought his works to perfection, in ling in, even linguistic. Uh, Alexei devoted uh, a lot of effort working, effort working in, uh, in editorial board of these journals, uh, as well as journals for foreign. And few words, uh, Russian gravitational society, maybe uh, Sergei Sushkov tell more, more about that. Uh, that the Russian gravitational association was created after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was preceded by Petrov, Fok, and the Banenka uh, Gravitational Commission of uh, Higher Education. And uh, it coordinated, uh, this association coordinated many conferences inside Russian, Russian Gravitation Conference. And uh, Rabinsky was one of the few Russ academicians who participated in, in this conference organized by association. After the death of Melnikov, he was elected as president of Russian Gravitation Society. It was a great important importance for raising the layer of his search and gravity in Russian University. And he developed close relation with Kazan. And the last event was in Kazan, and it was just three weeks before his southern days. Uh, he was at the peak of his creative creative career and could have done much more. So fond memory of Alexei. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dmitry Vladimirovich. And uh, also, uh, now uh, maybe Sergei Sushkov will give us a few words. Could you stop your presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, let me. Don't worry, we have it. Uh, we have uh, just, just a moment. Just, just a moment. Could you see? Yes. My screen. Full screen. Could you please? Make it? If not, it's also okay. No, no. Ah. no. it's okay now. Very good. Very good. Okay. First of all, let me thanks uh, Irina. Uh, for inviting uh, to this uh, meeting and uh, in my short speak uh, in my short talk I, I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, uh, Alexei Strabinsky in Kazan his scientific activity in Kazan and uh, oops it's what is what is it it's it's uh, 
the last. So this is first page, yeah. So uh, Alexei Alexandrovich Starobinsky joined uh, to our scientific group in uh, 2012. Uh, at that moment, the Russian government started the program, so-called program of uh, com competitive growth of uh, Russian universities. And at that, at that moment, I uh, just called to Alexei Alexandrovich and uh, invite him to participate uh, as a chief leader of new laboratory. And Alexei, uh, well, agree with this uh, invitation and start working at Kazan. Of course, it, it was just a part of his uh, positions, uh, but he started working as a chief researcher of the laboratory cosmology. And he works there uh, from the September of 12 uh, up to the very end of his life. And uh, uh, also, uh, lots of other activities connected Alexei Starobinsky with Kazan University. Uh, for example, Alexei Alexandrovich, uh, he was a member of International Commission for awarding uh, of medals and prizes named after Lobachevsky. And... Uh, uh, this is famous med medal, and uh, uh, th this uh, medal and prize was renewed uh, in uh, 1217. And from this time, Starobinsky participated in this commission and uh, regularly visited K Kazan, Kazan University, for uh, various uh, discussions and of this problem. And uh, by the way, in uh, in November of 2023, uh, he participated in, in this ceremony of uh, giving medal and prize after Lobachevsky. Uh, also in 2018, uh, Alexei uh, Strabinsky uh, became to be honorary doctor of Kazan University. And uh, you see that 2018, it's, um, it's a year of anniversary, seven, uh, 70th anniversary of Alexei. And uh, I will show some photos later. Uh, also, Alexei Alexandrovich was uh, chair of the advisory or program committee of Petrov School. Uh, Petrov School is uh, quite regular. Uh, sorry? Uh, so Petro, Petrov School is a regular, regular conference and uh, starting from uh, 14, uh, Alexei Alexandrovich uh, participated uh, in organization of this conference and uh, participated in uh, the some sessions of conference, uh, gave, gave lots of uh, plenary talks and so on. And so 14, 16, 17, 18, 22, and the last conference, it, it was the end of November, uh, just a couple of weeks before his uh, death, so 23. Also, uh, uh, Alexei Alexandrovich, he, he was a leader of uh, several projects supported um, by the Russian uh, Scientific Foundation. And since uh, 16, uh, we win uh, some grants. And of course, uh, this uh, participation uh, essentially raised raise the scientific level of our our group. Okay, uh, about uh, science activity and uh, coordinations of research and 
in field which field we we are mostly working uh, uh, concerning modern series of modified gravity and their current applications in cosmology and astrophysics and uh, of course uh, in framework of this uh, activity lots of paper was published but uh, we have some joint uh, publications with Alexei Strabinsky and it's quite interesting work I, I mean quite interesting for <laughs> Alexei Alexandrovich not not only for me or for uh, Mikhail Volkov and we, we discussed these works and uh, at, at the last uh, last November we discussed uh, the, the continuation of this work and uh, so I hope that at last a couple of work uh, will be uh, made uh, after after influence inf of Strabinsky. Okay, uh, some some photos. Uh, this 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 is a photo from 2018, and uh, there was a special ceremonial meeting in Kazan University dedicated to conferring the title of honorary doctor of Kazan University. And uh, this is a uh, very, very nice Imperial Hall of Kazan University and lots of people was there. And uh, uh, for example, uh, this is uh, Ludmila Viktorovna, who uh, she, she also was uh, there in this in this ceremony and this is our vice vice rector and so on and lots of presents and it was very very nice uh, ceremony and uh, also uh, some photos from uh, Petrov school actually Alexey Alexandrovich participated uh, from the uh, 14th, he participated all Petrov schools uh, without excluding, and uh, he he, he uh, well uh, he was very serious about this uh, conference, and uh, uh, he was invited young people uh, to to participate in this conference and. He, he gave lots of not only uh, purely scientific uh, lectures, but also some uh, some lect lectures like uh, like school uh, lecture lectures. Uh, and it was very, very nice and very useful for young people, especially. Uh, well, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, just just as a uh, final final word uh, we plan to name the laboratory which are existing now laboratory cosmology uh, after after the name of Alexei Strabinsky and uh, I I have already asked our our uh, rector uh, and I, I think that the next November, uh, the laboratory start uh, will bear the name of Alexei Alexandrovich Strabinsky. So thank you. Okay, thank you for your words. Next, we can listen the address to us by Lyudmila Viktorovna Strabinskaya, please. Людмила will speak Russian, but Алексей Кошелев will kindly translate. Да, да, конечно. Здравствуйте. Сначала я хочу поблагодарить всех, кто прислал свои воспоминания об Алексее Александровиче и всех тех, кто сегодня принимает участие в семинаре ему посвящен. Всех благодарю вас. Я не буду рассказывать о нем, как об ученом, вы знаете, это лучше меня. Uh, so, давайте я переведу такими вот, кусками. Uh, so, uh, uh, Людмила Викторовна, видео профессор Старобинский, thanks all people 
who uh, sent uh, memories and notes about uh, encounters with Alexis Stravinsky to her. And uh, she also thanks everyone who is attending today. And uh, uh, now she will continue talking about uh, personality of Professor Stravinsky. <laughs> Он помогал всем, кто к нему обращался за помощью, и всегда никогда никому не отказывал. Он был очень добрый. Еще хочу рассказать, как он работал дома. Он вставал утром и после завтрака садился за свой рабочий стол, за компьютер, работал до обеда. После обеда он снова садился за компьютер, снова работал часов до пяти, когда он позволял себе немножко отдохнуть, и мы ходили на прогулки. Вот. И потом вечером после ужина он опять садился работать. Очень любил работать ночью, потому что, как он говорил, ему никто ночью не мешал. The first and the utmost priority thing about Professor Starobinsky is that he was extremely kind-hearted person. He was a person kind-hearted in all respects and in all aspects of life. And also he was extremely devoted to work and he was working all day long he was uh, uh, after waking up and having breakfast he was always working until lunch he was always uh, working with computers then again he was working until 5 p.m then of course as everyone needs he was relaxing a little bit but after dinner he was all he was often working again and especially he was liking to work in the night because he was uh, stressing that night is a time when uh, nobody is uh, disrupting your working process. Можно было заглянуть к нему в 3-4 часа ночи. Он уже не сидел за компьютером, он сидел в кресле и читал какую-то книгу. Сначала я видел, как он листал эту книгу быстро, быстро, быстро. Это он так отдыхал, он читал детективы таким вот образом. И Он листал книгу, и мне казалось, что он просто просматривает книгу. Но потом, как оказалось, что он очень подробно знает все содержание книги, долго его помнит, потому что он обладал таким навыком быстрого чтения, когда схватывал сразу по почти по полстраницы вот содержание. Это было удивительное свойство, поэтому он мог прочесть очень-очень много книг. One of the interesting thing, even if uh, uh, Ludmila Viktorovna was uh, coming to a room of Professor Starobinsky uh, during the night around three or four o'clock, it was possible to see that he is reading. And the first impression was that he not exactly reading, but rather just uh, listing pages of a book. But apparently he had uh, uh, skill to read uh, very fast and memorize very quickly and uh, even though it looked like he just uh, briefly looking at some moments in the book apparently he <clears throat> got everything in his memory and he was not only uh, quickly reading but had extreme and very deep memorization of what he had just read <clears throat> and therefore he and during his life uh, could read a great deal of books and uh, got a lot of information from them. И он очень любил Пушкина, он очень любил Чосера, это английского старого поэта. И он очень любил читать вслух. Первую книгу, которую он мне прочел, это был Айзи Тазимов «Конец вечности». А последнюю книгу, которую он мне прочел почти перед смертью, это был Дон Жуанский список Пушкина. Вот. 
И надо было слышать, как он читал. Между этими двумя книгами мы прошли очень много книг. И больших это был и Дым, это было Тургенев, это был и Бесы Достоевского, это был Майн Рыды, много-много-много других книг. Почти каждый вечер он час читал вслух. Надо было слышать, как он читал. Он очень артистично читал. За каждого действующего лица он ему свой, как передавая характер этого героя, давал ему свой голос. Очень было интересно его слушать. И он очень-очень много прочел вслух. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's important to stress that uh, now Lyudmila Viktorovna is talking about reading of art literature books. And uh, Professor Starobinsky liked to read a lot of different books from uh, different countries, uh, Russian, uh, English, American, and he liked uh, very much to read detective stories. And in, he, in the home library, it was around 2,000 books. And what is also interesting and uh, um, shows his character, uh, Professor Starobinsky liked to read aloud. He liked to read aloud in artistic way to <clears throat> demonstrate his passion to some particular books. And in particular, he liked to read books by Pushkin, by Chosov, uh, some books by Azimov, by Dostoevsky. <clears throat> and, uh, He uh, tried to do this every day, and every day he uh, spent at least one hour to read aloud different uh, art literature novels and poems. Еще одним его увлечением это были путешествия. Еще в детстве и юности он на своей байдарке спустился чуть ли не по всем рекам и речушкам Подмосковья. Много ходил среди знаком по Подмосковью. Он вообще очень любил ходить пешком, длительные прогулки на много километров, и вот когда мы жили на даче, и э, э, он э, очень любил ходить э, потом по горам, в горах. Сначала это были, конечно, Кавказ, Крым, это были Карпаты, Урал, э, Памир, э, и, конечно же, Малиновые скалы на Ис озере Исыкуль. Потом, когда стали выезжать за границу, они очень много пошли, прошли пешком по Шварцвайду. Конечно, были в Альпах, и ему надо было обязательно подняться на Пилатус. Вот. И очень много путешествовали по горам на Эриче, около Эричи, Сицилии. И, конечно же, в Шотландии мы объехали вдоль и поперек и прошли пешком по лесам и горам. Uh, another thing uh, uh, told by Ludmila Viktorovna is the uh, passion of uh, Alexei Starobinsky to uh, trips, walks and uh, some short and not so short hikes. And uh, in particular, he liked to have walks in the Moscow suburb and he liked to walk uh, on foot for many kilometers, and he liked to walk around the suburb house in which uh, he and uh, Ludmila Viktorovna spent uh, summer time. And also he had passion to um, come to mountains and have uh, hikes and trailing in mountains. For example, for instance, in Caucasus, in, in Crimea, Altai Mountains, in Pamir Mountains, And he was visiting Lake of Isikul in <clears throat> Kyrgyzstan. And uh, when it was uh, easier uh, and more <clears throat> accessible to go abroad, he was uh, visiting, uh, he was uh, hiking and walking in many uh, natural places and areas in Europe, in Alps, in Erich, in Sicily, in Scotland, and in particular in Scotland, uh, Людмила Викторовна mentions uh, that it was a lot, a lot of different hikes uh, through forests and uh, mountains <coughs> where they had been at that time. Еще когда по своей работе, в связи с своей работой он жил в Париже или в Токио, или в Берлине, или в другом каком городе, то обязательно во все свои э, 
уикенды мы путешествовали по окрестностям. В Париже надо было, конечно, под Парижем посетить и Анжер, и Рейнс, и Ремс, и, и э, долину Барбизонцев, где писали Барбизонцы. И, конечно же, вокруг все окрестности Берлина, окрестности Токио, окрестности Киото, окрестности Нары. То есть очень много выезжали, каждый, каждый уикенд мы уезжали с ним в какой-нибудь город, где он сам как бы вел экскурсию, он прекрасно обращался с картой. Он мог по карте... Даже объяснить дорогу лучше, чем местные жители, когда нужно было в городе откуда куда-то пройти. Поэтому, вот, конечно, это не только он посещал те города, вот, где он работал, но знал и все окрестности вокруг этих городов. Конечно, он должен был побывать и на Ниагаре, и на Рейнфоле в Германии. Ну, ему все было интересно. Yes, so uh, when uh, following the working schedule, Alexis Tarabinsky was in uh, different uh, countries and different cities like Paris, Tokyo, Berlin. He liked also very much not only to visit uh, uh, local museums, but uh, go outside and go to suburbs of these uh, uh, big cities, go to smaller places and uh, be there and uh, travel there and have some trips. And very often there were self-organized trips because he was uh, very good in uh, uh, <clears throat> orienting and using maps. So he could even uh, often explain uh, uh, how to reach some destination better than local people. And uh, he liked very much uh, to visit natural places like Niagara, like uh, rainfalls in Germany and uh, other uh, fascinating places in the world. Попасы на Уаху кричали пуй, 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 надо попробовать было эти пуй, пуй. Потом, конечно, в Шотландии надо было прежде всего попробовать Хайгис, который воспевал в своих водах Роберт Бернс. И, конечно, нужно по попробовать было на Средиземном море Буя Бес, и мы нашли наконец место, где можно было попробовать этот суп Буя Бес с там каким-то соусом ржавчину, ну и так далее. Очень он любил посещать праздники в Японии. Это и, и день мальчиков, и, и день девочек, и цветение сливы, и цветение сакуры. И, конечно, на эти праздники приезжали всегда крестьяне, привозили с собой свою национальную еду, где непонятно было, что ты ешь, но он все пробовал, ему все нравилось. И также и в Индии мы тоже все пробовал, что готовили индусы там, вот, хотя непонятно, что, собственно, это было, ну, что давать из овощей, фруктов, но он любил кухню, русскую кухню, и из иностранной кухни он предпочитал кухню Японии. Another thing is that... Uh, Alexei Starobinsky liked uh, and was... Uh, kind of adventurous in trying different cuisines and uh, different dishes in uh, different places and uh, remote, sometimes remote places in the world, like uh, in America, like in Scotland, uh, like in uh, Mediterranean area. He tried to uh, touch uh, local and more traditional dishes. Also, he liked to attend uh, uh, different celebrations and uh, different days in uh, uh, Japan, like, for example, day of uh, Sakura Blossoming or day of uh, what is celebrated in Japan, day of boys and day of girls. And uh, one of the uh, asp one of the interesting aspects was that usually the celebrations happened uh, with many villagers coming to towns. And this was another opportunity to try a little bit of uh, local uh, cuisine and uh, local dishes. Uh, he liked to test uh, to taste Indian uh, dishes of Indian cuisine when he was in India, and 
uh, even though it was not always obvious what exactly this dish is, uh, but uh, mostly he preferred to prefer to have uh, to like uh, Russian and Japanese cuisine. And, and also uh, Alexei Strabinsky uh, 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 was passionate to uh, art, to painting, and uh, he was not only going to bigger museum like, for example, Louvre, but he also liked to go to to visit smaller galleries to uh, to see and uh, uh, be pleased by uh, uh, works of uh, local painters. He was uh, happy to spend time and uh, efforts to reach some places to see uh, new paintings which he wants to see. Like, for example, he wanted to be in Spain, in Toledo, to see particular um, artworks of paintings. He liked to uh, see works by Goya or Laskas, who was one of the <clears throat> most important painters for him. Еще он любил музыку и театр. У нас была масса абонементов и в зал консерватории, и большой, большой зал консерватории, и в дом композиторов. Очень много было у нас абонементов, мы посещали концерты инструментальной музыки и симфонической музыки. И очень мы любили в Японии, там был такой обычай, по субботам выступали обязательно симфонические, лучшие симфонические оркестры разных стран мира, и американские, и английские, и, и наши русские оркестры, ленинградский оркестр тогда был. И мы каждую почти субботу обязательно были вот на этих симфонических концертах. Еще он любил очень оперу, оперу, особенно он любил оперу Кармена. Вот когда он писал свои знаменитые работы в 79-80 году, у нас дома всегда звучало в это время Кармен. Он часто напевал из арии этих вот, любимых опер. Он очень любил э, оперу, фантом оперы. Фантом оперы обязательно в Англии мы ходили в оперный театр слушать эту оперу. Мы посещали, конечно, и театр Мальера Комедии Францессы, и Одеон, и театр Кабуки в Японии, и театр Но, то есть, и, конечно, московские театры посещали очень многие спектакли. Yeah. Also, on top of all the previous uh, aspects of life, uh, uh, Professor Starabinsky was uh, uh, he liked very much and was passionate to music, to theater, and he uh, attend, He was visiting on a regular basis uh, concerts and performances in different places and philharmonies, uh, for example, in Moscow. Also, he liked uh, to be in Japan because uh, in Japan it was a kind of tradition that on Saturday uh, they were organized the concerts and uh, um, performances by symphony orchestra from around the world, uh, Russia, from US and other countries. And he was uh, very glad to attend such uh, uh, concert and performances. He liked opera and in particular, he liked opera Carmen and uh, Ludmila Viktorovna now recounts that uh, during writing of uh, his very famous papers in 79 and 80, he was often or almost every day listening to music of Carmen opera at home. And he also 
like to kind of support by voice his, the area of uh, this opera and uh, surely he was uh, like to visit uh, setters in different uh, cities like London, like Paris. Uh, he liked to, to attend Kabuki Theater yeah. and uh, for sure uh, many different performances in Moscow. Sport was uh, uh, one of uh, the part of life because uh, uh, surely theoretical work is mostly sitting work. Yeah, but uh, Alexis Starobinsky spent uh, de decent amount of time uh, doing different sports, and uh, in particular, he liked to walk walk for long distances. He liked kayak and uh, using kayak and. Uh, uh, using kayak and go to water hikes. Uh, in winter, he liked to have cross-country Nordic-style ski, and it was a ski trail, which is 23 kilometers, uh, which he liked to make as uh, long as the weather allowed to do it. Also, he was good in swimming, and he liked to swim a lot, and uh, would he come to some natural place to some beach. He was always trying to swim as long as possible to this uh, markers which surround safety area so that to be in a clean water without other people and enjoy the sea. In Japan, he was, uh, he liked to, well, in general, he liked to play ping pong and in Japan, where it's a popular sport, he was often <clears throat> playing it uh, with uh, colleagues after working hours. Кроме того, у него был ведь очень обширный круг общения. Он, э, у него связывали долгие многолетние дружбы с очень многими его учениками и коллегами, с Воровым Сахни, который у нас часто бывал дома, когда жил в Москве, с Юничи Япаяма, э, и с Сашей Камеччиком, и со многими другими тоже людьми. Вот у него был очень большой круг общения, и я очень рада, что те, с кем он общался, помнят его до сих пор. Ну, что еще рассказать? Он, он много возился с дочкой. Однажды я прихожу домой, они сидят в какой-то надувной огромной лодке с дочкой и раскачиваются этой лодкой. У них там буря в океане, они плывут, и надо было видеть одинаково детские лица, как дочки, так и... и... Алексей Александрович, он получал такое же удовольствие, наверное, если не больше, чем дочка. Ну, потом, конечно, на этой лодке они плавали по озеру на даче. Вот. Он учил дочку кататься на лыжах. Ча уже с четырех лет мы ее брали с собой в Азмайлово на лыжах кататься. И... Вот. Ну, вот пока. And uh, furthermore, uh, Alexei Starobinsky had uh, many colleagues and friends, and uh, his uh, friend circle was very wide. Uh, and uh, many, uh, surely many people liked uh, uh, to be together with Alexei Starobinsky. And uh, Ludmila Viktorovna recounts uh, uh, how Varun Sakhni was uh, visiting them when he was in Moscow. <clears throat> how often and friendly uh, 
Professor Strabinsky exchanged with Shinichi Yokoyama, with Alexander Kamenchik and many other people. And uh, Ludmila Viktorovna is very grateful to the fact that uh, many, many friends of Alexei Strabinsky uh, remember him and keep a good memory of <clears throat> his personality. And uh, also she speaks about uh, how dedicated Alexei Starabinsky was to <clears throat> uh, growing up daughter, how he was um, devoting time to play with daughter. She re recounts a moment how uh, when she, once she returned and she saw uh, Alexei Starabinsky playing with daughter in some inflated, inflated boat just in the apartment, uh, like they're playing, uh, <clears throat> pretending to be in some storm in the sea. And later, when uh, daughter grown up, uh, she was, <clears throat> of course, taken uh, with this boat to some lake near the suburb house uh, in summer. And uh, much time was spent uh, with daughter uh, for ski and other activities by Alexei Strabinsky. Я постаралась рассказать о некоторых его увлечениях и его интересах. Его интересовало в жизни очень многое. И он во всем стремился дойти до самой сути. И так было и до последних дней. Он не переставлял, не переставал удивляться всяким событи событиям. Он обязательно, конечно, должен был посетить солнечное затмение, которое было видно на юге Англии, мы ездили туда смотреть полное солнечное затмение и многое другое. Широта его интересов была ну, у -у очень много у него было, много того, чем он интересовался в своей жизни. Но, конечно же, самое большое время в своей жизни он посвятил науке. Это было его самое главное, самое большое его so, uh, what Ludmila Viktorovna is stressing that uh, Alexei Starobinsky was a person with a lot, with many, many different interests and uh, in, <clears throat> in any aspect uh, of this interest he tried to uh, reach uh, uh, he tried to go as deep as possible in understanding uh, and he liked uh, to participate in different events uh, and uh, for example for him it was very important uh, and uh, he wanted to witness uh, sun eclipse and they specifically traveled to the south of England to see sun eclipse one day but uh, Needless to say that even though Alexei Starobinsky had many and uh, absolutely different interests and passions in life, his main and utmost priority was science and to science and scientific work he devoted most of his time and efforts. <laughs> журналист и очень известный дипломат. Он был послом в Швеции, он был послом в Италии. Он знал 13 языков. На любом конгрессе, где он участвовал, он мог переводить с чешского на итальянский, с итальянского на английский, с английского на немецкий и так далее. Это был его дедушка. Бабушка у него тоже была, обе бабушки были известные, тоже Марья Михайловна знала, например, 13 его языков. И еще у него в жизни были очень интересные встречи. Он, его мама, то есть сначала его отец, его отец очень умер рано, и на его похоронах, а ему был тогда, когда он умер, еще не был 30 лет, академик Иофф сказал, что мы сегодня хороним русского Эйнштейна. Это его отец. Его мама была радиофизик, она э, училась э, на физфаке одновременно 
с мамой Андрея Линды. И когда она написала свою знаменитую книгу, подарила ее Алексею Александровичу, там была такая трогательная надпись «Однокурснику моего сына от однокурсницы его мамы». Еще интересная у него была дружба, это с Леонидом Яковенко. Дело в том, что Алексей Александрович родился 19 апреля, а Яковенко родился 20 апреля, в одной и той же палате лежали их мамы. Потом они расстались и случайно встретились в школе математической, кончили одну математическую школу, а потом они учились вместе в университете, а потом мы дружили с семьями и до сих пор наши дочери, которым уже по 46 лет, и до сих пор дружат. И очень часто, по несколько лет подряд, длился очень большой, долгий матч наш, по шахматам между Алешей и, и Леней. Они очень хорошо играли еще и в шахматы. Ну вот так это, это о его семье, о маме и о папе его, о дедушке. So one of the last thing which uh, uh, Ludmila Viktorovna wants to share is uh, memories about family of Alexis Trabinsky. He is, <clears throat> in his family, they were also outstanding and very <clears throat> interesting people. For example, grandfather of Alexis Trabinsky was known journalist and diplomat and ambassador he was working in sweden and in italy and uh, he could uh, he he knew and uh, could speak 13 languages and uh, one of the grandmother of alexei stravinsky also you know, <coughs> knew 13 different foreign languages uh, and mother and father of uh, Alexei Starobinsky also was very <coughs> unusual and uh, outstanding people. Uh, Ludmila Viktorovna now remembers that uh, when father of Alexei Starobinsky passed away and that time Alexei Starobinsky was less than 30 years, it was the presence of academician Yofe during the funeral and he said that uh, It is uh, today we as a funeral of a Russian Einstein. And mother of Alexei Strabinsky was uh, studying <clears throat> radio physics and uh, radio physics in uh, at the same university as mother of uh, Andre Linde. And uh, at uh, one occasion when it was a uh, when uh, it was a book written and she was given it as a gift, it was written on this book that this book is given to the uh, to the mate of my son from mate of his mother. Another uh, personal uh, friendship which uh, Ludmila Viktorovna uh, remembers is the friendship between Alexei Starobinsky and Uh, Leonid Yekavenka, <clears throat> because they were born uh, roughly the same, nearly the same time, and they then they became classmates in the same mathematical school, and also they liked to spend uh, time in common uh, playing chess together. Yeah. yeah, and uh, with this, uh, Ludmila Viktorovna wants to <clears throat> to end uh, her sharing of uh, these uh, uh, very valuable memories about Alexei Stravinsky. Thank you very much. Because uh, Ludmila Viktorovna, uh, she emphasized again that she wanted very much uh, that you see uh, not only uh, and uh, now uh, become aware uh, not only about scientific but also about uh, 
personal aspects of uh, Alexei Starobinsky life uh, and, and his very active life because he was extremely active and uh, curious person in many aspects up to the last days of his life. Спасибо большое, Людмила Викторовна, большое спасибо за ваш рассказ. Как-то лучше понимается, откуда возникли такие светлые и нетривиальные мысли у Алексея в его работах. Спасибо вам большое. Okay, so just thank you very much for your outstanding talk and share your impression with us. So let's now let's go to our scientific program. Um, the first speaker is Varun Sakhni, one is a co-author of Alexei Starobinsky. Varun, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Yes. Please uh, share your screen and I will announce your talk. So, because you don't give us your title. My title is Reminiscences okay. of Alex Alyusha Starominsky. Okay, you, you, you already said yourself. Okay, uh, let's say that you will speak about uh, 25 minutes and maybe we can left or 29, something like this. Just maybe some people would like to ask question to you. Okay, please, uh, can I ask you to make a full screen? Uh. Uh, just a second. Just a second. Um, okay, yes. Take your time. Yes, all right. Remove. Remove again. Quick. Uh, I will make it full screen. Okay. How do I make this full screen? Also, start your presentation, please. Yes, yes. Uh, now, uh, is this not visible? My my uh, presentation is not visible. It's okay. Um, we, if, if presentation is visible, just uh, if you can make it full screen because uh, it's slide show just. Clicked on slideshow. Yeah, it should be slideshow and something there in menu at the top. No, is a, no near is, there is a slideshow, please. Is this all right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, thank you very much for asking me to speak on this very memorable day. Uh, yeah, 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 Спасибо вам большое. Очень приятно вас видеть э, э, на компьютере. Вы знаете, когда я услышал э, про э, окончание Алёши, я был просто ошеломлен, потому что э, Стар... Алёша Сарабинский был для меня нечто вечным. Я его встретил, когда мне было 23 года, и мне сейчас 68 лет. И наша дружба продолжалась больше 40 лет. Это две трети часть моей жизни. And I was always thinking, you know, whenever there was a problem in physics, I wanted to just email Алексей and ask him, Алёша, what do you think about this? You know, какое ваше мнение по этому вопросу? And this thought is coming to me almost uh, every second day, especially with new results in cosmology coming in. They are very exciting. Я хочу, я стою утром и думаю, 
а, надо говорить с Алешей. И маленький голос говорит, а Алеши уже нет. И мне становится очень печально. Хорошо. Я теперь расскажу про мои воспоминания о Алеше Старобицке. I came to Russia, I, I can speak in Russian, but I think I'll speak in English because there are many people who may not understand Russian here. So um, I first arrived in Moscow in 1976. This is the university, Moscow State University. Uh, it was a very big change for me because the temperature in Delhi was about 40 degrees and the temperature in Moscow in winter dropped to minus 40 sometimes. And in 1979, there was a very key year the temperature actually dropped to minus 42 degrees. And 1979 was also the year that I met Alexei. And by sheer coincidence, it happened to be my 23rd birthday. So actually, I was very lucky. Professor Zeldovich was reading his excellent course on cosmology in Moscow State. And I started loving that course. And I, and I did a kursavaya with Professor Zeldovich. But when the time came to do my master's, he suggested that I work with Alexei, and I, I, Alexei was, you know, very, very young and upcoming student of former student of Professor Zeldovich, and I loved working with them, and that uh, warmth of that collaboration compensated for the very cold winters, which were almost unbearable for me. So, at that Alexei was only 31 years when I met him in 79, and already he was extremely famous for his work, right? Uh, done with uh, Professor Zaldovich. And I just mentioned a few seminal papers of Alexei. Uh, the first one was 1971, and believe it or not, it was just his MSc thesis, you know, diploma. Diplom. It was particle creation and vacuum polarization in an anisotropic gravitational field published in JETP. And this paper was the first to show that quantum mechanical particle production could occur copiously in the early universe. It involved renormalizing the vacuum energy moment room tensor, which was an infinite quantity. And it is widely considered a seminal paper in establishing this very important discipline of quantum field theory in code space time. He also showed that how an initially anisotropic universe could isotropize due to the back reaction of created particles thus providing a theoretical underpinning for friedman robertson walker cosmology. Many years later in India, when I met Alexei, he told me that he considered his very first paper to have also been his best paper. It was a remarkable paper, and I really enjoyed listening to it. I mean, reading it. Next was Alexei's PhD thesis, Amplification of Waves uh, during uh, on a rotating black hole. And it was very remarkable because he showed for the first time that quantum effects are really important in the vicinity of black holes. They considered a care black hole, which is rotating. And as we heard earlier from Professor Galso, it influenced the discovery of Hawking radiation. I'll quote from Stephen Hawking from his book. In September 1973, while I was visiting Moscow, I discussed black holes with two leading Russian experts, Yakov Zeldovich and Alexander Starobinsky. He's got Alexei's name wrong there. They convinced me that according to the quantum mechanic uncertainty principle, rotating black holes should create and emit particles. That is a very, very, uh, very important result of Alexei's. Later on in 79, this is the year I joined him. Out of the blue, Alexei wrote a beautiful paper. He discovered that what is now known as an inflationary universe would create gravity waves. And this paper is very important now because you have heard of these big gravity wave observatories, which are going to go up now into space. And this is the smoking gun test from inflation. And Alexei was there right from the beginning. This paper was written two years before Booth's seminal work on inflation. And all the work on gravity wave production from inflation refers to Alexei's seminal pioneering work. A year later, 1980, you know, uh, uh, you know, while he was listening to Carmen in his house, as Lyudmila Viktorovna informed us, he discovered what is now famous as Starobinsky inflation, R plus R squared inflation, right? And this was the very first model of inflation. 
And remarkably, this is the latest CMB data that I'm showing here. The data very tightly constrained all of the models that have been proposed so far. They were almost all ruled out. The model that is bang in the center of this plot is the Starobinsky model. Fantastic, amazing, amazing prediction, right? And, and let's see what stage four experiments, how they will decrease R and whether they might even discover that Alexei Starobinsky was right or not. This is very beautiful. This is very beautiful. Two years later, Alexei wrote a beautiful paper on the generation of perturbations in the inflationary universe. And he showed that quantum fluctuations during inflation give rise to a nearly scale invariant spectrum of perturbations. Such a spectrum is in good agreement with Kobe standard CMB results. And this paper was a pioneering paper because it was written exactly 10 years before the Kobe discovery in 1992. And CMB observations provide thereby strong support to the inflation inflation scenario, one of the founders of which was Alexei Stalovinsky. Next paper, again in 83, it's a remarkable absolutely how, how this period from almost 76 to 86 was so productive for Alexei. There was a beautiful paper on the isotropization of arbitrary cosmological expansion given an effective cosmological constant, JETP 1983. And it's a seminal paper which has helped establish a no hair theorem for inflation. Essentially, what Alexei showed is that an initial anisotropic universe rapidly isotropizes under the influence of a cosmological constant, right? He was here generalizing his early work with Zeldovich on particle production because particle production could do very much the same thing, but cosmological constant was more powerful. And it showed this paper threw light on how a homogeneous and isotropic universe, the one we live in, could arise from a general class of initial conditions. Similar conclusions were reached in the very same year by Bob Wald. And I had the privilege of generalizing this work. Both these papers were dealt with the cosmological constant. And I wrote a nice paper with Ian Moss in England, generalizing this to inflationary space times. 86. Alexei wrote a very famous paper, the stochastic state, inflationary state in the early universe. And these quantum fluctuations, which he had analyzed in 1982, which gave rise to galaxies, you know, they, they, they created small scale quantum fluctuations, which became stochastic. And the evolution of the corresponding space time metric and the scalar field he discovered is stochastic and it needs to be solved using a focal Planck equation. This is very, very important to understand the early universe uh, because it later, and uh, almost at the same time, it lent a lot of support for the notion of eternal inflation and the multiverse. And I'll point out some other people who are working on this very important field at that time. So what happens with these fluctuations is that when the inflaton field, this is Sarabinsky inflation in the Einstein frame, when the inflaton field rolls to small values, uh, it essentially drops down. But at large values of the quantum field, quantum diffusion is very important and the field can move down and can move up. And the field, if it moves up, leads to eternal inflation. So this is the Starobinsky model. And here you have the simple m squared phi square chaotic inflationary scenario proposed by Linde. And this is a picture from his uh, paper. You have small quantum fluctuations and large quantum fluctuations. And I have a PhD student, Swagat Mishra, in, in England right now, who's using exactly Alyosha's uh, formalism to study stochastic inflation in the film universe. So for these very great achievements, Alexei was awarded many international medals and prizes. I should mention the Kavli Prize. And here's what Alexei said. What's very interesting for me is to study what was in the beginning of inflation or even before it. Alexei also received the Oscar Klein Medal and the Gruber Cosmology Prize in 2013. He was a fellow of several academic bodies, and I'm proud to say that he was also a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, where I had nominated him. More recently, he got the Dirac Medal uh, together with uh, Slava Mukhanov and Professor Rashid Sunyal. Again, showed 
you know, the Dirac Medal is one of the most prestigious medals given to a theoretical physicist in the world. And like I say, I was very happy to hear it when he received it. Now I'll go to some personal reminiscences of my Moscow years. These were very precious years in my life. Here is Moscow State University, who most of you know. And my Moscow years were enriched by two very wonderful people, Alexei Starabinsky, Alyosha Starabinsky, my PhD supervisor, and my good friend Lev Kaufman. Uh, here is Lev holding a glass of wine. So luckily in Moscow, I met another PhD student, Lev Kaufman. At that time, Alexei had three PhD students along with me, the other two being Lev Kaufman and Boris Pakwini. So Lyova and I became very, very good friends immediately and started working on our PhDs under Alexei. I should mention that Lyova was from Tartu, but he used to come to Moscow frequently to talk to Alexei. And very often he stayed with me in the hostel, many times for a week uh, at a time. And we used to sit uh, together. He had one table, I had a table next to him, and we used to be doing calculations uh, late until the night on problems set to us by uh, Alexei Starabinsky. So our project essentially was to determine new cosmological solutions to the modified Einstein equations, where uh, the right-hand side is a quantum quantity. And the Starabinsky model was the first example of self-consistent solutions to uh, you know, Einstein equations with vacuum polarization. We wrote several papers on, I mean, I wrote several papers, some with Lev Kaufman and Alexei and some single author. So for instance, my MSc thesis, was a single author paper. And my last paper in my thesis was also single author papers. But now this is very interesting that although they were single author papers, the ideas for them came entirely from Alyosha Starabinsky, who even taught me how to solve these very difficult problems, right? You know, So this reflects on his enormous generosity at, at, as a thesis supervisor. You know, very often uh, thesis supervisor used students to write papers and put their names on it. Now, Alexei was just the opposite. He gave you total freedom and he was extremely compassionate and kind as a supervisor. Uh, apart from kindness, he was also a genius in science. Because you see, these, these, these calculations involved very, very sophisticated techniques of quantum field theory, dealing with divergences, infinities, how to renormalize them. And, uh, you know, I, at that time, neither Alexei had an office, uh, nor I had an office. So I worked from the hostel and Alexei worked from home. And, uh, you know, he told me, well, whenever you want to meet me, just give me a ring. And uh, invariably, you know, I, it used to take me almost three weeks to make some progress on any of these projects. And on Wednesday night, I used to ring him up uh, in, in his home. Uh, and uh, I still remember the phone number. And I used to say, Ayosha, I want to meet you tomorrow. And he said, all right, come to Institute Physics Problem. And I used to go there and, you know, this was this first floor, there was this enormous hall and there were sofas everywhere. And on these sofas were sitting distinguished scientists. And for some reason, they used to all smoke. Apart from Alexei Starabinsky, everybody used to smoke. And so this cloud of smoke was there in this enormous room. And on one sofa was sitting Alexei Starabinsky, and I used to go and sit next to him. And he used to try to explain me this problem. Sometimes Lev Kaufman was with me. And what really amazed me was the speed with which he understood the complexity of a physics problem, right? You know, he just looked at a very complex system of equations and told me what the answer should be, you know. Until today, I don't know how he did it. He was almost like a magician of science, you know. Soshto and Skazal, bill of travel. Absolute nafsio. I used to go back to my hostel room, redo all the calculations, and invariably what Alyosha Sarabinsky had told me was correct. I still, yeah, dosik po ni panyimayu kakon e dhajiru. On prosabil genim. Uh, I, sometimes, uh, you know, he used to say, let us not meet in the office, please come to my home. And this is where Alyosha and Yusa, Yudmila uh, Viktor and I used to live. And it was a very special occasion for me to come to their apartment here uh, because, you know, I was far away from India. I was far away from my family for many years. And the warmth with which uh, they met me, and, you know, I, I remember uh, Yusa used to say, we uh, chai varun. 
and you know believe me uh, the borscht i've had in their house in domna nabirishna was much better than any borscht i've tasted anywhere else in my life you know and so uh, that warmth and kindness with which uh, uh, they met me in, in moscow was simply overwhelming and it's a very key part of my nostalgia about my moscow days those days i i i their the young daughter anyuta was only 3 years old and very often she used to be running around the flat and it was a pleasure to see how 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 how, how much alexey really loved her and how he how he played with her and our our uh, relationship with ayosha and and lucia has it's a pradarshala sushet nogam nobeliat sorakliat and i think just Uh, a few years ago, Yusha sent me a very beautiful birth, uh, New Year card from Moscow. Uh, you know, Happy New Year, uh, signed by her and Alyosha, and I've still got it on my mantelpiece. So thank you very much. Agromne spasiba, Jaiti. Chopli bas paminanya. Agromne spasiba, Ludmila Vitalov. I should mention one more very important paper that Alyosha wrote with Lyubov Starobinsky in 1985. this was the effect of the cosmological constant on the cosmic microwave background this is a fantastic paper right remember it was written in 1985 and it calculated the cmb perturbations in a lambda cdm cosmology right now nobody was talking about lambda cdm cosmology at that time okay and i remember lowa used to be sitting in my hostel room in this double integrals he was calculating the sax volt per beck and i should wonder but you know as a jlr how is he doing this i mean you know kapoi smisl mishes nayam so nyat cosmological pastayan mein we know there is no cosmological constant right and actually it was a, it was a pioneering paper you know alexey was on the spot this paper was written 13 years before the discovery of an accelerating universe and it correctly predicted also the temperature fluctuation that was discovered by kobe in 1982 so note old particle cosmology with lambda term is exactly lambda cdm cosmology so i i use this as a fantastic early paper of alyosha's so we come to 1998 ah so here is 1985 again this is my phd defense with my gurus alexey starobinsky and yakov zadovich and uh, you know it, it 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 was really wonderful after that i had a little party at home in my hostel and both alyosha and lucia were there and uh, i remember i was wearing this suit and i was feeling very uh, nervous and uh, lucia told alyosha alyosha smatrite varun uh, ochen uh, nia dekhayet and alyosha told me varun have a glass of vodka <laughs> and so I, i had a little vodka and lucia again said niet oni sho wo sho nia dakhnul so he shook toast and after three four uh, uh, you know glasses of vodka my suit came off my tie came off and i was started dancing till four in the morning so i have very jokingly was from menanye of my zashita and the and the party afterwards and after this zashita i went to the uk and canada for post doctoral work and wherever i went people were in awe that i had worked with zadovich and sarabinsky you know and i went to sita and i met professor dick bond and he said we must get alexey starobinsky to visit toronto and sure enough alexey visited us for a month or so and luckily lev kaufman was there at that time so we all could give him a very good time in toronto and show him around luckily when i came back to 1991 to india internet became available and we started collaborating again so 1998 was a great discovery of dark energy as i said alyosha somehow anticipated this discovery i don't know how but this began a very ambitious plan of ours a very big collaboration to reconstruct dark energy from observations it led to several dozen papers written up with alexey starobinsky with iuco members most of them were my students tarun saini ujaini alam arman shakalu and me that is by no means the end of the there were many other people who are not mentioned here it resulted in two reviews both published i j p m p and i was just looking the other day that our papers with alexey on dark energy have more than 8000 citations so they are certainly very well known in the international community i'll say a little bit about these papers 
So, you know, at the start of dark energy, there were many different models. You know, some have now died and some are still alive. And there are just some of them, cosmological constant, quintessence, Schaffnerian gas, modified gravity, right? extra dimensional effects. And so, you know, with so many of these dark energy models, one can proceed in two ways. One is to test each and every model against observations. And the other is to reconstruct properties of dark energy in a model independent manner. And we proceeded in both these directions then. We made models, but we also studied the model independent ansatz. And this was uh, the idea that you see supernovae, uh, uh, you know, measure the flux of, of light from a distant supernova. And the key quantity here is the luminosity distance, DL. And this is typically a very noisy quantity. And so, uh, you know, to get physical parameters, you have to differentiate a noisy quantity. And this means that these quantities will become even more noisy. So clearly one must smooth DL before proceeding further. And so uh, this can be done in two ways, either by approximating DL by some ansatz or by smoothing the direct data directly. So we tried both of them. There was a top-down approach to parametric reconstruction. That is that you have an ansatz for DL, and then you differentiate it, get H, you differentiate it a second time and construct the equation of state. And so the ansatz that Alexei and I and proposed was this one. And the Tarun Saini was my PhD student. And also on the paper was Shomak Rai Chaudhary. He's presently the vice chancellor of an important university in India. And there was Alexei Starabinsky, and we published in his rev letters. I think this was the very first paper on cosmological reconstruction applied to observations. It's a very well-known paper. We also discussed the other method, bottom-up, go from equation of state to DL. And there's a very famous ansatz here given by Chevalier and Polarsky. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Polarsky will speak later on about this. There's another method that actually this was pioneered by Alyosha in non-parametric reconstruction. And that is that if you have a noisy quantity, you can smooth it directly. Suppose you have a fluctuating quantity, you smooth it by integrating with a low pass filter and a common use filter is a Gaussian filter. Now, very often this method is used to smooth the density field in the universe. But he said, let's apply it to the luminosity distance or even the Hubble parameter, right? Okay. And, you know, we, we've written a little review on this. And so the idea was that, well, you can't construct, uh, you can't smooth the luminosity distance. You've got to smooth the noise and not the signal. So you have to subtract a guess model from the data and smooth that. That will give you the, you know, you reduce the errors, smooth the errors, and add it to the guess model, and then proceed iteratively, right? You know, the smooth model is now inserted here and here, and you keep doing it iteratively. And after only a few iterations, we got a fantastically smooth result. And we found that we could reconstruct the expansion history to 2% accuracy and the look back time to almost 0.2% accuracy using simulated mock data. So this is a very nice paper. It resulted in the PhD thesis of Arman Shakalu, who was at that time in, 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 doing his PhD under my guidance in India. And it became a very well-known paper. Uh, we applied this, this method to uh, the, the supernova data that was available at that time. And, and we got a very interesting result that cosmic acceleration may have been slowing down. You know, this was applied to an earlier supernova data set. And what surprised me now was that the DAISY results, most DAISY results seem to be showing precisely this. So Arman and I were just discussing the other day, he is now in Korea, uh, you know, leading a very active cosmology group there. And we were both saying how we wish Alyosha Starabinsky was here so we could discuss this new data set with him and, and perhaps, you know, write a few more papers on this because this has now become so exciting. And this was again, a very early result of ours. Another thing that we started doing side by side with this was, you know, to find tests that could falsify the lambda term. So, you know, out of all the dark energy models, 
the simplest is the cosmological constant. Right? It's, it's got this very beautiful form for the energy moment of tensor. So let's try to find a cosmological test that can falsify uh, the cosmological constant, right? The cosmological constant hypothesis. So we we worked, Alyosha and I, on null tests, finding null tests for the cosmological constant. Right? There were a series of papers, some in JETP, some in Visrev D, some in AFJ letters. And so we found that, look, uh, you know, the expansion history of the universe provides a very general, you can just Taylor expand it about the present epoch. This is just some simple Taylor expansion. And in 1970, Alan Sandage described observational cosmology to essentially being a search for two numbers, H0 and Q0. And in this era of precision cosmology, Alyosha and I said, let's define a third number, which is the third derivative of the expansion factor. And remarkably, we found that R is one only in lambda CDM. In all other dark energy models, this quantity R was not unity. We went further and discovered another diagnostic S. And again, we found that S, which is constructed from R and the deceleration parameter Q. And we found that S was zero only in lambda CDM, right? So if lambda CDM is the holy grail of, of dark energy, then this pair of numbers, Rs, which we call the state finders, is one and zero only for cosmological constant. This is remarkable. This is remarkable, right? This provided us with a beautiful null test. And we showed that in, in this paper with uh, Ayosha and my two students, Tarun Sani and Ujani Aram, that indeed the cosmological constant sits here and other models of dark energy at that time we thought of quintessence and shuffling in gas are completely complementary, you know? And since then, since then, this, this method has been applied to hundreds of dark energy models and they confirm our results that this is a very good test. And I'm sure observational data expected during the coming decade will help clarify this matter further. A few years later, we constructed an even simpler diagnostic called the Ohm diagnostic, which does not depend on differentiations. You know, the state finder had several differentiations of the scale factor. And this one is constructed solely from the expansion history. And uh, again, remarkably, it's constant only for the cosmological constant. So it's equal to the matter density for lambda CDM. It evolves in quintessence and it evolves in phantom. So if in omega, the ohm parameter evolves with redshift, then the cosmological constant is ruled out. And this is very easy to apply to data because it depends only on the Hubble parameter, only on the expansion history. And I think you'll see some results on the on, on the on archives very soon with this data set. This method is applied to the latest data set. Skip this. So most of our collaborations were initiated either during my visits to Moscow or during Alexei's visits to India. And they resulted in numerous papers written by Alexei with IUPA students and associates. And there's a partial list over here. And these visits were very, very pleasant. Uh, Alexei really enjoyed Ayuka, right? He enjoyed being there. He enjoyed Indian food. He enjoyed traveling. And this is a very early picture, you know, with uh, very young people at that time, Jato Sheth and other PhD students, Tarun Sharodip. Tarun is now the director of the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore, a very prominent Indian cosmologist. And, and Sanjeev Mitra, a very young man over here, he's now a, a professor in Ayuka. So all these people have since then blossomed and grown and become very big scientists in their own right. And here is another. There are also their students, you know, uh, my students and, and Tarun students. And these are all Alexei's grand and even great grand students. So Alexei very successfully made a school in India. We heard about enormous work he did in Russia, a, a nurturing a science in Kazan and what a key role he played there. But I want to emphasize the key role that he played in India with his numerous visits. And here he is uh, showing us the way ahead in this beautiful picture with me and Tarun Shorodhi and others, right? So we at least all, all look forward to Alyosha's visits to, to, to India. And they were very, very nice, very, very, very lovely visits. We did a lot of hard science and we also had a great time. Now, this was Alexei's last visit to Ayoka in November 2019. 
here he's sitting with his Einstein in the background, and this is Swagat Mishra, my last PhD student. Swagat and Alexei uh, interacted a lot with each other, and Swagat told me Alexei even asked him to referee many dozen papers for the journals in which he was the editor. And here is myself. And I should also mention a beautiful birthday meeting of Alexei's in Korea, Stalabinsky's universe. And this was organized by Ar Arman Shafialu, who was an Iranian student, but he was a PhD student. I mean, sorry, he was an Iranian student long ago, and he came to India and he did his PhD under my guidance and that of Tarun Shorodhi. So very kindly, he organized this beautiful meeting in Korea. And from left to right, we see Sasha Kamenshe, Dima Pagosyan, David Polarski, Alyosha himself, myself, and Arman. So this is a very wonderful meeting. And, and I really remember it with, with, with great sentimentality. So I would like to end. You know, Alyosha was deeply interested in, as we heard, in spiritual matters, you know, in deep philosophy. In all, you know, and I would like to show a picture of our great God, the cosmic dancer, Nataraj. And I would like to show a picture of Alexei, who was also a cosmic dancer, because he worked so effortlessly. He danced to the tune of so many different ideas. He worked on quantum and cosmology, inflationary preheating, cosmic strings, quantum decoherence, CMB, gravitational clustering. And he literally danced his, he had a very light approach in science, a very beautiful approach in science. I should add that he was also a very compassionate and kind human being. You, you heard from Rashid Sunyayev, you know, about his generosity. He was a very, very generous person because, you know, he interacted with dozens of students in India. And many of them were very, uh, they didn't know that much physics as he did. And he always came to their level and with great patience and love and understanding, he explained to them the basics of science. I've never seen a man with such kindness in his heart and such generosity. All the papers that he wrote, many of them were his ideas, but he was the, he kept himself as the last author, right? And he nurtured a fantastic school in India. And in August, I've been asked to deliver a plenary talk at an Indian meeting, summarizing Alyosha's contributions to cosmology. And I'll be very happy to do that for the Indian community. So, to summarize, I wrote my first paper with Alexei under Alexei's guidance in 81, and my last paper was published last year in 2023. And it's quite rare for an active collaboration in science to last for over 40 years. And so I consider myself to have been very lucky to have known such a remarkable person as Alexei Starabinsky for so long. I'm sure that his wisdom, his kindness, and his blessing will continue to shine light on my path in science. In my last slide, I would like to end by quoting a hymn from our ancient scriptures, the Upanishads. The hymn is in Sanskrit. Om Asto Ma Sad Gamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityo Ma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 The rough translation is O Lord, lead me from non-being to true being from darkness to the light, from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. I believe that Alexei's life's work is ex exemplified in the third line of this poem, from darkness to light. This is where he led us in science, from darkness to light, and may his onward journey follow the last line, from death to immortality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexei, for being in my life for 40 years. Years. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay, I think maybe we can collect uh, questions for uh, for a break. Uh, maybe now we can go to the next talk. The next talk is a talk by Professor. Yokoyama, are you here? Yes. Oh, yes, I am. Yes, hello. And please, could you please share your screen?
Professor Ikayama told us about stochastic inflation and beyond. Please, 45 yeah. minutes. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I'd like to begin with expressing my deepest condolence to Rudomira and her family. Yeah, I, I have a lot of memory with Alexei and Rudomira who visited Japan many times. And my name is Junichi Yokoyam from Kabuli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe, as well as Research Center for the Other Universe, University of Tokyo. So let me start with some account on, about uh, Starobinsky and Japan. Actually, Alexei first came to Japan in 1990. So, what is this? 34 years ago. On the occasion of the IUPAP conference, Primordial Nuclear Synthesis and the Evolution of the Early Universe, organized by Katsuhiko Sato, who was my thesis advisor, as well as one of the founders of inflationary cosmology. And he later founded our research center, Rescue, of which I'm director now, as well as Kabuli IPMU. And he, Alexei, came to Japan as a sort of senior disciple of Zeldovich. Yeah, actually, in Japan, many people try to invite Jakob Zeldovich, but never realized. But instead, Alexei, managed to come in first in 1990. And I had a few hours with him at that time because I was working as a secretary of the conference as an assistant of Katsuhiko Sato. And then I became an associate professor at Yukawa Institute for Theoretical Physics, Kyoto University in 1992. And based on the relationship I had developed during my first, my time, at the University of Tokyo, I asked Alexei if he's interested in coming to Japan, to Kyoto, as a visiting foreign professor. And actually, at that time, Yukawa Institute was divided into two pieces, one in main campus in Kyoto, and the other in the suburbs of Uji City. Actually, that was a former research institute for theoretical physics of Hiroshima University, and people there moved to Uji because the two institutes were unified into two, one. And I joined the Uji Research Center of Yukawa Institute. And Alexei stayed with us for almost one year since the late autumn of 1993. And I started collaboration with him. And this was the at this time, when the now no, the paper known as Stavinsky Yokoyama was written, and actually this is, paper is often cited as a sort of standard reference of stochastic inflation. But actually, when we started collaboration, Alexei first started uh, suggested me to study the sort of higher order quantum effects. Solving the Langevin equation he developed in the stochastic inflation by sequentially. But actually, during the course of the calculations, I realized that we could show the field with a pot stable potential can settle into a state with a dosita invariance. And actually, this observation turned out to be a paper. Uh, this one, and this is my old view transparencies. <laughs> Nowadays, everyone is using a uh, PowerPoint, but at that time, all handwritten transparencies. And here, as you see, so original title was the equilibrium state of a massless self interacting scalar field in the Sita space time. But in then, we dropped out the, the word massless when we wrote the paper. And this was a preprint and a, a reprint. And actually, this reprint is the only reprint I have, oh, I ordered with uh, this cover of physical review. I still have several copies of them. And so there we started with uh, what is the Sita space time. And in quantum field theory, we needed to define the vacuum state, which in a, in the way that the vacuum respects the symmetry of the background space time in yeah in the case of minkowski it's a poincare invariance but in the case of dosita space as you know the dosita invariance because the dosita space is uh, embedded 
in a five dimensional Minkowski space. So the invariant separation between two space time points, it looks like this. So if the vacuum respects the Dosita invariance, everything must be expressed in terms of this Z interval. For example, for two point co correlation function, it should be a single function of Z. And doing the standard quantization, and we find that for the massive field, it's rather easy to solve. But we, can, as you know, we cannot take a massless limit uh, to which we the new of the Hankel function approach to three halves. And uh, uh, as is well known, the massless minimally coupled scalar field has anomalous behavior in the sense that pi square expectation value uh, increases in time, just like a Brownian motion of the uh, step of Hawking temperature h over 2 pi at the interval of Hubble time. And the first question we asked was, uh, what if we introduce a quartic potential with a vanishing mass? And in hartley hock Calculation, we expect that we would end up with this kind of expectation value. And my initial question was, does such a sort of equilibrium state respect the Dosita invariance? And yeah, prior to this work, yeah, we have discussed the property of the perturbative expansion of the scalar field in Dosita space, and we found some uh, some problem there. And so the natural question was, what would happen if we adopt the stochastic approach? So this is how uh, our paper started. And this is a well-known introduction of the stochastic formalism, uh, taking this massless mode function. And the focke planck e equation for probability distribution function can be derived like this. And this is a famous focke planck equation for the statistical distribution of the scalar field during inflation. And so in, in this way, I calculate a two point, tem first a temporal correlation function, uh, defining a two point uh, probability distribution function. Yeah, this was not difficult. And uh, indeed, we find that the correlation function depends on the, the relative distance of the time if we focus on the, the same spatial point. So this is a sort of manifestation of the theta invariance. Yeah, etc., etc. And yeah, even for the case of uh, lambda phi to the fourth theory, we can develop a similar temporal correlation function. And the initial, uh, the coefficient can be numerically obtained. Okay. And this is a, a correlation function. Oh. And so next question I asked was a spatial two-point correlation function at equal time. So the key assumption is that the correlation function of noise in, in the language of stochastic inflation, because we make a sort of coarse graining, is approximated by this. So the, this vessel, spherical vessel function J naught of this combination is approximated by this heavy side or step function which means that if the separation between two points is inside the horizon times this small epsilon parameter, then we assume that these two points have a 100% correlation. And if they are apart, far apart than, larger apart than this epsilon h inverse scale, then completely mutually, evolution is completely independent with each other. So only when these two fields, uh, two space-time points are inside the horizon times one over epsilon, 
then they have a hundred percent correlation. And starting with this initial distribution, we can solve the Hocke-Planck equation for the two-point spatial correlation function. And also the at the initial time is defined by the time when these the the distance between two points is equal to one over epsilon h, which means that time is identified with this logarithm. And so the solution of this can be expanded like this. And using the standard technique of solving the Hocke Planck equation, yeah, we can express the two point statistical distribution function. Yeah, in terms of this eigenfunction, this capital Phi N is the solution of, uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, this. So, yeah, we can find the we can expand the general solution of the Hocke Planck equation in terms of series expansion with the eigenfunction, which satisfies this kind of Schrodinger like equation. And here, W is a sort of effective potential for this Schrodinger equation and derived by the original potential, the derivative of original potential and V double prime, like this. And so we can expand the solution like this. And the dependence on this the separation of the distance is given like this. Yeah, for the case, the separation is bigger than one over epsilon h. And in a similar manner, we can extend the calculation for the two-point statistical distribution function with arbitrary space-time points, like this. And so in, in the end, so we can find that in both cases, the two-point probability distribution function only depends on this dosita invariant separation. So this is the way we showed the dosita invariance of the equilibrium two-point probability distribution function. So this was a first summary. So equilibrium probability distribution function of the Sita invariant, and any distribution would approach the statistic, uh, static equilibrium state if we have a sort of stable potential. But uh, we have some sort of application problem, I mean, to ask what would happen if we consider this kind of double well potential. So this scalar field fluctuate around this, this minimum in some domains and around this minimum in another domain. Ah, by the way, so here we are considering this bar phi is a sort of test field in Dosita space. So this is not the potential which drives the dosita inflation itself. So Hubble parameter is treated to be constant in this model. And then Alexis proposed me to study the behavior of the scalar field, in particular the correlation time or the eigenvalue, lowest eigenvalue of this problem. And this can be obtained by uh, sort of adopting approximation that uh, we can define the eigenfunction around this minimum and another eigenfunction around this minimum. Yeah, as if we are treating that this is a potential. And yeah, double phi itself is like this. So just a single well, the eigenfunction for the single well potential. And then the ground state function of this double well potential would be a superposition of two 
single well eigenfunctions. They are, they are positive superposition. It gives the lowest level. And the asymmetric or parity odd superposition of these two eigenfunctions would give us a first excited state. And as a solution of the Fokker Planck equation, we know that the this lowest eigenvalue should be equal to zero because uh, the distribution would approach to the static equilibrium state eventually. And so we have uh, several Schrodinger equations. And from these, we can solve uh, the eigenvalue like this. And when we did it, uh, Alexei just told me, oh, Junichi, this can, problem can be, uh, the solution of this is obtained, but already obtained in the, some of the, one of the uh, question, or, well, exercise of the landau Richard quantum mechanics book. And uh, actually at that time, I on, I, I only had a Japanese translation of Landa Wilshit, and I, I, I told him that, oh, well, no problem. So the equation is the same, <laughs> he said, <laughs> no matter what language the text is written. And this is uh, actually the Japanese translation of Landa Wilshit, yeah, Quantum Mechanics, the first book, actually the in, in Japanese version, the quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics has, has been published in two volumes, and this is one of them. And this is a, a problem and solution, the, the way the solution is given. And he immediately opened and found this, uh, this page, and I was much impressed with that. But actually, the... I, I myself solved all these things uh, actually in a sort of different way than is introduced in Landa Richard's book. And uh, yeah, he was actually rather surprised to find that I even found the correct uh, coefficient of the, this exponential in a sort of different way. But anyway, as you can see, we end up with a Hawking Moss action between these two and uh, right so the stochastic inflation can even reproduce the, this entropy factor as well so that uh, this method can go beyond the sort of the lowest order approximation so this is sort of miraculous thing i would say so anyway this is how this paper was emerged and uh, but for quite a while, no, no, no one actually paid attention to this paper. And only after several years after we published this, yeah, it, this paper has been gradually been cited. And nowadays, many people cite it as, as a sort of standard reference of stochastic inflation. But I, I, I believe very few people have actually read this. <laughs> So it's not a good thing that of these sort of trendy citation. Anyway, that was my memory during my time at the Yukawa Institute in Kyoto. And I moved to Osaka University for several years and before joining Research Center for the Early Universe of the University of Tokyo, which was established in the year 1999. And Alexei stayed at rescue for the first time as a visiting professor in, in the year 2000, when Masahiro Kawasaki and Katsuhiko Sato were leading the institute. And I only joined the rescue on, in March 2005. And after that, I invited him for almost every year as a, either as a visiting professor for most of the time, or sometimes just as a lecturer of our annual summer school. And in total, he stayed at rescue 12 times as a visiting professor until the outbreak of COVID. And actually, he advised, even advised three of my graduate students, Hayato Motohashi, Minshi Ho, who is in the audience today, and 
Hyun Jong, who is still a student, and wrote a number of collaboration, collaborative papers. And in total, I published 11 joint papers so far. And I hope to, yeah, actually, he gave us another idea before he passed away. And so we wish to finish it at some point. And these are sort of memorial pictures. Uh, and this is the occasion when Professor Katsuhiko Sato, who is also a founder of inflationary cosmology in Japan, uh, re retired in the year 2009. So before his retiring ceremony, Alexei kindly gave a sort of special lecture with us. And this is a, yeah, some physics department party. And yeah, Sato is giving some present to Alexei. Yeah, these are pictures of two of the founders of inflationary cosmology. And the, the other one is, uh, of course, Alan Goose. And this is a picture right after I organized the Cosmo and COSPA conference in 2010, where Alexei attended as an invited speaker, and I invited him as well as other speakers, such as Jerome Martin and Esteban Rure in Argentina to my home. So I look much younger than I am now. <laughs> And ah, these are sort of memorial pictures of the Rescue Summer School. Yeah, Shari Ho and Alexei were lectures at the time when we had one in Mount Aso in Kyushu Island. And one some one and at that time he was a, just a student. And I guess this is the time one son got interested in stochastic inflation through the conversation with Alexei. Now he's more professional than I am, as far as stochastic inflation is concerned. Uh, this is a picture taken with uh, Bernard Carr and his wife. Uh, these are, this is, is in 2015 with the uh, members of the Research Center for the Early Universe. Okay, so now let me go somehow, somewhat beyond uh, about uh, my recent work. So recently I have been working on a one-loop correction to the power spectrum of curvature perturbation in single-field inflation models, which realize large amplitude fluctuations on small scale, relevant to primordial black hole formation. Uh, together with my student, Jason Cristiano. Actually, Jason told me that he, Alexei, passed away. Just on the next day, he passed away. Actually, J Jason is a sort of very brilliant student, and I, I am being much impressed with that. Now, the primordial black horse is very, very popular, maybe exceedingly popular these days. Yeah, as a candidate of dark matter, or as a origin of the black, massive black holes discovered by LIGO and Virgo, and Kagura, hopefully, eh, maybe sometimes in near future. <laughs> and anyway, for example, in order to explain the dark matter in terms of primordial black holes, we do need to arrange uh, the curvature fluctuation spectrum uh, on this y-axis to take a uh, form like this. Yeah, here on small wave number or large length scales or large mass scales, we have a tight constraint obtained by Planck and WMAP. But on smaller scales, we don't have much constraint. And it could be like that. Then primordial black holes can be a dark matter. And in fact, in the year 2008, we already worked out such a spectrum like this. So even for this well-known Coleman Weinberg potential, by tuning the lambda parameter as well as this vacuum expectation value, we have shown that such a non-trivial spectrum is possible. Yeah, because in this model, chaotic inflation occurs first, 
and then followed by new inflation when the scalar field climb up to this hill. And why this happens? Yeah, this is because during this transition from chaotic inflation to new inflation, the would-be decaying mode actually grows at the onset of new inflation. And this behavior is now known as a ultra slow roll inflation. Yeah, because it crosses at the region where potential is completely flat. And now, before discussing this ultra slow roll issue, let me return to the how we describe the classicalization of curvature perturbation theta. Yeah, owing to David Polarski and Alexei in 1996. Actually, there are a number of different ways to explain or try to convince people how these originally quantum fluctuation would seed the real fluctuation, classical fluctuation to produce anisotropy in CMB or seed of large scale structures. But my favorite explanation due to David and Alexei is very simple like that. So as you know, this is a mode function for the standard slow roll inflation for this co-moving curvature perturbation theta. And on super horizon scale, it goes to almost constant apart from this finite correction, exponentially small correction due to the decaying mode. And then, Neglecting this theta star is equal to minus theta in the super horizon limit, which means that the quantum operator would be look like this. And its conjugate momentum in Fourier space, wave number space, also behaves in the same way, have the same dependence on these operators. And A and A dagger does not commute, right? for the same, same wave number. But if these two quantities have the same operator dependence, theta hat theta operator and its conjugate momentum operator apparently commute with each other. That is, if we de neglect the decaying mode, these two commute and behave as if it's uh, just a classical stochastic fluctuation. And then they could uh, see the large scale structure and explain the CMB anisotropy. So this is a standard argument for the standard slow roll inflation. But more precise statement in this case is that of course, as a quantum variable, the commutator is always like this. And in terms of Mukanov Sasaki variable is the same holds. But what we find is that the commutator between theta and theta prime, prime means that time deriv derivative with respect to conformal time. And this commutator has a non-trivial non coefficient on top of this. And this combination decreases exponentially during inflation because standard slow roll inflation, epsilon is more or less constant and much smaller than unity. And in terms of the mode function, this Ronskian condition goes to zero uh, once again during standard slow roll inflation. But the standard inflation can just make a almost a scale invariant spectrum. And uh, what we want to do is to enhance the power spectrum temporarily having epsilon parameter to decrease significantly by adopting a sort of ultra slow roll period by introducing a sort of flat region in the potential. And starting from the slow roll regime and then turn into the ultra slow roll regime and then go to the ultra standard slow roll regime again to terminate inflation. So this is a sort of toy model, but uh, of course, uh, the same kind of setting can be realized in more sophisticated, more simpler analytic form of the potential like a Coleman-Weinberg I already introduced. 
Anyway, during ultra slow regime, the potential, I, I mean, the curvature perturbation increases. But why does it increase? Yeah, because epsilon decreases very rapidly, which means that second slow roll parameter eta defined by this takes a constant value equal to minus six. And when we describe the evolution equation of theta k in terms of the number of e fold, we find this evolution equation. In the standard slow roll inflation, both epsilon and eta are very, very small, so they are negligible. And so we have a constant mode in the super horizon regime where this term is negligible. And decaying mode, which decreases in proportion to a to minus three due to this factor. So this is the origin of why the perturbation behaves like a classical. But on the other hand, in ultra slow roll inflation, with epsilon very small, but eta to be minus six, then this term becomes minus three instead of plus three. So on top of this constant mode, the would be decaying mode actually exponentially grows in ultra slow roll regime. And then what is the consequence of this in terms of this quantum nature? So this was actually my long standing question when I worked out a similar scenario now known as ultra slow roll, like 2002. But now we can somehow answer to this question. And yeah, this is because during ultra slow roll regime, the commutator between theta and theta prime increases like this, or this Ronskian combination also exponentially increases uh, during ultra slow roll regime. And this has a actually significant effect when we discuss the one loop correction to the power spectrum. And so anyway, in ultra slow roll inflation, the standard wisdom does not apply. And in fact, such a anomalous growth of decaying would be decaying mode had been found myself in 1999, and the interpretation was given in, in the paper I already introduced. So anyway, based on these observations, we calculate one loop correction to the power spectrum of theta from the second and third order action. So as you all know, the second order action gives us a linear power spectrum. And the third order action gives us a non-Gaussian key as well as a one loop correction to the power spectrum. And in that context, this last term of this third order action is most important uh, because at the onset and end of ultra slow roll regime, this eta dot term uh, changed uh, very significantly or even abruptly, depending on which approximation you take. So the most important interaction Hamiltonian in terms of this conformal time is this combination. And then we calculated all uh, one loop effect using the, the standard in informalism. And I want to skip all the details calculation today. And anyway, the leading term is given by this k integral of these combinations. So now please regard this p refers to the web number corresponding to the large length scale to be probed by CMB or Planck. And K is a, the momentum integrated inside the loop. And we are interested in the effect of the big perturbation for the PBH formation. So K typically takes a small, a large wave number corresponding to the primordial black holes. But here we have this combination and another combination at a small wave number. And Q is equal to 
K P minus K。そう、Q is almost equal to this large wave number. So here we have P. But the, as I argued, this imaginary part is proportional to this l o n s k i a n which is given by this, by the normalization. And、uh, as I argued before, this co combination takes a big value at the end of ultra slow roll regime because during ultra slow roll, this quantity exponentially increases. And, and the important thing is this is from the normalization of Ron Skian. So this is independent of K wave number. So even for this P, small wave number, the same value is observed. So, this is why in the model with ultra s l o w regime, we find a rather big one loop correction, unlike in the standard s l o w r o l inflation. Yeah, because in the standard s l o w r o l inflation, this r o n s k i a n becomes exponentially small. So, the loop correction must be exponentially small as well. And so, in the end, if we sum up the wave number during ultra slow roll regime, be generating a large amplitude fluctuation related to primordial black holes, yeah, we end up with this kind of correction. So, this is the ratio of the wave number just leaving the horizon at the onset and the end of the ultra slow roll regime. And this is a Large scale curvature perturbation spectrum squared. So, this is so inside this square bracket is just 10 to minus 9 to be observed by、uh, Planck. And so, in the end, in order for the perturbation theory to be valid, so one loop correction should be much smaller than the three level contribution, which we know is equal to 2 times 10 to minus 9. And delta eta is now equal to minus six. So it's square is 36. So it should be much, so requiring it much, should be much smaller than unity. We have some constraint. And in fact,、uh, this constraint gives us a stringent bound on the amplitude of、uh, the curv possible curvature perturbation to the scale, on the scale relevant to primordial black hole formation. Yeah, for example, when PBH, we assume a PBH dark matter with a mass of 10 to minus 15 solar mass, then the amplitude of power spectrum on that scale must satisfy this strong inequality. And even for the LIGO, VIRGO, CAGRA black holes, it should be like that. And in both cases, It is actually smaller than the required amount. So, in this sense, the formation of primordial black hole is very, very difficult、uh, to explain the sufficient abundance of to be a dark matter or to explain the gravitational wave observations. And actually, we wrote this original version of this paper in November 2022, but only recently, finally,、uh, this <clears throat> manuscript was accepted in the physical review letters and it will be published soon. Yeah, even before its publication, this has been cited more than 100 times. So it's a sort of bizarre thing. So, anyway,、um, This is a sort of higher order effect, and also the, the, in the sense that the decaying mode plays the important role. So, this is quite distinct from what we normally discuss in the context of stochastic inflation. So, I'd like to finish my talk now, and this, this is a, one of the nice pictures Alexei and I took. Uh, yeah, it's、uh, eight, already eight years ago. This is one of the rescue summer school held in Hakayama City, actually close to the Kagura site. And we took an excursion to Shirakago, a very old fashioned Japanese village. So I'd like to close my presentation 
with the world may your soul rest in peace, Alexei, and thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. So... Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I think we can postpone the questions for the evening. So let's go to the next speaker. The next speaker is David Polarsky from Montpellier, as I understand. Please, could you please share your screen? So David will tell us about some cosmological models mm -hmm. and I guess observation. Okay. Uh, David, can you, you unmute yourself because you're muted? Now it's better, right? Yeah, much better. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, we can hear you, please. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I must say I feel extremely honored to, to give this talk here. And as I will show you, and as you could hear from many other people and speakers, Alexei was an outstanding scientist and he was really extremely influential on people with whom he collaborated. So as I like to introduce things little by little, so we know that we have a theory of gravitation, which is general relativity, proposed by Einstein, and it is in this field that Alexei made such outstanding contributions of, on black hole physics, early universe, and primordial spectrum of gravitational waves. So we have the basic principle, which is the cosmological principle. This principle completely constrains the metric, which is of a Robertson Walker type. Spatial sections are maximally symmetric and we are, are left with only one freedom, which is the time dependence of the scale factor for which we will need some dynamical equations, which are the Friedman equations that I will show in a little time. Okay, with basic kinematic quantities, the redshift, which is the ratio of the scale factor here, the scale factor today compared to the scale factor, say, in the past. If it is in the past for an expanding universe, Z is positive, so Hubble function, Hubble constant, we know, hotly debated, Hubble tension, and distances, because of course, we are talking now about the universe. And of course, the distance between two points is just the, the S integrated between the two points, but this is absolutely impossible to measure when we talk about uh, megaparsecs or gigaparsecs. Luckily, we had other ways to do it, either with the angular diameter distance, either with the luminosity. Luminosity is, is based on the, on the intensity of, uh, of radiation that we get from distant objects. And this is based, sorry. And this is based on the angle under which we see an object far out in the universe. Okay. And these are the Friedman equations. These are the cosmological parameters, the omegas. And so typically when we work in cosmology, and even outside general relativity, you can often put it in this form, you will have for this expression, one part, which goes like one plus z to the third, which is the non-relativistic part, the radiation part, the dark energy part, and
the curvature part, spatial curvature. Okay, having said that, I would like to talk about a work that we have done recently with Rodrigo Calderon, Radon Ganuji, Benjamin Lillier, and myself about the possibility to have a negative cosmological constant lambda inside the dark sector. So I think this can be of uh, interest of those working in high energy physics. And I think many of, of the people in the audience are working in high energy physics because we know that supersymmetric theories, they do not like positive cosmological constant, the sitter space, but they like anti the sitter space. So the question is whether it could be possible to include a negative cosmological constant inside the dark sector. So, okay, here you see, I, 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 I assume k equals zero. The negative cosmic constant will hide here inside the dark energy sector. So now, this means that in the dark energy sector, we have a composite dark energy with a negative lambda, and I, I call it little lambda to not to mix it with the big lambda, which is the standard notation for a positive cosmological constant. And then we have another component, which is what people would usually call dark energy, but we call it X just because no DE, dark energy, is the sum of the two. Now, the first, I, I have two anecdotes about that, about this work related to Alexei. The first is that the idea to do this paper, the very idea, grew out of a discussion. Well, it was it was even it was even better. It was an article that we did with Alexei just before in 1918 or 1919. And when we got the referee report. The referee said, okay, this is okay, but I have just one comment and criticism. It was rather criticism. You don't consider the possibility to have a negative energy density. And you know, many people are interested in the possibility that uh, of a negative uh, energy in the dark, um, negative energy density in the dark energy sector. Okay. I remember I was talking to Alexei and I said, well, yes, uh, maybe we can do it like that. And he agreed, okay, we, we uh, uh, the way to have to, be, we did indeed small changes in the article and uh, he agreed with my way to tackle it. But I said, but you know, Alexei, actually this is an interesting thing. And on my own, I started thinking about the inclusion of a negative cosmological constant. So in some sense, the origin came from a discussion with Alexei. Okay. Now, a few months later, I was again discussing with, with Alexei. Because, you know, for me, it's like uh, many people here said it, and also Varin, Varun in his uh, very nice talk. Uh, whenever you have a problem, if you're a collaborator, a close collaborator of Alexei, whenever you have a problem, your first reaction is, oh, I should talk about it with Alexei. Or what would Alexei think about it? So... I was thinking a bit about this possibility of having a negative cosmological constant. And I realized that it's possible to give exact solutions in the future. By future, I mean, you find a regime in which you have only the negative cosmological constant, okay, and some dark energy component, which we call here X component, okay, because dark energy is the sum of the two. With a constant P, 
in other ways, with a constant Wx. Then, using a mathematical method that I learned in my work with Alexei in our 1992 paper over double inflation, I realized that I can immediately extend the solution that I found in 92 to this case too. And this is the result. So in the future of such a model, this is how A behaves as a function of T. And I asked Alexei, you know, Alexei, I, I, th I, I think I can find a solution, an exact solution for A. Do you know whether this was ever done? Alexei didn't say anything. Okay, I said, uh, well, maybe it's so trivial that uh, he's even uh, surprised that I am surprised. But okay, I went on. And you see, here is the solution. You can find it in our paper. Of course, when p equals zero, this is exactly when w is minus one. I don't need, actually, this, this becomes singular. This is no longer the solution, of course. It's just the future is just that of lambda CDM. You have the city state, the city space in the far future. The interesting thing is that, of course, if p is negative, well, you have exactly the same as when you have a closed universe. Namely, you have at a certain point you have a recollapse, and you can even and you can really uh, check it. Okay, you you will find it in the paper. So this is when wx is uh, larger than minus one, and of course, when wx is smaller than minus one, the far future is a big rip. And indeed, though you, you don't see it immediately, okay, if you work out this in the far future, you really end up with the big rip solution. So this is very nice. Now, we went on to constrain such a model with observations. And you know, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, do you see properly all my transparencies? Yes, we can see. Okay, okay, because in the corner here, it's a corner is hidden. Oh, it's okay, we see it perfectly. Ah, you see it perfectly, okay. So, you know that plank, measured with exquisite accuracy the sun horizon scale okay he also can give a value for the rs the 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 scale subtended from by the sun horizon at z1 and z1 is the for simplicity, Z1 is the uh, recombination uh, redshift. So the bottom line here is, if you don't change the physics, which gives you the RS, and you measure theta S, then you completely constrain R at Z1. No, this is nothing else. If you, if you multiply this by A1, A at Z1, and you multiply it below by A1, this is the physical size of the sound horizon. And this is, by definition, what we call the angular diameter distance. If you multiply it by A1 and so now you drop A1 above and below, and this R of Z1 has a given expression, well-known expression. And this is exactly how people in the Planck collaboration 
were able to settle the value of H naught. Why? Because the only free parameter was actually omega lambda. I, I mean now the big lambda. And once you have the big lambda, you have Hz. And when you have Hz, you have in particular H naught. And this is the 67 given by Planck. 67 kilometer per second per megaparsec. You can also say it in different way. The sum over all small omega i gives h squared. And once this is settled, as h is h naught divided by 100, you settle h naught. So what we do is the following. We do not change the physics at early universe, so we keep the same rs. We take the theta s from Planck. We have this formula in which we plug our hz. Now, of course, instead of having omega lambda, like in lambda CDM, we have, remember, here, this here, trivially give us, gives us this. OK? In other words, RZ1, this RZ1 for our model has to be the same as the one in Planck. It is this. And in this way, we can constrain the three parameters. There are actually three free parameters this one, this one, and this one of our model. OK, you see that in the absence, this is very well known. In the absence, the first, the first straight line here corresponds to the absence I would say usual dark energy, the absence of a negative cosmological constant. And it's a well-known fact that if you have dark energy that is more and more phantom, you can reach higher values of H, higher values of H. And you see that by including a negative lambda, this is this effect becomes stronger. OK. Now, what is the bottom line of this when you compare with data? That the best models obtained are obtained for a piecewise constant. Piecewise constant W. Namely, it's a cosmological constant on small redshifts and a phantom-like dark energy on higher redshift. But the really interesting thing is that you see that you can already guess it. You can already guess it from this. It is clear that if you behave like a positive cosmological constant on small redshifts, and you start with a phantom behavior on high redshift, you will not be able to get a very high age. And this is exactly what we found, OK? The bottom line, the bottom line here is that in case h is larger than 0 0.7, then the model is in trouble. But this is still hotly debated. This is not clear. And I think it's uh, it can come as a surprise to many, at least for me. For me, it came as a surprise that the inclusion of a negative cosmological constant is not ruled out, actually. It's not something crazy. Now, I have another anecdote about this paper related to Alexei. Actually, 
when we finished the paper, I was talking to him because now and then uh, I was talking to Alexei about projects, about uh, about uh, about other things, and Alexei asked me, "Oh, I noticed your paper on uh, negative a negative cosmological constant." So. Of course, my my first reaction was, my God, it's a bad paper. And to my big surprise, Alexei told me, but why didn't you ask me to, to join to join it? And of course, first, I was very relieved. I felt extremely honored to, and I think all collaborators of Alexei know this feeling. And I told him, which was true, Alexei, this is incorrect. I wrote you at least twice asking you if you are interested in the subject, but you did not react. He didn't say anything. Now I would like to to talk about this bouncing model which was done in the framework of scalar tensor gravity. Okay, and here is the model. You see, very simple function f, quite simple function u, it has conformal symmetry. And here, this is not a typo, c is really positive, so it's an upside down potential. And actually, the whole story of this collaboration is the way we, we came to the result is very, it's quite extraordinary. And this is why I want to talk about it. Be, be, before I show you the final result, which is of an extraordinary uh, mathematical beauty, very simple. I want to show you the equations so that you realize that they are really not simple. Okay? So here are the relevant Friedman equations. Here are the equations for the scalar field. And I remind you, this is the expression for F. This is the expression for U. So in principle, you don't expect something very simple to come out. So this work was done in collaboration with Bruno Boisseau and Hector Giacomini of the University of Tours, myself, and Alexei Starobinsky. And we were Almost at the end of the paper, we derived all properties and uh, we had already mathematical expression for the scale factor A. We had the expression for the, the um, for H, of course, once you have A, you have H. And actually, the expression for H that my colleagues in Tours took was one that I wrote in a paper, which is on the archives, in which I considered this kind of dark energy. But you see, what I'm showing you here is really this equation and this equation, sorry, no, this equation and this equation for this ansatz. Look here, it's amazing. 
at the end of the day, you end up with such a simple, extraordinary simple Friedman equation. It is as if you are in general relativity with the cosmological constant and dark radiation, because don't forget, A is negative. A is negative. And the equation for five, actually, you write it as an equation for A times five, is just this simple equation. And you see a kind of miracle that appears. What is feeding the expansion is indeed this scalar field. But only through an integration constant. Only through an integration constant. What enters the first equation is just the integration constant. So the energy. And why can A be negative? Just because C is positive. So the energy can, it's an upside down potential, remember. So the energy of the chi field in flat space time, because this is nothing else but the conformal time. So we have a conformal, so we have a flat Robertson Walker universe which is conformal to Minkowski. And this is just the energy of the sky field in, in Minkowski space. And all of a sudden you understand everything. It's because the A is negative that this behaves effectively like a phantom field. And we know that the null energy condition has to be broken in order to have a um, a bounce. And this is exactly what happens here. Because you see, the rapid way to see that this is phantom is that with expansion, the energy grows because this is negative. So the energy grows, it becomes less negative. So it grows. And so we were very far with this work with my colleagues in Tours. And my colleagues worked on those equations here in such a way that they can find that H behave like that. Because I told them, listen, uh, I recently worked with, uh, with uh, possibilities of bouncing universe with dark energy of that kind, with here, uh, I mean, with uh, something negative multiplied by one over a to the power n, not necessarily four. And I can tell you that I got this kind of, uh, of uh, Hubble function. And this is the way they started with this and finally got to the potential. But there were a lot of mysteries. We, we, we saw a lot of miracles, but we couldn't explain. And on 13 March, 2015, I opened my mailbox around midnight. So which, which was more or less the beginning of my, of my working day. 
and I see a mail by Alexei. Okay, uh, I read the draft and uh, please note, <laughs> please note these two equations. And when I saw those equations, I said, oh God, but I knew it had to be like that. But of course, we, we were still stuck with very complicated expressions. I rushed on, my, on the calculations, literally rushed on the calculations. In a couple of hours, I was able to rederive this. I was able to rederive this. I was completely excited because it explained all the mysteries that we found in this work. And you see, from here that in addition, we had already, as I told you, we had already the analytical expression for A and for H, but we didn't have one for phi. So, this one we had already, but now, due to the fact that we can write it like this, we have this equation, we can actually find the analytical expression for phi. So, I don't expect from you to remember this expression, and uh, some of the functions appear appearing here, I didn't know even of their existence before this work. But in short, the system is completely mathematically integrable. So I, I think this is a very nice piece of mathematical physics, of course, it's not a bouncing model in the in, a, in it's not a realistic bouncing model because, for example, there is no matter here, and uh, certainly there are no perturbations considered here. But still, as a bouncing model, it is beautiful that it can be completely integrated, mathematically integrated. And you see, this is exactly the kind of magic that you could have while working with Alexei. He just could come with some illuminating remark or just, it was that small addition or big addition that made uh, the work fantastic. So just one comment, you see, this is the value of A at the bounds. And here we have taken in our work, the bounds at T equals zero. So AB is this A naught, yeah, here, this A naught. And so you see, this is why it stayed a bit hidden all this mathematical structure, because changing A doesn't change the expression. It doesn't change the expression. It only changes the A naught, which is AB. You see, it's the A entering here. The rest is just unchanged. It's the same here. And this was the whole magic of it. Now, I don't know how much time I'm, uh, I've left. Can somebody tell me? Uh, well, I think it's the best if you can conclude somehow because we are running out of time.
Yeah, yeah. So do I have five minutes? Maybe yeah. one. Could you please? <laughs> Maybe two. Five is too much. I'm very sorry. Ah, so uh, I just want to to give you an overview of seminal collaborations that I had with Alexei. And this reminds me very much of what uh, Varun said. Uh, you see, it spans from 92. And OK, this is 2016, but this is not my last work with Alexei. My last work with Alexei was in 2023, actually. So it's more than 30 years. This work on scalar tensor gravity started when Alexei visited Tours in 1999. And I remembered I was reading the famous review by Alexei and Varun on the cosm I think it's uh, it's called a cosmological lambda term. And I I was reading a piece where uh about the limitations of uh, quintessence when you consider a, a minimally coupled scalar field as dark energy. And I asked Alexei, do you think it's interesting to investigate it further? And he said, yes. Well, this gave rise to our work on scalar tensor gravity. Bouncing models, I, I just talked about it. Growth index was later. Here, I remember this work on semi-classical decoherence of perturbations. Alexei sent me a message when we reached 500 citations. Very laconic. He said, uh, we reached, our work reached 500 citations, best regards. And I answered, well, I thank you so much for this work and for the intellectual adventure. You see, Working with Alexei was an intellectual, a true intellectual adventure. And I'm full of gratitude towards him. And the bottom line is very clear. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Unfortunately, we are definitely out of time, so we have no time for questions and let's postpone them maybe in the for the evening session and let's go to the next talk the next talk will be by alexander kaminchik he will tell us about pauli zildovich constellation of a vacuum energy divergences and 120 orders could you please, david could you please uh, yeah this is exactly what i'm saying Okay, okay, please. It should be in the right. Some, in the right. Yes, some icon. Okay, very good. Alexander, Sasha, are you here? Yes, I'm here and... Okay. Oh, you are ready, you are ready. Okay. Do you see I... my slides? Yes. Yes, everything is fine. So you are ready to... Uh, give your talk. Okay, please try to uh, make your talk in 25 minutes. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Irina Yaroslavna, Alexei, and other organizers for organizing this meeting, this memorial seminar. And it's a great pleasure and honor and also responsibility to speak here. And I shall speak about some line of activity of Alexei Alexandrovich which is less known and which is, even if uh, in part is uh, stimulated by cosmology, it's more uh, connected with some fundamental questions of quantum field theory. So my talk uh, will be based on some papers uh, written in collaboration with, with my colleagues in the University of Bologna and also some papers uh, uh, written together with people from Bologna and with Alexei Alexandrovich. And it's, where in very high degree of all this activity is stimulated and provoked by conversations with him. So this is the content of my talk. First, I should give some introduc introduction and tell you the history of these works. 
when I should show some formulas connected with vacuum energy and the balance between the fermion and boson fields, when I shall speak about some subtle question, mathematical questions connecting with the running masses and anomalous mass dimensions and contribution of potential terms into the vacuum energy uh, when the interaction is switched on. When I should speak about one particular toy, but rather complicated, already rather complicated model, which we have considered together with Alexei Alexandrovich, and when I shall give some concluding remarks. So rather often, if you read scientific popular articles or books about cosmology, one encounters the statement that there exists a huge discrepancy of 120 orders between expectable value of the cosmological constant coming from quantum fluctuations of the vacuum energy of quantum things and its observable tiny value which we observe beginning from the discovery of uh, cosmic acceleration at the end of ages. Sometimes this statement is present also in scientific papers of quite respectable authors. What is the origin of this statement? If you calculate the nearly vacuum energy of quantum fields, considering quantum field as a system of harmonic oscillator, uh, you encounter the huge ultraviolet derivative divergence, quartic ultraviolet divergence. When you can introduce a cutoff interpreting this uh, always in the sense of effective field theory at the level of Planck mass scale, and you obtain the huge number. And interpreting this number as the scale for the value of cosmological constant, one obtains really this famous 120 orders. In one of my papers, I uncautiously have repeated this statement as some kind of side remark. But Alexei Alexandrovich, uh, had uh, answered the close observation of the production and scientific activities of all the people from my point of view, which have entered into under his protective wing. I don't know how he managed to do it, taking into account how many of us existed uh, scattered in all the world. Nevertheless, he has uh, noticed this paper and this not so important statement inside of this paper, and he has told me. Read the paper by Zildovich in Soviet Physics Uspehi, 1966. The quartic di divergence has nothing in common with the cosmological constant. Indeed, I have read this paper and it was some kind of revelation for me because it's easy to understand that even calculating namely the energy density of the quantum fluctuation of the vacuum, one should parallelly calculate their pressure. And one finds that the quartically divergent part of the pressure is positive and it's equal to the curve part of the energy density. Thus, it corresponds not to a cosmological constant, but to the radiation. So these 120 orders disappear. When the quadratically divergent part of the pressure and is also negative, and its absolute value is given by the one third of energy density. This kind of exotic fluid sometimes is called stream dust. When finally the logarithmically divergent part and the finite part of the pressure are indeed negative and where absolute value is equal to that of the energy density. So we really can give in some way contribution to the cosmological constant. And this is rather simple reasoning, which you can understand reading this old paper by Sidovich, but strangely it's not so well known. Independently on this consideration, in 2007, uh, my co-authors in uh, Bologna University and myself, Alessandro Tronconi, Gian Paolo Vani, and Giovanni Ventui, have published the paper where we have studied which set of fields can provide consolation of these divergences due to the fact that bosons and fermions have the contribution of opposite sign. And after, already after publishing this paper, we have learned that in 1950s it was Wolfgang Pauli who has suggested that the vacuum zero point energies of all existing fermion and bosons can compensate each other in his lectures, which he had given in Zurich University, but it was without detailed presentations or calculations. Simply, it was idea based on the fact that the vacuum energy of fermions has a negative sign, whereas that of bosons has a positive one. And such a constellation indeed take place in supersymmetric models. So in a way, one can say that Paul predicted the arising of supersymmetry already in the middle of 50s. 
And when it was Yakov Borisovich Zildovich who has related Vakvi Manager to the cosmological constant. So we have examined in our paper the conditions of the consolation of the ultra-wide divergences of vacuum and energy, and we have obtained some kind of some rules that we have studied when we can be uh, satisfied. And later, in 2008, we have understood the same authors and also John Richard Bergen, that one can obtain in this way also some bounds on the spectrum of the elementary particle is a standard model. And beyond studying also the finite part of the vacuum energy, which should be very small to be um, to be compatible with observable value of the cosmological constant. And we have found two uh, curious facts in, during this work. First, as, as all everybody knows, the number of fermion degrees in the freedom in the standard model is much bigger than the number of bosons. So very natural idea. Let's add some bosons to establish the balance. Um, balance between these degrees. But if you would like to put all this inside of the standard model, one can show we have resolved some mathematical problems on the level of the conditional um, extremum problems from the course of mathematical ana analysis for physicists. And we have seen that it's impossible to do it. It's necessary to add some small amount of fermions, and after that you can put bosons. And we have obtained also the limits for the uh, lightest Higgs boson mass, boson mass, which is what possible to associate with Higgs boson, it was somewhere between uh, 110 gap and 170 gap. Uh, gap. It was before the discovery of the Higgs boson, but it was compatible with the known uh, bounds. And when in June of 2008, it was uh, the third, uh, 13th Russian Gravitational Conference in Moscow, and one of the days of the work of this conference was devoted to the 16th birthday of Alexei Alexandrovich. I remember that David Polarsky was there also uh, in this day. So, as, as far as I remember, I had, had given talk about the above mentioned work, and it was published when in the Red Letters. And Alexei Alexandrovich has uh, noticed, uh, has remembered his work. And in the middle of 2010s, a, hypo a hypothetical particle resonance of photon excess was discovered or observed on a large Hadron collider. And it was the, uh, it had the energy of this photon excess 750 gap. So, and quite a few theoretical papers explaining this effect were published, and Stravinsky has suggested to us to study this effect from the point of view of the power of the mechanism of cancellation of divergences in the vacuum energy. And it was done, and we have written the paper, but during our discussions with the referee of some journal, which were long, this effect was closed. And so we had told us, no, it doesn't made sense to publish your papers because this 750 gap resonance does not exist. So our paper remains unpublished, but Alexei Alexandrovich did not forget this story. And a couple of years after this story, he has told me one of the main critical comments was connected with the fact that we have considered only free particles without interactions. Let's include interactions at least on the lower level of theoretical of the perturbation theory. And we did it, and we have published paper with Alexei Starobinsky, Alessandro Tranconi, Teresa Vardanian, who was our postdoc in this period, and Giovanni Venturi in the European Physical Journal of C. And we have considered only toy model with spin one and spin one, one over two uh, particles, and we have limited ourselves on, on the lowest perturbation theory level, but it was already rather complicated, I would say, even at the level of the toy model. Well, <clears throat> now I can uh, tell in some detail about this model and shall show you some you know, formulas. Mm -hmm. First of all, these all formulas from the Zildovich paper and some elaboration on the Zildovich paper, you know what you have this uh, vacuum energy for harmonic oscillator for theoretical oscillator, you can calculate this energy summating or integrating all the degrees of freedom, all the possible moment and all the direction. 
you have this quartical divergent integral, which can be calculated exactly. When you introduce this cutoff lambda to equalize this integral, you have this expression depending on the cutoff. You can expand it, and you have the term which has the quartic divergence, quadratic divergence, logarithmic divergence, and uh, some final part. And the fermion contribution for one fermion oscillator, degrees of freedom, is, it has the opposite, opposite side. So to cancel the quartic the divergence is proportional to lambda in the fourth degree, one has to have equal numbers of boson and fermion degrees of freedom. When the conditions of the, for the cancellation of quadratic and logarithmic divergences have this form we include the masses. And when you can also identify the finite part of this vacuum energy with this more complicated structure, which includes not only degrees of masses of the particle, but also the logarithms. When you can, can calculate the pressure, and again, it's uh, divergence, you can regularize it, you can expand this regularized expression, and you can see explicitly when the quartic divergence behaves like radiation, the quadratic like a string gas, and logarithmic divergence and the finite part behave as a cosmological constant. Well, let's in, include into the consideration uh, interaction. In this case, your masses begin by running. So it's not enough to have this uh, some rules satisfied. It's necessary to have with this uh, some rules stable with respect to running of these masses due to the presence of interactions. So it's necessary to calculate what mass anomalous dimension and to see what happens when you change the scale of your theory. So all the uh, apparatus of renormalization group of quantum field theory enters at this moment. And our treatment of these anomalous mass dimensions in the presence of quadratic divergences was based on the approach presented in some old paper by Jack and Jones, which is very interesting, but not so well known. We have, because we have managed to trace also the quadratic divergences in the framework of dimensional equalization, which in turn was applied to the phenolomization group by Gerard Hopkins. Well, we have considered some simple models, some simple interaction between Dirac spinner and scalar field. We have calculated from scratch to be sure that everything is okay. All the mass, uh, anomalous dimensions, including the quadratic divergences. And we have done the same for pseudo-scalar field, which is a little bit different, and for fermions. Then it was not enough to use these uh, rules for running of mass. It was necessary also to take into account the contribution of the potential terms, because you have interaction into the vacuum energy. So again, we have, make, uh, have made all these calculations. And uh, it, it's well known, for, but for example, in the case of the Zumina model, there is indeed exact cancellations of all vacuum divergences <clears throat> due to the presence of well-known relations between coupling constants. But uh, there are some uh, subtleties which we have stumbled upon doing this work because really, if you nearly calculate everything, you see what in terms of component fields, not super fields, you see what there is no cancellations. So it's necessary to be especially cautious or introduce some auxiliary fields which are not dynamical, but of where becomes in a way dynamical and independent to have these constellations already in the case of the uh, exact Vesumino model. So we have, and these auxiliary fields can also help you when you study non supersymmetric models, but with some elements of supersymmetry. And when <clears throat> there is some effective rule, it's necessary to double some, some contributions if you would like to have simple calculations, which in any case are rather complicated. And at the end, you can uh, have this effect that if you don't introduce these auxiliary fields, when potential energy and the kinetic energy of these vacuum fluctuations cannot be cancelled separately, it's, it's necessary to consider where some. Using more simple calculations with auxiliary fields, you can achieve these separate cancellations. 
And when some aspects of these constellations of divergences were also studied in some accompanying papers by Andre Perovinsky, Teresa Vardanian, and myself about this Lumina model. And I should also tell that some rules similar to ours were suggested in the paper by Matt Mister, but uh, he has not considered the concrete models, which we considered uh, our team. So we have considered this model with one my run in two scalar fields. We have introduced all the possible Kaufman constant and masses. Well, masses were all the same to simplify the problem. And we have obtained a lot of these sub rules for integrals present in the theory and for the Kaufman constant. constant. And I shall skip some key technical details. At the end, you have a lot of equations on this. Sums, but when you can solve this equation with <laughs> conditions uh, in part and analytically, in part numerically, and you can find a, a lot of compatible with this uh, conditions system of what your Kaufman constant, this bare Kaufman constant. So you can construct these two models, which on the lowest level of the perturbation theory. Uh, provides you with constellations of all these ultraviolet divergences in vacuum energy and nature also in the pressure. So we also have considered models with Majorana spinner and one scalar and one pseudo scalar field. And here you have less freedom. So it's still larger freedom when in the Lezumina model, but less when with one scalar and one pseudo and one and two with one Majorana spinner and one two scalar field. So I, I would like to say that you can do everything, but it becomes rather cumbersome already, much more cumbersome than in the previous. And now I can give some concluding remarks. So we have studied the power Zildovich mechanism for the cancellation of ultraviolet divergences in vacuum energy, which is associated with the fact that bosons and fermions produce contributions to it having opposite sides. We have taken interactions up to the lowest order of perturbation theory into account. And we have constructed some number of simple toy models having particles only with spin zero and spin one over two, where masses of the particles are equal with interactions which were rather non-trivial. And we have also studied the some technical subtleties connected with the opportunity to introduce to simplify calculations some auxiliary and non-dynamical fields and to analyze the relation be between off-trail and on-trail uh, degrees of freedom. So the final conclusions. Really, in cosmology, from our point of view, and I say it's understood also in this way and uh, taught us, there is no um, 120 orders problem with the cosmological constant. But on the other hand, there is a serious problem of the treatment of the vacuum energy and vacuum fluctuations in standard quantum field theory, even as a flat space. And it's, it's still not a resolved problem, and it's not quite clear what to do really with all these fluctuations and how to take into account interactions. We see what even uh, studying all this, even accepting this power Zindovich mechanism, studying of this mechanism in perturbation theory for toy models, it's already rather cumbersome problem. And we had in principle with Alexei Alexander the plan to continue with studying, but as many as a project, it was not realized or it was postponed and so on and so forth. And the last comment, all the story with this paper shows that, that everybody knows that uh, Starobinsky has made great contribution to the cosmology, gravity, astrophysics, all this field. But he was very profound and very deeply interested in some fundamentals of quantum field theory as well. And with his insistence with these works that he has remembered that it's not really to finish this work in spite of was uh, with 750 uh, GAF particles what he discovered. And, shows that he was really interested in these fundamentals of quantum field theory as well as in the gravity and cosmology. And that's all thank you.
Ok. Are you finished? Yes, I have finished. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, first of all, before uh, to announce a short break, I would like to announce that um, Lyudmila Viktorovna would like to say a few words. Lyudmila Viktorovna, are you here? Yes, please. Sasha, could you please abandon your screen? I'm trying, but I don't. Uh, I can do that. Now, okay, now I can. Uh, let me. Where is this? Okay, it's already done. Большое спасибо, что он много еще помнит по-русски, и он помнит Алексея Александровича. Мы его тоже всегда помним, и Рохи не помним. И помним, как он пел со своим сыном и играл на гитаре, как мы были у него в Индии. Я очень благодарю Варуна за его память и за его рассказ. Еще мне хочется обратиться к Лениче отдельно, потому что тоже я хочу передать поклон его жене, его дочкам и поблагодарить его за теплый прием, который нам всегда был оказан в Японии. Тоже, если он будет в Москве еще раз, то я всегда буду рада увидеть его у себя дома. И еще последнее хочу обратиться к Дэвиду Поларски. My best regards to you and Montel and your fantastic daughter. Спасибо вам большое. Всем. Алексей, can you translate? Mm, yes, sure. Uh, so, uh, Людмила Викторовна uh, is very much grateful to everyone attending today and everyone who remembers Alexei Starobinsky and in particular she addresses Varun, but, uh, well, I think this part should not be translated too much. Varun speaks perfect Russian. And, but Lyudmila Viktorovna stressed that uh, Varun uh, speaks Russian and still remembers a lot speaking Russian. And she very thankful that uh, he has so great, warm and uh, kind-hearted memory with respect to Alexei Starobinsky. She recounts uh, moments uh, when uh, he was visiting and when they were visiting his house and uh, how he was playing guitar and uh, uh, other uh, very kind uh, family moments. Also, she sends uh, special regards to Zhenichny uh, Yukoyama and uh, uh, memorizes moments how great and uh, warmly he was welcoming Alexis Tarabinsky and Ludmila in Japan and uh, also she uh, thanks everyone who participates today and who keeps memory of Alexis Tarabinsky. Okay, now <coughs> we have time for a break. Unfortunately, we are terribly on time, but so I propose uh, to, um, to have just 10 minutes break. Then we will be only 15 minutes <laughs> out. So, okay, please 10 minutes break. Uh, uh, all of you have different times. So just uh, in Moscow time, it will be 5.30. Five. In European time, it will be six, uh, wait, sorry, 4.30 uh, uh, time. Okay, thank you all people who spoke in the first part of this conference. Uh, let us meet in 10 minutes. I would like also to remember if somebody would like to share his impression about common work with Alexei, or just to show us some photo or movie uh, after uh, um, end of a session, we can do this. Officially, officially this should be start 
uh, which should be started after uh, uh, Koshelev and Kumar talk. It should be about uh, in European time seven, but I'm not sure that we will finish scientific part. Uh, for this time, but in any case, after Alexei Koshelev's round Kumar talk, we can also see, um, you can share with us your remark or what you think about common work or something like this. Okay, thank you. Uh, 10 minutes break, please. Norma, do you want to ask question? Hello, everybody. Hello, Irina. Just uh, taking uh, taking the occasion at uh, Ludmila um, uh, uh, Skia just to share one uh, one souvenir. Just um, a very short uh, remembering uh, when uh, they both Alexis and uh, she were in. Uh, um, after my invitation, under my invitation in the 80s in France, that was Medon, okay. in the observatory. And uh, then, if you would like to very shortly, I can uh, I can share that uh, because Alexis uh, were several times in the 80s, in particular, I I edited and I published it, uh, uh, his. Uh, Memorable, um, a very, very referenced uh, um, article of stochastic inflation, uh, where he put it the basis of stochastic inflation in the 80s, and a manuscript that was in, in Russian, and we translated in, uh, I mean, I have translator in, in, in uh, from, from Russian to English, uh, a lady. Uh, with with him, uh, Alexis and uh, Lumira became very very friends. So because she uh, she uh, helped the, uh, them also with um, said uh, with the travels, with the knowledge of Paris and so on. Being a Russian translator, uh, Russian uh, uh, who. Um, a French uh, a lady uh, who spoke very well, an official translator of Russian, and in particular scientific translation, was very, very useful. In particular at that time, you know, in the, uh, was be, uh, before the, um, the fall of the, what uh, we say, of the regime there, of the Uts. So. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now we start the break. Hello, Robert. Robert. 
Hello, I was muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, you were sharing slides, they were looking perfectly, but then you switched oh, back from full screen. That's not because I was muted. I had to unshare slides, but... I see. Let's see. Whoops. Go back. Yeah, now it's okay. Ah, yeah, now it's even better. Now it is. Good, good. Yeah, very good. Now it's seen perfectly. We just want to break a little bit because, uh, yeah. yeah, it's already some time. I'll try to stay on time. Oh, it's okay. I mean, You are now in Europe? No, I'm in Montreal. Ah, you're in Montreal. Okay, so it's quite dark. So I got to the office at seven o'clock sharp for the beginning of the nice of this meeting. Yeah. Thanks a lot, um, Alexei, for, and also oh, Irina oh. for putting this together. Um, just let me discuss a little bit. Alexei, what do you think? We have wait one minute because I promised uh, uh, 10 minutes break. Or we have start just now? No, we can wait a little bit. I, I don't think we too, must be too much strict. Strictly. Moreover, the later speakers are also joining from US, especially Andre Linde. He is not yet here, I guess. Um, yes. And for him, it's indeed early. I see. Robert, are you ready? I'm ready anytime you are. Yes, yes, uh, we are ready in any case with this not big difference <laughs> 10 minutes or five or just nine minutes uh, break. So I think it's maybe we can. Dear colleagues, dear friends, let's continue our session. Uh, next speaker is Robert Brandenburg uh, from McGill University. He will speak about non-singular cosmology. Please try to speak 25 minutes. At least we can let a few minutes for a short question. Okay? Yes. So first of all, thank you very much for organizing this memorial event. Uh, I was really shocked when I heard about the passing of Alexei. Now, I did not have the good fortune to ever directly collaborate with Alexei, but we've met repeatedly at meetings. In fact, the last time we met was just before the pandemic in January 2020 at a meeting on, cosmo on uh, philosophy of cosmology in Abu Dhabi. And I remember that uh, Alexei and myself together we were uh, vigorously defending the usual treatment of cosmological perturbations against attacks by Daniel Sudarsky. We also sat together on the bus, taking us on a tour to Abu Dhabi. Now, the first time we met, the first time we really met was in, I think, 1989 at a meeting between 10 young North American and 10 young Soviet cosmologists a meeting which was held at the outskirts of uh, Moscow. And at that point, uh, we vigorously discussed certain topics. And here's one of the topics that we discussed. Uh, Alexei uh, convinced me immediately that the approach that collaborators and myself were trying to use to study the classicalization of cosmological perturbations was wrong, and that the approach that emerged into this paper that you see here, that that's a much better one. We also discussed a lot, something that hasn't been mentioned yet in this meeting, namely the theory of reheating after inflation. 
So we already discussed discuss that in detail. And I'd like to uh, just point out this masterpiece. Now, let's go back to the paper that was mentioned before. This famous paper, which is the birth of Stalbinsky inflation. But you see, the original goal was to resolve cosmological singularities. And this is a topic I will turn to. So this is basically what the outline of my presentation. I will try to present you an approach to obtain a non-singular universe, which goes a little bit beyond what Alexei was doing. So to me, singularity is a sign of the breakdown of a theory. And this motivates the search for non-singular completion of the theory in the same way that it motivated Stalbinsky to extend Einstein's theory of gravity by R square terms. Now, singularities can also be viewed as a sign of the breakdown of the classical theory. So the question I would like to ask is, can quantum gravity resolve the cosmological singularity? And I happen to defend the idea that superstring theory is the best candidate for unified quantum theory of all forces, including gravity. And so therefore the previous question should be modified. Can superstring theory resolve the cosmological singularity? Now, what I want to do is I want to first um, present to you an old prehistoric toy model in which we try to address this question. And then I will talk about new work, new work in collaboration with an excellent student of mine, Samuel Aliberté, and with Trudeau Brahma, who's now a senior postdoc in Edinburgh. Now, the key approach is that we require a non-perturbative approach. We can't just use standard perturbative effective field theory if we re really want to resolve cosmological singularities. So here comes the old toy model of how string theory could resolve cosmological singularities. So in this toy model, we assumed we wanted what we wanted to do is we wanted to make use of new symmetries and new degrees of freedom, which differentiate string theory from point particle theory. So we had to put in the assumption in this work that there is a background space time and that space is compact, a nine dimensional torus. And that matter that lives in this space time is a gas of fundamental strings. And fundamental strings are different from fundamental point particles because there are many new degrees of freedom. Strings can oscillate and strings can wind the space. And as a consequence of the oscillatory degrees of freedom of strings, there's a maximal temperature that a gas of closed strings can achieve. And a consequence of the fact that there are winding modes of strings is the conclusen that physics at large toroidal distances is equivalent to physics at small toroidal distances. So let's take a, and here is the uh, actual duality, but I'll skip this slide for reasons of time. So if we take a box of strings with radius r and we plot the temperature as a function of this radius, then we find this bell-shaped curve. So if you start at very large box sizes, then the energy is in the light degrees of freedom, the momentum modes. You shrink the box, the momentum modes become more energetic, the temperature rises. Eventually, the temperature is so high that you can start to excite the oscillatory modes, the temperature levels are. And once the box size becomes small in Planck, in string units, then the energy can flow into the winding modes and the temperature starts to decrease. Now, based on this temperature radius curve, we postulated, and by we, this is Kumul Waffa and myself, we postulated the idea that the universe would start at some time at this high, in this high temperature state. And this looks like a fairly flat potential. So we postulated that it will live here for a long time before eventually rolling off. So this is the background that we put in by hand, an emergent phase, temperature close to the Hagedon temperature, a phase transition to the radiation phase of standard Big Bang cosmology. And this phase transition is obtained by the annihilation of string winding modes. 
And this phase transition only allows three dimensions to become large out of the nine dimensions of space that string theory has. So we have this SO9 going to SO3 cross SO6 symmetry breaking, which explains the origin of three large dimensions of space. And you will see that this symmetry breaking reemerges in the better theory that I'll present to you. So this is a space-time sketch of the cosmology that emerges from this background evolution of the scale factor. So we have the so time is the vertical axis, space is the horizontal axis. Times t smaller than t sub r, that's the emergent phase, where we have a gas of strings at close to the Hagadorn temperature, the phase transition, standard big bang phase of expansion. Blue curve is Hubble radius. The red curve is the scale of co-moving fluctuations, scales on which we want to explain observations. So now what happens is that since we have a gas of strings, we have a thermal state and we have thermal fluctuations. And these thermal fluctuations induce curvature fluctuations and gravitational waves as the scales become larger than the Hubble radius. So the way that Nayeri, Vatva, and myself, and later on joined by Subha Patel, the way we did this calculation of the predictions of string gas cosmology for cosmological observations, we follow this method. We first calculated the matter correlation functions in the Hagadon phase. And then for a fixed wave number, we converted the matter fluctuations to the metric fluctuations at the time when the fluctuation scale crossed the Hubble radius. And then we evolved the fluctuations to the future using the usual theory of cosmological fluctuations. And this is the main point, that given the partition function of a gas of strings, we can compute these matter correlation functions. So how do these calculations work? We want to compute the curvature perturbations, so this red phi, and we want to compute the gravitational waves, this small hij, in an expanding Friedman cosmology given by scale factor A of eta, where eta is conformal time. So the curvature perturbations are given by the energy density perturbations. The gravitational waves are given by the off-diagonal pressure perturbations. And we can go on and calculate them. For thermal fluctuations, we have to they are the energy density perturbations are determined by the specific heat capacity. And for a gas of closed springs, the specific heat capacity has this holographic scaling as a function of box size r. Th is the Hagedon temperature. T is the temperature when the particular scale that we are computing, which is related to r, when it exits the Hubble radius. Putting this together, gives us the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations, the things which we measure in cosmic microwave anisotropies and uh, galaxy power spectrum. And this is the result. You see that at first sight, it looks like the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations is scale independent, because you see that K doesn't appear in this final formula. But if you look a little bit more closely, you see that T is a time when the scale exits the Hubble radius. And you see that if that larger scales exit the Hubble radius at slightly earlier times than later scales, when the temperature is slightly higher, and that induces a slight red tilt of the spectrum of cosmological perturbations, like for inflation. So to get something different from inflation, we compute gravitational waves. For gravitational waves, we compute the off-diagonal pressure perturbations. And what we get is we get a scale invariant spectrum, like for inflation, but with a slight blue tilt, unlike for inflation. And we actually can compute a consistency relation. So this is this toy model of string gas cosmology. But the Achilles heel is that we stuck in the background by hand. We had no dynamics for the Hagedon phase. So let's try to do a little bit better. And... Here, there, this is now the new work that we've been involved in for a couple of years. The motivation is we should do something non-perturbative. We should do something which involves 
super strings. And then we realized that in the late 90s, there was a proposal for a non-perturbative definition of superstring theory, the banks fischler schenker suskind matrix model. So we decided to look at this matrix model and to see what we can get from that in terms of cosmology. Okay, so this is a matrix model. It's a quantum mechanical model of 10 n by n Hermitian matrices. Where, so there's no space and obviously no singularities. And this matrix model is a proposed non-perturbative definition of M theory if we take the n going to infinity limit. So this is the Lagrangian, which is the BFSS Lagrangian. There are nine Xi matrices, and there's a 10th matrix, which is hidden in this capital DT, which looks a little bit like a covariant derivative here. So the main point, it's a very well-defined quantum mechanical model. Now, what we did is we assumed that the state of this model is a high temperature state. Now, if we make this assumption, we can expand all matrices in Matsuba modes. And we chose the temperature to be so high that the action is dominated by the small n equals to zero Matsuba modes, the modes which don't depend on this Euclidean BFSS time. So we have a well-defined Lagrangian, a well-defined initial state. We have no space. And since we've chosen a thermal state, we've lost time. So the challenge now is to obtain space and time, a metric, and an early universe cosmology out of this. If we are successful, we are guaranteed to get a non-singular cosmology. Okay, so the idea is that we will use these small n equal to zero background uh, matrices to give us the space-time background. And the n small n not equal to zero matrices, they will give us the thermal fluctuations which live in this background. So the background matrices obey this, have this action. And this action is the same action as the action of the IKKT matrix model, a matrix model which is very popular in Japan. Okay, so how do we get space and time? So these are Hermitian matrices, and there's one distinguished matrix, because there's an eta mu mu symbol in the action, the A naught. And the idea is that the eigenvalues of A naught are the emergent time. So we will work in a basis in which A naught is diagonal, and uh, we will consider large N matrices. So there'll be many instances of time. Each eigenvalue is an instance of time. And you can show using the third line that the maximal eigenvalue scales as square root of capital N, N is the size of a matrix, and the distance between matrices goes as one over square root of N. So in the limit where capital N goes to infinity, we obtain infinite continuous time, and the eigenvalues are symmetric about zero, so we get time which runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the emergent time. So now let's turn to space. So we continue to work in the basis in which A naught is diagonal. And we look at the properties of the spatial matrices. So if you look at the third bullet point, so if you look at the action, BFSS action, then you can show using the riemann lemek lemma that expectation values of off-diagonal matrix elements decay if you go sufficiently far away from the diagonal. And sufficiently far means greater than the distance n sub c, where n sub c scales the square root of n. So bullet points three and four, we have analytical understanding. Numerical studies of the group in Japan shows that if you're close to the diagonal, these expectation values are roughly constant. 
Okay, so these are properties of these spatial matrices, and we want to get space from these spatial matrices. So our goal is to get space at a particular time from these AI matrices. Okay, so here is one of these spatial matrices, and this is the temporal matrix, which is diagonal. So if we want to define space at a particular value of time, we go down the temporal diagonal until we reach time t, and then we go a corresponding distance down the spatial diagonals, and we take a subbox of size small n by small n. And then we can compute the trace of the square of these subbox matrices. And that was defined by Nishimura and collaborators as the extent of space parameter in the direction corresponding to the particular spatial matrix AI that we pick. Now it was observed that these extent of space parameters show a phase a symmetry breaking transition. The basic Lagrangian has SO9 symmetry. All nine spatial dimensions are equivalent. But there seems to be, in this finite temperature state, a phase transition, which allows only three of these spatial dimensions of these extent of space parameters to become large. So we have this phase transition, which is exactly the phase transition that we saw in string gas cosmology. So now our proposal is to consider the size of these subblocks as our co-moving spatial coordinates, and we will take the extent of space parameter evaluated for this subblock size as the physical length of a curve between the origin in coordinate space and coordinate distance n sub i. So we have a proposal using the spatial matrices to get co-moving spatial coordinates and to get a physical length. And given these, this proposal, you immediately have a formula for the metric, at least for the ii component of the metric. And using the properties of the spatial matrices, which I showed you, we can calculate the dependence of this physical length on the coordinate n sub i, and therefore we can determine the dependence of the spatial metric component gii on the co-moving coordinate, and we find that it is independent of the spatial coordinate. It only depends on time. Using the SO3 symmetry, we basically get a spatial metric, which is spatially flat. So at this point, we have a proposal for emergent continuous time, for emergent continuous space, and for a metric which is spatially flat, at least to length scales, which scale to infinity as n goes to infinity. Okay, so now if you've paid careful attention, you'll realize that the background that I'm getting is precisely the background that we postulated back in 1989 as our background for string gas cosmology. So we've used the small n equals zero modes to give us the background. That was the string gas cosmology background. And we set up the thermal fluctuations of the non-trivial Matsubara modes those are thermal fluctuations. So we can go on in matrix cosmology to compute cosmological perturbations. First of all, we can try at late times to find a solution for the scale factor that describes the growth of the three large dimensions. And we find a power law growth, no sign of a cosmological constant. We've never quantized the harmonic oscillator. So therefore, we shouldn't expect the quantum cosmological constant. So the calculation of cosmological perturbation, it mimics what I showed you in the second part of my talk for string gas cosmology. So we have an action. Therefore, we can compute matter correlation functions. And therefore, we can compute the induced curvature perturbations and gravitational waves following the same equations we used in string gas cosmology. So here's a little bit, the points repeated. 
This is the way that we compute the perturbations. The key point is that we have the partition function and hence we can compute all of the matter correlation functions. We can compute the matter correlation functions which are given in the second equation, in the third equation, and that allows us to compute the curvature perturbations and the gravitational waves. Now we are starting from string theory. So we are starting from a theory which has holographic scaling and hence these matter correlation functions will manifest the holographic scaling, which we had in string gas cosmology. And you won't be surprised that if we do the calculation, so if we take the partition function of this matrix model, we compute the internal energy, we compute the heat specific heat capacity re related to the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations, out we get a scaling invariant spectrum of curvature perturbations. However, with a Poisson contribution on order of Eilert scales, and we get a scaling invariant spectrum of gravitational waves. So at this point, you see that if this proposal makes sense, then we have a matrix model, non-perturbative uh, setup, which yields emergent infinite space, emergent infinite time, an emergent spatially flat metric, and an emergent early universe phase in which thermal fluctuations lead to scaling variant curvature perturbations and gravitational waves. So I hope that Alexei would be pleased with this approach, even though I should admit that since I'm not a string theorist, many, there could be fatal mistakes in this approach, which I presented. But my de facto PhD advisor, Bill Press, told me that if you want to do something really new, you have to uh, risk being wrong. But hopefully I've persuaded you that this is an interesting approach. It's in the spirit of Alexei's famous 1980 paper. And here is a list of open problems, long list of open problems. And these are the conclusions. And thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk to honor Alexei. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, uh, because the, <laughs> the sounds is, um, uh, I moved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, Maybe we postpone questions for the Can board. I ask you a question? Do you have some question? Yes, can I ask? Uh, only very short. Yes. Please. Thank you very much, Robert, for a nice talk. I have the following question. You obtain from a matrix model, you obtain something like the Friedman matrix. But yes. It, you will get a standard cosmological singularity after that. Either this Friedman model is only valid at future times, and I don't, we will not get a future singularity. So A of T will continue growing for all times. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for answering for the questions. You have, we have to go to the next speaker. Now the next speaker is Richard Woodard. He will tell us about recent oh. developments in stochastic inflation. Irina, can you enable my screen sharing? It says that I'm not, screen sharing is not enabled for me. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, Wait a sec, I, will, I think I was, I enabled, ah. It look it yes uh, just a like, uh, Richard I think it will be co okay. and then Joe, Alexei will uh, fix yeah, the yeah. problem I think yeah, yeah yeah you are now the co-host so okay thanks very much uh, so let's see if I can screen share here yes mm -hmm. please oh beautiful I believe I have done it but maybe you decoupled for a second so anyway yeah I had to transfer from my apartment back to uh, the office. Uh, and I should be, uh, I think that was what uh, decoupled me. Uh, so um, uh, 
Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, re some recent developments in stochastic inflation, in a particular version of stochastic inflation designed to get not big fluctuations like some people are interested in, but small fluctuations that might uh, grow to be big. Uh, and this is a topic that, um, or a subject that Alexei invented, of course. Uh, and uh, this is based on work done with Nick Samus and Shunpei Miao, both of whom knew uh, Alexei. Uh, Nick uh, invited him to uh, Crete. And uh, Shunpei worked very hard um, less than uh, two years ago with um, Andre Barvinsky to uh, set up a uh, 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 Taiwan-Russia uh, grant uh, that could uh, get Alexei and um, Andre and some of their junior colleagues uh, to uh, visit Taiwan. Sadly, the uh, international developments nixed that, but um, but they both uh, admired and, um, and uh, thought very highly of Alexei. Okay, so uh, normally I'm delighted to talk about my work, but uh, I think there's nobody here that doesn't wish that this occasion hadn't occurred. However, one of the things I really admired about Alexei, uh, and quite distinct from many physicists, frankly, um, is that uh, he faced the world as it is rather than uh, as he would like it to be. And I'll try very hard to uh, emulate him in this. Another thing I admired about him is that he stood by uh, his homeland, uh, even when it was uh, in uh, difficult circumstances. I first met him in 2002 at a conference in the Siberian city of Tomsk. And what I was doing then was uh, to um, do explicit uh, 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 dimensionally regulated and fully renormalized calculations uh, in quantum field theories on the sitter background. And I was encountering something that uh, puzzled and intrigued me. Namely, I was encountering uh, large factors of logarithm of the scale factor. Uh, and uh, I had at that time gotten two results. Uh, one was the uh, expectation value of the uh, massless minimally coupled scalar uh, phi to the four stress tensor at not just one loop, but at two loops. Very hard calculation to do. And uh, secondly, uh, the massless minimally coupled scalar quantum electrodynamics uh, vacuum polarization, which you can then use to uh, calculate the photon wave function. And uh, that was also showing a, a large logarithm. And uh, I was greeted with just absolute disbelief by the uh, Western cosmology community. They were telling me that these results had to be wrong and giving me all kinds of reasons that uh, I frankly didn't understand and I, I could not uh, repeat uh, anyway I uh, in this uh, in the talk that uh, they were nice enough to allow me to give at Tomsk I uh, described how we had done these I thought very careful fully dimensionally regulated fully renormalized uh, calculations on the sitter background and then with some asperity in my voice uh, I ended the seminar by saying what is wrong with these results everybody tells me they're wrong they're nonsense I shouldn't be doing this what's wrong with them and I will never forget, Alexei raised his hand and said, I don't think anything's wrong with them. And further, I think you'll find that they follow from stochastic inflation. Well, I was uh, very, very fascinated by that. And he and I talked after that. Um, I must admit that I didn't believe him at first that these things would follow from stochastic inflation. Uh, and he challenged me to check it. I actually was sure that they wouldn't because I had some unpublished three loop results and I was just sure that nothing as simple as the uh, Langevin equation that he had was going to correctly describe these complicated intricate quantum field theory results. Um, and by the way, I was not alone. There were a lot of formal quantum gravity people who didn't believe this. Uh, and you can see why they didn't, right? I mean, uh, the full blown quantum field theory has divergences. Uh, it doesn't commute with itself. It's a um, complicated beast. The stochastic theory uh, is talking about a stochastic random variable. It doesn't look like they intersect at all. Um, but uh, but Alexei was right. Uh, and when I uh, checked the uh, three loop results that I had against stochastic inflation, against his stochastic predictions, frankly, uh, to my embarrassment, I screwed up the stochastic um, uh, prediction at first. But Alexei was very polite uh, and he explained to me um, how it is uh, to do it correctly, and uh, it agreed right on the dot with the results that we had at three loops. Well, I'm somewhat skeptical, but if I see something working at one loop, at two loops, and three loops, then I believe it's likely correct. And uh, Alexei uh, gave me a challenge, uh, and my collaborator, Nick Samus, at that time, a challenge too. And he asked, um, okay, so devise a proof. Uh, and uh, those of you who've worked with Alexei know that he sometimes sets difficult tasks. 
That was in 2002. That was quite a difficult task. It took us three years to get the proof, um, but uh, I'll present it for you. Uh, and uh, I was uh, actually uh, fortunate enough, privileged enough to uh, present it at a seminar in the Lebedev Institute in 2005 before Alexei himself. Um, I should say that it only works for scalar potential models. So it works for models where you have a minimally coupled scalar uh, with a potential, no derivatives, no other fields, just that kind of uh, uh, system. Now, you'll see in the literature many claims that it works more generally, but those are almost all problematic uh, uh, claims, and I'll explain why, but it helps to first understand why it is that it works in this uh, situation. The way you get a proof is you take the exact uh, Heisenberg field equation and you integrate it out. You, uh, you invert the kinetic operator and integrate it out. You get something that an older physicist, such as myself, would recognize as the Yang-Feldman equation. So instead of kinetic operator on field is equal to minus uh, derivative of potential, you get uh, field operator is equal to inverse kinetic operator, which I'll write in terms of a retarded Green's function given by the commutator of two free fields. And then you have to add something which is a zero of the kinetic operator. That's of course the free field expansion. And there are the creation and annihilation operators. And if you just were to iterate that order by order, you would generate an expansion of the full field in terms of the free field. That's called the free field expansion. But I don't want to do that. I want to take this uh, equation, which is exact. It is completely exact, no approximations at all, except I haven't dimensionally regulated, but I could do that too. And now the next step is to notice a very important thing, and that is that... Um, that uh, you have to understand Starbinsky's stochastic formalism as not recovering all of quantum field theory. It shouldn't do that. It wasn't designed to do that. What it's designed to do is to recover the leading infrared logarithms at each order in perturbation theory. So in lambda phi to the four theory, if you have a one factor of lambda, you should get up to two large logarithms, logarithm of A squared or logarithm squared of A. Uh, that's the leading logarithm term. There might be a logarithm of A term. That's subleading. You won't recover that. There might be constant terms. You won't recover those. At order lambda squared, there would be up to four factors of logarithm of A. That's the leading logarithm. There might be a lambda to the or a logarithm to the third. That's subleading and et cetera. You won't recover those things. Now, an important thing about the way field theory works is that those infrared logarithms come from this free field, uh, and they only come from the uh, infrared part of the mode sum. And in order to reach leading logarithm order, it has to be that each of the free fields in this expansion, each pair of free fields, where uh, that one counts as one, and also the uh, one in the commutator of the retarded Green's function counts as one pair, um, each pair has to contribute an infrared logarithm. If even one pair fails to contribute an infrared logarithm, then you will not reach leading logarithm. You'll get a right contribution, but it won't be a leading logarithm contribution. So if what you want to do is to reproduce the leading logarithm terms, um, you, uh, you can go ahead and infrared truncate the uh, free field operator uh, at the level of the field equations, because every single phi, no matter how complicated it is in the expansion, is going to have to develop uh, an infrared logarithm. It's going to have to contribute an infrared logarithm. And those things come only from the infrared part of the mode sum. So um, that means that you can take the uh, full free field mode sum and you can truncate it uh, at um, k is equal to uh, horizon crossing, k is equal to ha. You can also take the mode function and you can truncate that to just the first non-zero term in the mode expansion, which is this, or in the large K expansion. Uh, in order to get the commutator, of course, you have to get the first non-zero uh, imaginary term. But if you do that, uh, then what you get is a field equation that looks like this. So you've got this now infrared truncated free field. When you infrared truncate the commutator term, it turns out that you get something where you can do the three-dimensional integration and you get a three-dimensional delta function times that theta function. Uh, and of course, that allows you to, um, to uh, explicitly um, 
uh, explicitly uh, perform the uh, spatial integrations and get a very simple equation. I call the field that it's equal to now no longer capital Phi because it's totally different than the original field. It, it for example, commutes with itself. It doesn't have any uh, infrared ultraviolet divergences, but it was designed, it was constructed so that correlators of it will exactly agree at leading logarithm order with correlators of the original quantum field. And then the next step is utterly trivial. You just take the time derivative of this, and that gives phi dot is equal to phi zero dot, gets rid of the integration, multiplying by 3h uh, gives you uh, Starobinsky's Langevin equation. Okay, so there's a derivation, right? Explicit derivation, and also embedding it in the sense in which um, uh, in the sense in which uh, uh, the Starobinsky formalism uh, connects up to quantum field theory. That is, it represents, it correctly reproduces the leading logarithm contributions of this type of quantum field theory. Uh, and I think it's very important to notice that. Another very important thing to notice is this key step that allows you to do it is that every pair of free fields must contribute an unfred logarithm in order to reach uh, leading logarithm order. That is going to fail when you have fields other than massless minimally coupled scalars or gravitons, for example, photons, fermions, massless conformally coupled scalars, etc. It will even fail if some of the massless minimally coupled scalars and or gravitons are differentiated. For example, the fundamental quantum gravitational interaction is H, D, H, D, H. Those differentiated fields will not contribute uh, infrared logarithms, but this undifferentiated one can. That gets all mixed up in the uh, in the expansion, the free field expansion. So you can't tell what's ultimately going to be undifferentiated and what will um, be differentiated, and that invalidates the proof. That shows you that you're you're not going to be able to do this proof. And like I say, people who say that they, some people just go ahead and do it anyway without trying to derive it. Uh, but that in all cases that I know gives incorrect results. And I know that because I've done a lot of explicit calculations. And sometimes when uh, people who make these claims uh, and I discuss it, I'll just challenge them. Look, I've got a whole lot of results. Can you explain this or this or this? I think I can, uh, to this community, make a very simple argument, uh, two simple arguments to show you that it's just impossible to get them in general. One is, let's just consider a scalar field, a massless minimally coupled scalar field that is going to contribute ultraviolet or infrared logarithms. But let's look at the expectation value of the doubly differentiated version of it. So d mu phi, d nu phi. Now, exact dimensional regularization shows that that's equal to minus some constant that depends on the Hubble parameter in Desider times g mu nu. I'm in a uh, space-like metric, so the spatial components of that are negative. What's wrong with that? Well, if you try to completely stochastic formalism, then that field phi would have to be just a finite field. It would have to be a stochastic random variable. And if you set mu equal to nu, the result of its expectation value, there's no ultraviolet divergences, it would have to be finite and it would have to be positive. It's inconsistent with what the exact result gives. Uh, so there are, so first problem is that there are order one contributions that come as much from the ultraviolet as from the infrared and no stochastic formalism, no purely stochastic formalism is going to reproduce those. The second problem is that in these more general theories, renormalization matters. So that uh, typically happens, for example, in quantum gravity and nonlinear sigma models by the primitive diagrams going like uh, some constant that depends on the Hubble constant over d minus four. I'm using dimensional regularization where d is the dimension minus a counter term, which because of the square root of minus g goes like the renormalization scale mu times a to the d minus four over d. And of course, the incomplete cancellation between those terms gives you minus logarithm of mu a over 2h plus order d minus 4. No stochastic formalism is going to recover that. It's coming partially from the ultraviolet. You cannot get that with a stochastic formalism. Uh, but it is a large logarithm. And even if you don't want it, I want it. Uh, I think those large logarithms could get to be big and make interesting effects. And I want to describe them. As it happens, quantum field theory does have a formalism that was set up to do that. Um, it's called the renormalization group. 
Uh, and um, it turns out to be the correct way to describe that class of infrared logarithms. Uh, and in all of this, it's crucial to stay focused on um, on uh, viewing uh, on, on the task of trying to sum up large logarithms. You you must avoid mysticism about open systems and closed systems and about um, about coarse graining and stuff like that. You're just going to get wrong results if you do that. And you must always check your result uh, against explicit computations. Quantum field theory is just too complicated. There are too many things going on. I've shown you two of them, and there may be others uh, to, uh, to be able to get that right. Uh, so the basic way to do it, the basic way to, uh, to uh, get a resummation technique is first off to distinguish between active and passive fields. Undifferentiated active fields can cause infrared logarithms. Passive fields cannot. Examples of active fields are massless minimally coupled scalars and gravitons, where by graviton I mean you take the full metric and write it as a squared times e to mu nu plus kappa h mu nu, where kappa, is 16 pi, kappa squared is 16 pi g. Uh, examples of passive fields are massless conformally coupled scalars, fermions, photons, they're all passive. And one procedure that is generally correct is to integrate out the passives and also even the differentiated actives in the presence of a constant active background. And that is golden because what that will do is to induce a scalar potential model for the remaining active fields. And at that point, we, we, we offer up gratitude to Alexei for having shown us how to deal with those things. And now we've got a way of doing non-perturbative resummations of that. Um, and, uh, but, but it's got some surprises. Field theory has got a lot of complicated things going on. So it turns out that there are, to my knowledge, at least three different ways that constant active backgrounds can induce effective potentials. The first way is the one everybody knows. Uh, and that's, uh, if you have a scalar coupling to some passive fields, uh, it could, uh, uh, give a mass term. So for example, a Yukawa coupling between a fermion C bar C and a massless minimally coupled scalar phi. If phi was constant, then that would be a fermion mass term. And I think everybody knows how to calculate the uh, Coleman-Weinberg potential associated with that. And that is indeed how we got a stochastic formalism that correctly describes, as far as we know, one or, or all order of the loop expansion of quantum electrodynamics and uh, of Yukawa theory. Um, and we've checked it explicitly at one and two loop orders. The second way is something I would never have guessed. I don't know. I'm always surprised by um, by what appears in the literature that I didn't know about. Um, but uh, that way is through a field strength renormalization. So suppose you had a nonlinear sigma model where you had two fields. A, I won't give its kinetic term, but it has a regular massless minimally coupled scalar kinetic term. And then another field B, which, whose kinetic term is multiplied by some algebraic function of A. Well, then if A is constant, that's just a field strength renormalization of B. And it's easy to write down what the B propagator is. It's just the regular propagator with A equal to zero divided by uh, F of A squared, right? So that will turn out to uh, induce um, scalar potential models as well. And the final way, which is very sneaky, is through the Hubble constant. So remember that uh, classive active fields are the um, the graviton field, and if you uh, and having a constant scalar is analogous to having a constant h mu nu. Well, I will show you later on, but just take it from me that having a constant h mu nu. So a still varies like the sitter, but h mu nu is constant, not zero, but constant, spatially space time constant. That just corresponds to the sitter with a slightly different h. And so you just take the propagator that you already worked out that has H's all over the place, and you just replace them by that constant, uh, by that different H, which, by the way, depends on little h mu nu. And that gives you then uh, the way to, um, to integrate out those fields. And I will actually do this for you uh, with the uh, second class of, uh, or in the second class of uh, models, or the second class of techniques for nonlinear sigma models. So let's consider a um, nonlinear sigma model, a single field nonlinear sigma model whose Lagrangian is given here on the sitter background. The exact field equations are given in blue. 
And uh, what I tell you is the correct thing to do is to integrate out the differentiated scalar fields. So these guys uh, in the presence of a constant scalar field. Okay, so if you just set phi, phi equal to phi zero, then uh, it's easy to see from here, if, if this phi was just set equal to phi zero, then the uh, full scalar propagator, an exact statement would just be the, the free scalar propagator divided by one plus lambda over two phi zero squared. That means that we can integrate this term out uh, as done here, and lo and behold, it already had one factor of one plus lambda over uh, two phi. When it gets up two inverse factors, it looks like that. And that corresponds to the derivative of a logarithmic potential. And that is a Starobinsky scalar potential model, which, um, which uh, uh, his genius realized uh, can be described by this Langevin equation. And um, if we solve that Langevin equation, then if you were to just set uh, the sto stochastic jitter field equal to zero, you would get a classical uh, equation that rolls by itself without any, um, without any stochastic jitter. And the exact solution for that would be here, given in curly brackets. Uh, and um, what's happening is that it's rolling down the, uh, its logarithmic potential. Uh, of course, it's easier for, uh, and, and it's jittered, it's... Uh, um, um, pushed a little bit back and forth by the stochastic fluctuations of phi naught, it's easier to fluctuate down than to fluctuate up. So what you get is this evolution minus a contribution from stochastic jitter, which um, because it's easier to fluctuate down than up. And by the way, this is very, very interesting model because this exhibits evolution for all time. So in the model that... Um, that Alexei and uh, um, Yokoyama considered uh, lambda phi to the four, and in fact, a general stable scalar potential model, uh, everybody knows that the evolution asymptotes out to a constant. That also happens in scalar quantum electrodynamics, and that's prompted a certain class of physicists to say, oh, well, that's always gonna happen, but it doesn't always happen. There are cases, known cases, where it doesn't happen. One of them is Yukawa theory. There, the potential rolls down rather than up, uh, as it would in the standard model. That's just because the Coleman-Weinberg potential is negative. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, uh, causes evolution to go on forever. Well, the same class of people that like to dismiss uh, interesting quantum effects would say, oh, well, that's an unstable model even in flat space. So here is a model which is perfectly stable in flat space, but has evolution go on, persist to late times, to arbitrarily late times? It never stops. Okay, well, I said there's also this second class of um, large logarithms that can occur due to in theories that have derivative interactions, which nonlinear sigma models do. Uh, and that's due to the incomplete cancellation between primitive terms and which don't have an a to the d minus four and counter terms, which do from the square root of minus g. And an example uh, there is the uh, is this two field model where you have a field A and B, and uh, the uh, A generates fluctuations in B that uh, engender large logarithms. Uh, you can calculate many things in this model. We calculated, I think, uh, twelve large logarithms at one and two loop. Not easy to do order, uh, but I will tell you about one of them here. One of the ones that you can do is to calculate the one loop self mass square. That's the one PI two point function of both A and B. If you look at the one PI two point function for B, it needs counter terms at one loop order that involve some higher derivatives. So uh, box B, box B, and then some terms that could be viewed as curvature dependent field strength renormalizations of the lower order kinetic term, right? Yeah, the curvatures. I'm sorry? It's okay, please continue. Okay. Uh, the CB1 term is intrinsically higher derivative and doesn't have anything to do with large logarithms, but the CB2 term would be viewed as a field strength renormalization uh, of the original theory. And from the counter term, where, where again, you know, I, I do explicit dimensionally regulated calculations, so I know exactly what this is, and the finite part doesn't matter, only the divergent part matters. You can calculate the uh, gamma function. It is exactly that. Uh, and then the Kellen-Zemanzig equation 
for the um, two-point function, the exchange potential that the scalar would induce uh, is uh, there. And then if you make the usual step of changing the kellen semantic equation from being an uninteresting thing that tells you how it is that things change as you scale the renormalization scale mu to being an interesting thing uh, that tells you how it is things change as you change R, uh, you wind up getting a result that tells you that this one loop or this um, tree order result for the um, long range potential picks up a one loop correction. So it picks up a logarithm of HR there. And guess what? That is exactly what explicit one and two loop calculations did. So for both the single field model that I just showed you and for the double field model, Nick and Shunpei and I both, um, or all three of us together, calculated for each of those things, the um, one loop uh, self mass squared uh, and used it to find corrections to the mode functions and to the exchange potential. We calculated the expectation value of the fields at one and two loop order. And uh, and I've color coded the large logarithms that we've got. The red ones are ones which are explainable through stochastic effects. That is, you induce this effective potential and then you use the Starobinsky formalism on it. Uh, and, um, and those large logarithms come from that effect. And in green, I've got the ones which are renormalization group effects. And you notice that you do need both things. This is a model where this class of models is where both things occur. So the final class of models that we've made progress on that I want to tell you about, and this is very recent progress, like just this last week. Uh, whoops, what's going on here? Uh, is massless minimally coupled scalar corrections to gravity. So you take a massless minimally coupled scalar and you look at the scalar loop contribution to the graviton self-energy, the 1pi two-point function of the graviton. And that guy goes into the effective field equation of linearized gravity. So here's the Lichnerowitz operator, the linearized gravity kinetic operator. Here's the source, and the quantum correction to it is this 1pi two-point function. Uh, and you can use that to study two interesting things. First, if you turn off the source, you can study gravitational radiation, and second thing is if you set the source equal to a point mass, uh, you can study uh, corrections, one loop corrections to the uh, Coulomb potential and its relativistic doppelganger. Uh, and we have results for both of those things. The, um, the graviton, uh, the interesting thing to look at with gravitational radiation is the electric component of the uh, vial tensor. And it starts off as the classical piece and then minus a constant where kappa squared is eight pi, or should be 16 pi g, sorry about that, uh, uh, h squared over six, 160 pi squared times logarithm of a. So it causes the amplitude to go down and to go down by an amount that grows eventually non-perturbatively large. Same thing happens for the potentials. The Newtonian potential is its classical result plus a result which was known ages ago, back before most of you were even born, um, uh, from flat space quantum gravity calculations, just uh, changed in de Sitter by taking R and multiplying by A. And then a new de Sitter, intrinsically de Sitter piece, where you have kappa squared, uh, instead of one over R squared, you have kappa squared H squared, and that is uh, a logarithm of A uh, HR and uh, the relativistic doppelganger, except for a field strength uh, renormalization goes exactly the same way. So this is what the explicit calculation gives you. Remember, I've stressed that you're just not gonna get anywhere if you don't all the time check results against explicit calculations. So this is what we used as, as our lodestone, as the guiding principle. And then we tried this uh, general technique. So first, integrate out um, the differentiated fields, in this case, the differentiated scalars, which are right here. Whoops, what's going on here? Uh, in the presence of constant uh, graviton field. And now I will give you this proof that I mentioned to you before. Suppose you set g mu nu equal to a squared times g tilde mu nu, where g tilde is exactly constant, independent of space and time. And it turns out that is de Sitter with h squared just replaced by minus g tilde zero zero h squared. And uh, the proof of that is you just calculate the affine connection and then plug that in and get the Riemann tensor. And you see it takes the locally de Sitter form, but with a slight change in what the Hubble parameter is. 
Well, that's wonderful because I have the scalar propagator for arbitrary h. All I do then is to take all the h squares that occurred and I replace them by minus g tilde upper zero zero h squared. And I can integrate out this differentiated scalar. And that gives me a leading logarithm stochastically induced uh, stress tensor. And it takes the form, by the way, of a negative contribution to the cosmological constant, which could be arbitrarily large, by the way, if uh, g tilde zero zero is very near zero. Um, okay, so one problem, and the reason why we were doing this exercise is because this stochastically induced stress tensor is not conserved. It's conserved uh, if g tilde zero zero is constant, but of course we wanna use it in cases where g tilde zero zero isn't constant. Uh, and then it's not conserved. Well, that's not wrong. That's exactly what should be true. Conservation requires all orders in the uh, in the uh, logarithms, so it doesn't. It's not just a leading logarithm effect. It requires subleading logarithms too. And all this technique will do is to get leading logarithms. So um, what we uh, think is the correct procedure, and this, by the way, is something that couldn't occur in nonlinear sigma models because they don't have the structure of gravity. Um, what we think is the correct procedure to do is to extend the um, the uh, stress tensor to make it fully conserved. Uh, and we think that that's also right to do in gravity. And uh, one extension of the stress tensor, which will make it conserved, is to make it almost an R-squared theory, but R-squared logarithm of R. And that will give a fully conserved stress tensor, of course, because it's the variation of an invariant Lagrangian. And it will also agree with G mu nu, um, with T mu nu, for the case where g tilde mu nu happens to be constant. Uh, when you do that and use these effective field equations, what you find is that they don't explain a single one of these three large logarithms. We actually already knew that uh, because we could, uh, we could look at the explicit calculation uh, and we could see that they were all coming from this uh, incomplete cancellations between uh, counter terms and primitive stuff. So we already knew that that was going to happen, but we wanted to go through this exercise because we think that that is likely not to happen in pure gravity. Uh, and we wanted to see how to deal with this. And I think we do know how to deal with it. The uh, induced stress tensor is stochastically induced stress tensor is going to be more complicated, but I think we can still reconstruct uh, how to extend it by using the explicit potentials that we have, uh, that we will have when we solve it. Okay, so the final uh, thing, so so the 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 um, stochastically induced potentials don't explain, or the stochastically induced stress tensor doesn't explain the large logarithms that we see in this model. What does? Well, they're curvature induced field strength renormalizations. Uh, it took and Veltman, this was the first model explicitly studied in dimensional regularization, and it took and Veltman long ago showed that it can be renormalized using two counter terms, uh, a Ricci squared and a Vial squared counter term, where the coefficients in dimensional regularization are given that. The R squared counter term induces a curvature renormalization of G and lambda, where you take the R squared term and write it as a basically irrelevant higher derivative piece plus a term that could be regarded as a renormalization of the, um, of the Einstein-Hilbert piece, plus a term that could be regarded as a renormalization of lambda. We had thought originally, and this is again another example of how you just cannot trust your intuition. Field theory is just too complicated. Um, we had thought that the C squared term would be like that box B, box B term in the nonlinear sigma model, but it turns out that uh, it also can induce a... Um, curvature dependent field strength renormalization from the fact that these things have second time derivatives. That was a big surprise to me. Uh, and anyway, when you put the two effects together, then the kalin semantic equation explains all three leading logarithms. We could already tell that they were coming from the renormalization group um, by the exact calculation. I think that the this combination of the same two techniques is likely to work for pure quantum gravity. Um, but I'm pretty sure that that not all the large logarithms in pure quantum gravity will be explainable by renormalization group effects. In any case, let me uh, finish up. So in conclusion, Alexei Starobinsky was a great man who I was privileged to know and learn from. Uh, I think everybody will agree he was also a genius and he could see one, one evidence of that is that he could see deeply hidden truths. 
Uh, I know many, many fine physicists uh, who are at, many of whom are attending this conference, uh, but none of them, none of us is that good because I include myself in it. I told you how many times I screwed up, how many times I was wrong, and I was only led by the nose uh, by explicit calculations to get the right result. We simply cannot make progress on the issue of resumming the large logarithms without exact, uh, without comparing with exact, fully dimensionally regulated, fully renormalized quantum field theory calculations. And this is necessary both to check the formalism and to motivate extensions of it. I didn't realize that some of this stuff was going to happen until I had the exact calculation and I could look at what it was telling me. Um, let me just remind you that inflationary quantum field theory produces at least three kinds of large logarithms. One's from tail terms. That's the things that drove the original uh, stochastic inflation. And an example of that, or the, the paradigm for that, is that the uh, scalar propagator has this normal term plus uh, what DeWitt and Bremy would call a tail term. Those guys cause uh, large logarithms. But then there are three kinds of induced stochastic potential models where fields that don't produce uh, large logarithms induce um, uh, uh, potentials which will, uh, of active fields, which will, and they can happen in three different ways, uh, both by generating masses, by changing field strengths, and also in this funny way by changing the Hubble parameter. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a whole new class of large logarithms, and there may be others that I haven't found yet, uh, that come from incomplete cancellation between primitive terms, which go like 2h to the d minus 4 over d minus 4, and counter terms, which go like the renormalization scale times a to the d minus 4 over d minus 4. Um, so far, we have got resummation schemes that exist for scalar potential. Well, that, of course, was due to Alexei. Um, for scalars coupled to other fields, uh, also due to Alexei, uh, where you just integrate out the uh, uh, passive fields, and then they induce uh, uh, scalar potential models. Um, fairly new nonlinear sigma models, which uh, which uh, give rise to both um, large logarithms coming from tail terms and large logarithms coming from these renormalization group effects, uh, and most recently uh, from oh, and also graviton corrections to matter. Um, so graviton correction to E and M, graviton correction to massless minimally coupled scalar, and graviton corrections to Dirac, which are all so far explained by the renormalization group, uh, and scalar corrections to gravity, which are all explained by the um, renormalization group. And the next step is to extend this formalism exactly the same way we did uh, for the uh, massless minimally coupled scalar uh, coupled to gravity to pure quantum gravity. And what I expect is that there will be both uh, stochastic and renormalization group effects, just as there are in the nonlinear sigma models. And uh, I'm finished now. Thanks very much for your attention uh, and for inviting me to speak at this uh, fine meeting. OK, thank you very much, Richard, for your interesting talk, very interesting talk. Unfortunately, we have no time for some question, uh, maybe the people can ask you in the concluding section. Let's go, thank you very much once again. Let's go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Andre Linde. He is, his uh, presentation is already here. So Andre, please tell us about what you want to tell us. Because I don't see your title, but in any case, you can announce the title yourself. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I don't remember my title as well. But in uh, any case, but, uh, just one uh, remark. Could you please show the full screen? Is it is okay for you? Uh, but this uh, is not so necessary. I, Up to you. I think that... Uh, I am showing you uh, the full screen of my pre presentation. What, what you would like to see? Now? Uh, I mean, without left side, oh. with slides okay. here. But this is okay. up to you. Up to you. Okay, uh, uh, let, let me try. Um, okay, hmm. now uh, it's perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So, uh, first of all, it's a very sad occasion. And uh, on the other hand, I also happy to see 
that so many uh, wonderful physicists whom I don't remember see uh, together at one place over many, many years gathered with one obvious absentee, which is very sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I, I will start this uh, with discussing a little bit of uh, history of the Nuffield Symposium, where uh, uh, for the first time many people gathered together uh, to discuss new inflationary scenario. Uh, and lots of progress was done during the three weeks when we met there. And this is a photograph which shows at the center uh, Starobinsky, uh, below him it is Stephen Hawking, and then uh, to the right it is Alan Goose, Paul Steinhardt, and many other people. Uh, me, <laughs> I am not shown here. I guess at that time I was typing my new paper because uh, I, I borrowed a typewriter there and there was something about multiverse I was trying to do. Okay, so uh, this was a wonderful conference but for me, uh, the main result obtained there was not already not new. And that's kind of surprising because everybody thinks that this theory of uh, density perturbations in new inflation was kind of discovered at this conference and uh, starting from Hawking. But um, my recollection is very much different and uh, very vivid because it was painful for me. Uh, uh, I've met... Uh, many people just about a month before this conference at a conference in Tartu. And this was a, a small conference <clears throat> in Estonia. Many good people came, including Starobinsky. And during uh, his presentation there, and that it was is, uh, early uh, 82, approximately May, maybe very beginning of uh, June, but I think it was in May, uh, and he reports and says that the amplitude of density perturbations in inflationary, new inflationary scenario is too uh, large, and therefore inflationary scenario is essentially, essentially dead. Okay, so my friend didn't even warn me that this is coming, and I'm here and I'm listening what he says, oh my god, what is going on? Then I'm returning to Moscow, and here is a preprint from Stephen Hawking saying that everything is fine there. Okay, the amplitude of perturbation is just right. Well, that's good news. And I'm returning to, uh, 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 we're going to Nuffield uh, Symposium and uh, Starobinsky travels there together with his preprint, well, uh, text probably, uh, which we already, uh, all results have been already obtained by him. And then Hawking with different results. And then eventually uh, Hawking, after discussing with Starobinsky and uh, with Alan Booth, suddenly changes his opinion, withdraw his preprint so that I cannot find it anywhere. Okay, but we knew what happened. Okay? And then his paper appeared first in physics uh, letters with the correct uh, results, uh, corrected, etc. And I decided to check with Starobinsky whether his memory uh, of these events uh, well, agree with what I recall. And, you know, it, it is not that important. I did it two weeks before, he did it two weeks earlier, whatever. Never mind. What was uh, the Starobinsky reply is just from the human point of view, this is interesting to see, uh, and I just put here his message. So he said that I tried to find the program of this meeting, which I mentioned to you. In my opinion, not succeeded well. Still, it might show itself sometimes in the future. What I can say at present, tra -ta 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 -ta, uh, uh, somewhere in the May first half of June. Indeed, as far as I remember, I had obtained the result for perturbations as well as most of other results of my, uh, my physics letters paper by May eighty two. Okay, and I absolutely believe it because I so clearly remember my pain when I have heard this result in Tartu, okay? So, uh, and then he said that he uh, visited uh, uh, Hawking when he uh, came to this conference and he discussed his paper and uh, told Hawking that he disagreed with Hawking's results. And Hawking, as he said, did not ask him any questions at all. 
And three days later, he changed his paper for the paper with the right result. Okay. And what he said, thus, one may have different guesses to what extent my firm statement has affected Stephen and has forced him to reconsider the first variant of his paper that he did very quickly, being a great scientist indeed. So what was important for him, not that how exactly have uh, Stephen did he did something indecent or whatever. He said that, yeah, it was just minimal push which have led uh, Stephen to recognize how it should be done precisely. And Stephen changed the way of thinking and uh, submitted the paper with result almost instantly. And it was clear that, uh, well, he really understood what happened because the discussion with Starobinsky was not uh, uh, detailed. And the paper of Starobinsky was second to be published after all. Uh, and then in this a long message which I received from Starobinsky. And that's just, you see, uh, we're trying to get kind of a human <laughs> understanding, not just scientific. Well, what the, of the, now I'm talking like he, of the person who is no longer around. He immediately started talking about Bohr and Heisenberg. And how, in view of this play of Boyer, Born and Heisberg, would he understand what happened with him and Hawking? And also, what he think really the author of the play about the Born and Heisberg wanted to say, and why exactly sometimes in between talking, uh, Bohr stood up and completely immediately left and stopped discussing everything with Heisberg. What was it? And he writes his, his explanation. So I hope that uh, later on all of our PDF files will be available to those who want to uh, see it and you look at it. And well, and then after all of this and during all of these discussions, suddenly somebody suggests to go to the movie. Oh my God, what the hell? Going, this is such a wonderful conference. So great people around. Persistent discussion, and no, we go to movie. Why we should go to movie? What is movie? Apocalypse now. And I, what is that? Why do I want to see this war? And Starobinsky start explaining me how this movie is so profound and it is famous, etc. I thought, oh my God, I've never expected Alyosha to know anything about movies which I have not even heard about in Moscow. So we went to the movie. Yeah, that was a shocking experience. Ah. Then, uh, what do I think about all of this story now? Because how is that? Okay, we are trying to be honest as possible to each other and to everybody. And if we need to say something painful to our friends, we just do it because what happened in the end of it. I was very happy at this, very unhappy at this conference for this result. I was happy about everything else because the field moved forward. And if not for his results, I would not invent uh, chaotic inflation because it was clear uh, recognition of what was wrong. And it was not the only thing uh, that was wrong about new inflation, about large amplitude of perturbations. It was a wrong setting because inflation in this scenario started very late and it was necessary to solve the problem of uniformity and homogeneity and flatness of the universe so that it, if it closed the universe to survive to the lost light, uh, late stage when uh, inflation will begin. So uh, if you recognize all of that, you need to know uh, something better. And that was later done when I invented chaotic inflation scenario. That's another episode of our uh, contact with Alyosha. It was a strange, strange interaction because he was thinking differently from me or I was thinking differently. We, we, it was difficult for us to communicate uh, what we think to each other. But Starobinsky had a very talented uh, student Kaufman, 
and we work with Kaufman and Starobinsky. And uh, when he moves from me to Starobinsky, etc., then we were able to understand what we are talking about. And this was example in the theory of reheating after inflation. It was actually pushed forward by Kaufman. I told him, I don't believe you. This is something strange about parametric resonance, etc. And then I start calculating and, oh my God, this was beautiful. But then we need to invite Starobinsky because there are lots of things which we cannot do. Okay, so I start generating this exponentially growing amplitude of quantum fluctuations produced during oscillation, their parametric resonance, learning many new things. The left picture shows you narrow resonance, which was kind of textbook, the Mathieu equation. And then when we understood that the most powerful thing is, is broad resonance, where no description of it in mathematical textbooks uh, I was able to find. So we just generated whatever happens and try to understand. And they send the results to Starobinsky proudly. Look at this, left one is natural, uh, narrow resonance, grows exponentially, this one, completely different behavior. And my friend sent me a message. Andre, it is, it's time for you to be more civilized and use occupation numbers, which are adiabatic invariant. Oh, okay. So I look at it and I put occupation numbers. See what happened. The left picture, which was this oscillating mess, shows you that the occupation number, which is essentially the number of particles go at any given wavelength, grows exponentially during this, this straight line, is logarithm. So it is exponential growth. Okay, so just change one thing. And then another one, which is broad resonance, and you see that nothing happens, nothing happens, and then boom, you have lots of particles uh, immediately. Then again, nothing happens. Occupation number constant. Then boom again, because this was a, a boost of non-adiabaticity at some moment. So this clarified physical content of our results immensely, just by switching, but being <laughs> civilized. Okay. Then this stochastic approach, which was discussed, uh, uh, well, at the previous uh, speaker, for me. Uh, when we studied uh, uh, inflation and new inflation, whatever, I was really puzzled by, uh, uh, well, different possibility of uh, studying it. Like you have Euclidean approach to inflationary cosmology, which Hawking was pushing forward all the time. And in Euclidean approach, you do approximately the same as what you uh, do in uh, 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 thermodynamics at uh, a large temperature, in thermodynamics, you can replace uh, the stochastic methods by studying Euclidean uh, time direction with periodicity one divided by temperature. In de Sitter space, Euclidean de Sitter space is sphere with all directions compact. And therefore, in this integral, which was written here for temperature, it, all integrals must be replaced by sums. And as a result, there was one term in the sum where no summation, this n is equal to zero. And it was hugely singular, uh, uh, infrared singular. So this is the result of that. This is bunch Davis vacuum where phi squared is equal to h to the fourth divided by m squared. Okay. So this division by m squared, what is m is small. During inflation, m is supposed to be much, much smaller than Hubble. And in principle, that can be close to zero. Then if you calculate quantum corrections with this phi squared, this will be cactus diagrams with each term of the diagram is inversely, is infrared divergent in, in, enormously. To compare it with something which we know from other fields of physics, the theory of phase transition at the moment of the phase transition is the time where the infrared problem is manifest because there are some uh, possibly logarithmic uh, divergence, etc. Wilson got Nobel Prize for describing how, to, uh, for suggesting how to deal with this infrared problem at one single point, critical point. He, the Sitter space is like all the time you are at this critical point. So essentially what is the meaning of uh, Alexei did is that when everything is bad, then try to use this badness because what 
this infrared diversion says that your occupation numbers during inflation becomes exponentially large. If it's exponentially large, then it's effectively almost like a classical field. And then you have classical field jumping under the noise of uh, well quantum fluctuations. And the uh, long wave fluctuations, like cl classical field, short wave fluctuations create this noise. So this Langevin equation, so this is his equations. It was published kind of in the way practically unavailable, practically uh, unaccessible. You try to understand what is written there. It's very, very difficult, but it is obviously extremely important. And I asked my student late uh, at that time, let us study it, let's do it carefully. So we translated his language into our language, and it was an appendix in our paper. But because just like many of Starobinsky paper, it was written and published in Russian journal, nobody has seen it. I've never seen anybody uh, referring to this paper at all. But what we did in this paper, not only we re-derived the stochastic approach, but we also uh, used it for studying eternal inflation. So when we had, uh, when uh, uh, I suggested eternal chaotic inflation in 86, one of the ways and uh, the most uh, powerful way to really prove that what we are doing is not nonsense is to study it using stochastic approach. So I underlined this line here, diffusion equation for fluctuating field. So it is not just you do it in the near de Sitter space, but you do it in Chaotic inflation, where Hubble constant can differ from one part of the universe to another by many orders of magnitude. And then together with Mukhanov, we studied the same, taking into account also Mukhanov's variables and back reaction to the metric of the universe. And again, here's underlined line, which we have obtained within stochastic approach to inflation. So we understood pretty early how powerful this method is, and we start using it uh, well, over the place. And then later, uh, in uh, 83, uh, uh, we, I, I managed to get Artur Mezlumian, who was a student of Starobinsky and mine also, uh, Stanford, and we continued it. And we uh, well, uh, invented a stationary universe uh, scenario where the field jumps up and down and there's some stationary distribution. And then we studied it further with Juan Garcia Belida and many other people. And this was beginning of what later was uh, called multiverse. So this is just the possibility that because of these fluctuations, which can be described by stochastic of, uh, approach of inflation, our universe becomes divided into different pieces with different properties. Like in this paper with Juan Garcia Belida, it was divided into parts with different values of the gravitational constants. So it is. it just depends on the physical content of the theory. But each time to describe it, you need uh, you needed Starobinsky method. Now let's go to the most famous paper of Starobinsky. And you see, uh, it, it is uh, his paper of uh, 1980, where he essentially invented what some people say uh, uh, first uh, model of inflationary theory. Here is a kind of gray because people who invented inflationary theory, they uh, had a different purpose, not to solve the singularity problem, but they get a lot of different other problems solved. So, uh, so uh, what happened with this model? No, uh, nevertheless, we know now that it provides just like a best fit to observable uh, experimental data. And it is, it has like 6,700 citations in Q-spires. So suddenly he became famous. Suddenly, look at this list of citations. This is such a powerful tool. You go to Inspire and you try to understand when finally Starobinsky became known. Because when I was talking here in US, I was talking about Starobinsky. Yeah, we have heard about him. No, I did not read it, uh, it well. So you see this gray is Starobinsky before the year 2013, which was Planck. And Planck found, and before that already there were some gross citations, because uh, WMAP also found that some of the best uh, fits to uh, uh, experimental results, uh, uh, which they obtained, they are given by Starobinsky model. So here is the Starobinsky model with this 
he, he did not write it at that time, like R plus R squared. He have written it like corrections to energy momentum tensor, and that is something copied from his first paper. Why I am copied here? Because, you know, he is not around. We need to study his, uh, uh, well, what, what he left for us carefully, because if you screw up, then because of the absence of interest to his work originally, there was lots of misconceptions. What actually did he do? And recently there was a paper climbing from string theory community. Oh, Starobinsky model is in swampland. Why it is in swampland? Oh, because we cannot get these quantum fluctuations required for Starobinsky model because it is all based on vacuum polarization and quantum fluctuations. And in string theory, there are some, well, it's, oh my God. I sent them not a very kind message about that. And they changed the uh, paper a little, but this offending title is still around. And I tried to tell them, do you really read this paper? Do you know that the uh, paper of Starobinsky R plus R squared, which you discussed, was actually formulated by Starobinsky in its present form in 85? Actually, it was in our paper with Kaufman and Starobinsky, but he did it, okay? He uh, reformulated it. And at this paper, we explained, he explained, that it does not work to use this uh, quantum fluctuations, that one uses a different method, okay? You just add it by hand. So I will just explain it right now. But most importantly, for all of these applications and for uh, the moment which made his model suddenly famous and known to everyone, was of course based on the paper of Mukhanov and Chibisov of 81, where this amplitude of perturbations with almost flat but not quite flat spectrum as confirmed by Planck satellite was really obtained. I hope that uh, Alyosha will tell us. Oh, <laughs> Alyosha will not tell us. Slava Mukhanov will tell us about it. So now there was a, another problem. Uh, oh, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, my, my slides messed up. Uh, I will return to this. Okay. So one one of the problems of uh, Starobinsky model that it was not singular, but it was also unstable. So how you start with non-singular problem, uh, with non-singular model, if he cannot exist for a second, because the vacuum is, well, decayed in like 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So how you start it, it cannot be a solution of the singularity problem. Here was a paper by uh, Zildovich, 81. Nobody knows about this paper. It is not in, uh, in Inspire. I could find it only because I really I prepared to this talk, okay? Because I knew that it exists. So I kind of discovered, uh, uncovered it again. This was the first paper where uh, Zildovich was talking about creation of the universe effectively from nothing. He did not use Euclidean approach and tunneling to that. He used some... Uh, arguments that the if uh, well density of the universe is very large then the action of whatever creation must be very small therefore creation is not forbidden in the first paper describing tunneling uh, by Williamkin, he actually made an error sign an error and his conclu conclusion was that the huge uh, universe must be uh, created uh, late in 84, uh, I corrected it, Alyosha Stravinsky corrected it, Rubakov corrected it, and Vilenkin corrected it himself. So everything qualitatively, uh, qualitatively correct result was in the paper by Zeldovich. You may look at it. It is very, very hard to understand what exactly he says there, but his intuition was exactly like our intuition later. And then there was a paper by Zeldovich by Stravinsky. And it was another crush. He, they uh, were talking, why do you need to create a sphere? You create a bagel. Actually, it is a box with identified sides. It's a torus. And for torus, it can be a flat universe. And a flat universe, you do not need to tunnel. You just do it. Except for at some moment, they decided that they need to have some suppression. And they started adding some 
well, additional Casimir terms, and, and then the beautiful result was dissolved in some exponential suppression, and some people start developing some crazy versions of supergravity theory, which would lead to this suppression. I don't know why people want to be suppressed. So, but uh, this was a great idea that you need to do it in flat universe or open and uh, topologically non-trivial. And the first uh, paper on that was quantum cosmology in open universes and cool and Martin. And I did not know about this. And I kind of, when we studied everything in string theory and we realized that in string theory, inflation may not be able to start at the Planck density. I thought, what can it be? Oh, let me look again at Stravinsky paper and let's just study it accurately. And what the result was that you may start inflation of the universe without any exponential suppression at sub planck density. This was following the ideas of the Starobinsky and Zirdovich paper. And then we, uh, uh, this, uh, I'm returning back to his model R plus R squared. This was our paper with Kochman and Starobinsky. And I will just give you well, some pointers to what was said there. He said, because this was the idea of comparison, what happened with the uh, theory of scalar field and what happens, what, as you will see, will happen now in the theory R plus whatever. He said that in uh, 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 scalar field theory, we started with new inflation, where inflation started at the top of the hill. And now we realize that it does not work and there was a chaotic inflation where inflation can start in a completely different regime all the way to Planck and density. And he said, let's do it the same metamorphosis. This is the world which he liked. There are metamorphosis in the original set of scale theories and the same metamorphosis which happened in his own model. Metamorphosis because the predictions remain practically the same Meanwhile, the meaning changed. He realized that it's difficult to do it with quantum fluctuations. And nevertheless, if you just add this R squared term by hand or any other term F as a function of R, so this was 85, then you have what you need. And then there was a little bit of screw up because everybody will continue doing this using the same terminology. Therefore, the inflation is based on the type of with R square term. We shall continue to call this term vacuum polarization for brevity. So he changed his attitude, but he just wanted, oh, okay, but uh, let's others uh, to just, they used to my old terminology, let's continue using it. So when people look at this R squared and associate right now, after he denounced his own approach, and change it, uh, they, they think that it is about, well, quantum correction. This is not the case. When we uh, did this work, we obtained the results uh, describing everything together, scale field plus R squared. And I was kind of confused by results. I could not understand. I understand that what well, here is the results. I do not understand the interpretation. It took some time. So this uh, 85, and the model is written uh, now in this elegant way, essentially, even though it was kind of inexplicit still, even in this uh, paper. But then other people came. In 84, we have rewritten this model without knowing that this is a Starobinsky model. He has changed it and got rid of this uh, 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 R-square term. Why what is important and why what was it confusing when we continued studying R squared plus scalar theory together without removing it. Because our idea was that R cannot go greater than Planckian. But look at this R plus R squared. When R, nearly constant because it's inflation, becomes very large, then essentially the coefficient in front of R, which is, well, uh, Planckian mass, it includes a contribution from R itself. So this gets anti-intuitive, your effective gravitational coupling constant changes. And we uh, rewritten it in different metric in terms of different R, which is shown here like tilde R, R tilde, whatever. And he did not finish the job. He 
did it and left this uh, uh, scale field which he introduced here around phi uh, he uh, left it uh, canonically non normalized and later in 84 uh, in 88 this job was finished by a group of people and now we have this uh, Starobinsky model in the familiar term and we call it Starobinsky model the history was so complicated and it was expanding not contracting, not uh, well, having party line of doing everything from quantum corrections. Just do whatever works. And then, important thing, if you uh, add scalar field to the Starobinsky model, it is important to which of the Starobinsky model you add it. If you add it to R plus R squared, or if you add it to this modified version, you have two different models different because in the first one when you go down to the lower level you change your metric and therefore you change interaction of scale field with everything that is why when we studied scale field with r plus r squared i could not understand the result because this is what happens if we do it then this theory does not coincide with just adding uh uh, this exponential uh, bracket, whatever, adding to it uh, chaotic inflation. How you can now, now that we know it, how can I solve the problem of initial conditions for Starobinsky model? Well, very easy. I take my chaotic inflation, field sigma will play the role of m squared, phi squared potential, and I add it to Starobinsky model. This is what was written on the previous page. I took Starobinsky model and I just added it chaotic inflation. So inflation starts with chaotic inflation, but then the field sigma falls down, and it starts at Planckian energy. And then the field sigma falls down to zero, and then you start inflating uh, following the Starobinsky model. So you can get uh, peri peri experimental data perfectly right because of the friendship between Starobinsky model and chaotic inflation. Then everything works perfectly, okay? Uh, this is how it looked at WMAP. See WMAP data all over the map. Planck data, much more precise. And Starobinsky model here, just at the center. And then we wanted to understand, this happened in 2013, when finally everybody forgot about this danger of non-Gaussianity and started doing more normal kind of physics. Sorry for, well, it's being explicit in my point of view. And then we wanted to understand what happens. What happens? Why here at the top of this, uh, at the down of this graph, you have two models, Starobinsky model and uh, 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 Higgs inflation giving the same results. And Starobinsky model, uh, well, right now it's like 40 years ago. He it did not change and it is still there in, uh, in uh, bicep data. How it is survived while well, many others died. And we try to uh, change it. So I will briefly show you what, what we uh, what, what we did at the time. Yes, yeah, sorry, I guess all of us go overboard. But unfortunately, the subject is going overboard, so to say. Uh, so this is what we started doing. We're trying to understand what is going on. And uh, Renata and I, we at that time studied super conformal approach to cosmology, supergravity, etc. And there was a simple toy models. You had a bad field with a wrong kinetic term. You had interaction of the bad field with uh, uh, curvature. And you have uh, this term uh, chi to the force. But this theory have conformal invariance. And you can remove this field just making a gauge transformation. And we get a theory of cosmological constant, just like this. You add the second field. Ciao, scusa. Excuse me? Ciao. I, I, I do not hear. Okay, oh, well, then I add, uh, we consider the theory of two fields, and we did the same trick, and we get a cosmological constant plus a scalar field. And then we decided, okay, let, let's check something. And, and we uh, uh, modified it a little, mod, multiplied by some uh, arbitrary function of phi divided by uh, chi. It is still conformally invariant theory. But the potential in this 
theory becomes a function of tangent. So asymptotically, it's cosmological constant, but in the vicinity of zero, it behaves like uh, quadratic. Uh, and for for all of these models, you have experiment uh, predictions satisfying experimental data. Then we generalize it further, and we just change it one thing, which is kinetic term here. And then uh, again, theory becomes a, fun a function of tangent or a slightly different version of it, and it becomes essentially a Starobinsky model with arbitrarily coefficient alpha in the uh, exponent. And the predictions were like in Starobinsky model, except for you have a possibility right now to change R. And this is simplest T model and simplest E model of this class. And E model, simplest one, alpha equal one, it is exactly Starobinsky model. And then this was in Planck 2018, this picture first appeared in the result and this yellow line uh, showing from the up down, it is our alpha attractors. At the bottom is Starobinsky and Higgs. And what happened many years later, this is now bicep and keck. And they removed natural inflation, they removed many others and which models they still remain on the graph, not so many. And this uh, yellow line are T inflation, uh, 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 red lines are E models. And at the bottom, still you have Starobinsky model and conformal inflation. So you see what happens when you try not to disprove something, but to develop on something. I have felt this affinity of what he did all the time we were looking how to do better and use what this giant did, even though we did not communicate that much, it communicated very, very rarely. All the time I was kind of talking to him. So this is the end of my talk. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Andre, thank you very much for your very impressive talk, very interesting talk. Okay, maybe, I think maybe uh, we go now to the next talk and not to ask you question, maybe in, uh, in the con after con uh, during the concluding section, maybe people can ask you something. Okay, the next speaker is Slava Mukhanov. Slava, are you here? I'm mute. Okay, I am here. Andre, could you please close your presentation? Yeah, I'm trying to. Yes, yes, please. Uh huh. Okay, and okay. And uh, I have to share my screen, yeah? Yes, please do this. Uh huh. Ah, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is this your first page? Uh, no, it's not first. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. I want to get full screen, right? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay, good. Oh, very good. Okay. So let me just announce your title. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Slava Mukhanov will tell us about resolving singularities in general relativity. Yeah, because let me go back, okay, in time historically. And you know that there was proven theorem about geodesic incompleteness uh, of black hole and also of the universe. I mean... Uh, uh, which would uh, by Hawking and also by Penrose, but one should not forget that all these theorems were proven under many conditions, which, as you will see, can be violated. In fact, actually, people violate it right now, even the first condition, considering anti deceiver energy density for anti deceiver is negative. Second condition, also, in principle, people found the way how to violate, but the third condition under which uh, the theorem of uh, Hawking and Penrose are valid 
is violated by the sitter, which, as it follows from the observation, exists at least today, and it was existing also in past. Today, why this kind of quasi desitter exists, we have no idea, but why it was needed in past, because we wanted finally to understand how our universe originated. You see, and uh, people in 80s were paying a lot of attention to resolving singularity problems. In particular, one of the pioneers there was Starobinsky because he tried at the beginning to resolve this problem using the Sitter space in the theory of m squared phi squared. But then, after paper was published, I think in astronomical journal, astronomical journal, and rejected from JET. It's not surprising because JET was rejecting practically everything. Yeah, so jet platters. But then uh, Starobinsky actually started to consider this asked gravity with conformal anomaly. And what he wanted to do there, he wanted to have non-singular beginning for our universe, okay? Uh, at the beginning, putting the universe in the saddle point, which was due to the conformal anomaly. Then, okay, the beginning was uh, the theta, as he said, beginning was infinitely long the theta. Uh, then, of course, in this case, you were starting with the state, which is uh, non-singular, and was continuing it for infinitely long time. Then condition energy density plus repression was uh, uh, smaller than zero was satisfied. So the initial singularity, as Lerche said, that actually was resolved in principle. So his argument for inventing this model was solution of the singularity problem. But after that, when we have considered quantum fluctuations, we showed that the duration of this stage cannot be infinite, because when we calculated the spectrum of perturbation, we found that it's infrared divergent, okay, if you stay in the same point, that of course it was interpreted after that as uh, finite duration of this stage. Then when you go away from this point, then the term like R squared divided by M squared, which Andre just showed, starts to dominate and you are getting what is called R squared inflation, where you are getting the spectrum of perturbation, okay, forgetting about conformal anomaly, which correspond to the observational results. But nevertheless, in spite of the fact, that the model didn't solve the problem of singularity, it was solving the problem of initial condition. But at this point, of course, it was looking like non-natural initial condition. This was the reason why Zeldovich invented uh, creation of the universe from nothing. And uh, those people who were around at this time Okay, perhaps you remember that Zeldovich wrote a lot of papers about complete uh, cosmological model where he used this idea by Fomin and Tremain, not Tremain, Fomin and Trion, yeah, that creation of the closed universe cost no energy. Then when you created closed universe out of quantum fluctuations, you have to put just this closed universe in the right equation of state, or it's like conformal anomaly, and after that, there will be natural evolution of the whole thing. But nevertheless, the problem of singularity was not resolved in spite of the fact that, okay, perturbations for the production of the galaxies were produced. Then, after that, uh, I went to work with Markov, and Markov also was trying all the time to solve a singularity problem. If you remember, Markov introduced this kind of notion of the limiting energy density. 
And then he took the first Friedman equation and then, uh, okay, have you written it like this one? Of course, in this case, you have a smooth balance, but nevertheless, it was not clear from where this equation is coming. After that, okay, we did a lot of things. Also, uh, we have considered with Markov in hydrodynamical term, asymptotically free gravity, where, by the way, also we showed that uh, asymptotic freedom effectively leads to the appearance of the cosmological constant in hydrodynamical terms. I didn't pay attention too much to this model. I thought it is too artificial. But nevertheless, actually, I returned together with Robert Brandenberger in 92 when I was visiting Brown University to the same problem of solving cosmological singularity. But uh, you understand that in this case, when you would bound all curvatures, it's not quite clear, can you bound also the derivative of the curvature, which also means singularity. At this time, I think everybody already have forgotten about singularity problem, but then we found some kind of solution which was working only in the case of isotropic universe, where we claim that this invariant for aminu, aminu minus a squared, some complicated function of it. Here it's rewritten in terms of some auxiliary Lagrange multiplier, could give us or could force universe, irrespectively by what kind of equation, irrespectively of what kind of matter it's filled, to go through the de Sitter stage. But then by the way, it was actually a very interesting story because we have sent paper with Robert to his ref letters and was published immediately without any questions. I was a little bit surprised, but okay, the only explanation which I found that nobody cared at this time about singularity. If nobody cares, then there is no problem to publish the paper even in his ref letters. If there is somebody, okay, then they produce a lot of credit. So, and then in the isotropic universe, I saw that actually the things are okay. For two-dimensional black hole, where there is no real gravity was also okay, but then there was the question, what about Kasner universe and four-dimensional black hole? Because these kind of invariants do not help at all, especially taking into account that both in both the Kasner universe and in two-dimensional, in four-dimensional black hole, A I mean, mu and A are equal zero. Then in the 90s also, there appeared again the interest to the problem of solving singularity problem. For instance, string series wrote some papers where they will consider how string can go through the conical singularity, Etc. So what can you say about scattering matrix? But then the field was left by them very fast. Then there was also loop quantum gravity, on which I do not want to make any comments because all comments which I will make will not sound politically correct. Yeah. Then after that, nevertheless, okay, many years later, I return to the same problem when we introduced what is called mimetic uh, dark matter. Okay, there is written here non-commutative geometry. Uh, in principle, you can get this kind of field there if you claim the quantization of the hypersurfaces of constant time, but forget about this justification because everything what we need, we need to modify Lagrangian here in some kind of way when the field phi satisfies this first constraint equation, as by the way was noticed for the first time because we invented this thing uh, trying to keep some kind of conformal invariance for auxiliary metric, but then actually Galavnev simplified the whole model just introducing it via constraint. 
So this field phi is not really a scalar field. It has only half degree of freedom because it satisfied uh, first order differential equation. But combined together with longitudinal mode of the gravity, which is also half degree of freedom, it gives one degree of freedom, which is dark matter. But the most interesting thing is not this thing, but the use of this field Okay, to build, to modify the theory of gravity in the simplest possible way to resolve the singularity problem. In particular, I could consider arbitrary function of the D'Alembertian of this field phi. It doesn't lead to higher derivative because the field phi is constrained. And if I go to synchronous coordinate system, the in synchronous coordinate system, this equation has the simplest possible solution. Phi is just numerate the hypersurfaces of constant time in this synchronous coordinate system. And uh, this D'Alembertian is reduced in synchronous coordinate system to the first derivative of the special metric. So it's some kind of invariant, which depends on the first derivative of the metric in particular synchronous coordinate system. Normally, if you build any invariant, you have to involve second derivative of metric. Yeah? So and this allowed us to simplify life quite at all. For instance, what can you take as a function f in this action? Let's try at the beginning some kind of born infant action. Okay, here I wrote particular function, but this second and third term is just to simplify equations. The leading term here is one plus minus square root of this two third of the box divided by some kind of limiting curvature or limiting energy density. The Einstein equation for the determinant of the special metric is simplified to the form 0, 0 Einstein equation give you precisely the form of the equation which Markov wrote right from the very beginning, okay, without any argument. But you could consider even uh, anisotropic universe which corresponds to uh, uh, this constant of integration in the extrinsic curvature with two indices and can combine this term which was given as singularity, which is much stronger than the other singularities, also in the energy densities. Nevertheless, after that, after you combine mimetic matter, normal matter plus anisotropic curvature, then for the determinant of the metric, you are getting this equation, which for sure has bound solution. And in particular, we can consider Friedman universe with arbitrary equation of state, and then we are getting here non-singular solution with a clear bounds, and this bounds, sorry, happens during very, very short time. You see, which is determined by the limiting energy density, which can be taken below the, the Planckian energy density. Therefore, we are in safe regime in this sense. Then the bounce happens here very, very fast. And why it happens? Because we violate in this model in terms of the uh, hydrodynamical equation of state this energy dominance condition which was also used for the proof of singularity theory like epsilon plus p larger than zero here during the bounce uh, pressure becomes huge and negative now this actually the things how it works for an arbitrary model of isotropic universe. But what happens with anisotropic singularity? So let's consider Kasner universe. In this case, it has no matter. Okay, the metric is like this one, where coefficient is exponent 
satisfies this two equations. Then you know that in Kastner universe, Riemann invariant is diverging, strongly diverging. You see, and gamma metric, I mean, determinant of the special metric also is decreasing very fast. But if I will solve again equation, this master equation for the determinant of the metric, I will find the solution for the determinant of the metric is non-singular. And what we have, instead of Kastner-like singularity, we can write here exact solution, of course, we have the following picture. You have Kastner universe with one kind of exponent, then it has bounds, and it goes to the other anisotropic universe with the other kind of the exponent. You see, for the Kastner universe. For instance, if you start with Kastner universe, with this exponent like minus one third, two third, two third, which by the way corresponds to the uh, metric in the vicinity of singularity of the black hole, that after going through this limiting curvature, it turns to the Kastner with this exponent, which corresponds to the Minkowski space. Therefore, for two cases, the thing is solved, but the question, what will happen inside black hole? Because inside black hole, uh, also, uh, we can have some kind of approximation, and uh, the situation is very similar to Kastner universe. For instance, if you are already within horizon, it are smaller than IG, then the space there remains in near horizon region, the space which is equivalent to the Minkowski space, written just in expanding coordinate, which is similar to Kastner with P equal 1, 0, 0. Then, when the hole is very large, and then you start to approach singularity, so radial coordinate becomes much smaller than gravitational radius, then the metric starts to look like Kastner universe up to topology with exponent like minus one third, two third, two third. And it's clear that in this case, again, you avoid singularity, and when you pass this singularity, then after that, you will find yourself within the inner horizon metric of the other black hole, but with the size smaller than the initial size of the black hole. So it reminds you the picture of this Russian matryoshka whatsoever. So then in this, inside this black hole, you evolve again. And then you get again to the singularity. And passing the singularity, you go again to the near horizon region inside this smaller black hole, which correspond effectively to Minkowski, and then after that you have again contraction. So we are getting the picture, like after crossing horizon, you avoid singularities and find yourself within black hole of smaller radius, then within black hole of even smaller radius, etc., and it resolves at the first glass singularity. But what we could not do, we could not find out what will happen when the size of the black hole within this matryoshka, the smallest matryoshka, starts to be equal to the critical energy density. I mean, because all the approximation methods were not working there, we actually worked very hard, but then we found that it looks like we will not be able to avoid singularity and get this nice picture. And I think after that, some people were doing numerical calculations. They also found that finally singularity will appear. Therefore, okay, uh, we decided that we will try also the other idea. Besides of limiting curvature, 
we will involve uh, the things which uh, is called um, uh, let me change the slide uh, not the slide but file okay uh, uh, we will consider also implement in addition to the limiting curvature idea of asymptotic freedom of gravity in a sense that gravitational constant would vanish when you start to approach um, when you start to approach uh, uh, when you start to approach um, limiting curvature. And you know that the things has worked. So these are more or less the same formula, therefore I do not need to repeat them. But what we did, okay, besides of introducing this kind of uh, things like born infield, we found that we don't need it even for that, we introduced some function of this extrinsic curvature in synchronous coordinate system in front of the Einstein term. So you see that gravitational constants start to be dependent here on this extrinsic curvature. And after that, what we found, we found that even with this idea of having asymptotic uh, freedom for the gravity when gravitational constant is vanishing at some limiting curvature, all the problems are resolved. For instance, if you will take for the inverse gravitational constant, for the inverse gravitational constant, this kind of impression, expression with k0, which is free parameter and which corresponds to the limiting curvature, then again, Friedman equations are modified, but modified like this one. And then the singularity uh, in the isotropic universe is resolved. In isotropic universe. Then during contraction, in this case, you start to approach the sitter stage, which is determined by limiting curvature. This Kasner universe happens the same very attractive thing because Kasner universe, instead of going to singularity, again goes to the sitter contracting phase, okay, in flat coordinate when you start to approach this limiting curvature. Slavas, uh, the slides are not changing. It's, it's the same as it was. It's just what, stuck. What do you mean? I see that slides are changing here. Yes, but not in our case. They're so not changing. Should I should I share once more? Let me try to share maybe it. He want to, uh, maybe he want to come back. No, I don't want to come back. Okay, so this thing I will close. It's good that okay, so let me share the screen. Yeah, so uh okay. Yeah, okay, here. Now it's okay? Yeah, we can see now. Now you can see. It's good that but, you told me, but... but okay. uh, try to change the slide. Go to no. the next page. Just yes, to... now it's changing? Yes. yes. Very good. So, Dio, I said already I am not going to repeat the same thing, especially because this slide can side with what I was showing you. But okay. as I told you now, okay, we decided the other idea because the things with born infant Lagrangian didn't work for resolving the problem of singularity inside Schwarzschild black hole. So what we decided to do, we decided just to take the coefficient in front of the Einstein action to be dependent on the extrinsic curvature. And then... Okay, gravitational constant, as you see, is inversely proportional to this function f. 
And we want now to implement the idea that when you are approaching the limiting curvature, gravitational constant is vanished. Then, in this case, for instance, as an example, I could take gravitational constant, which is vanishing like one minus extrinsic curvature divided by limiting curvature. Then, in Friedman universe equations, again, are modified by this term, and you have non-singular solution, but instead of bouncing, my universe during contraction goes to the de-sitter universe with limiting curvature. You see? So, singularity is resolved. I am getting, for any contracting universe, with any matter there, the sitter universe, finally, okay, which is non-single. And this the sitter universe exists at limiting curvature. This Kastner universe also the situation changes because now instead of going after bounce from one Kastner to the other, okay, I make from an isotropic universe isotropic universe which again goes to this contracting the sitter stage when I am approaching the limiting curvature. Moreover, this kind of model has the other nice feature, because if you will consider quantum fluctuation of the metric, which are proportional to square root of the gravitational constant, because gravitational constant is vanishing, then quantum fluctuations also vanish when you start to approach this limiting curvature. And then the whole thing becomes classical, and then you do not need also to take this limiting curvature to be Planckian curvature. It's a free parameter of the theory. So maybe solution of singularity problem can be entirely done within the classical theory without involving so-called non-perturbative quantum gravity. It's the other approach actually to the singularity problem because most of the people claim that they need non-perturbative quantum gravity if they want to resolve singularity. But you could look at the problem from the different side. If there is limiting curvature, then it looks like uh, quantum fluctuation in approaching this limiting curvature stop to play any role. Now, what will happen with black hole? Let me skip all the details, okay? Because I can use here so-called Lemaitre coordinates, which, by the way, I found for the black hole used widely only in Landau Lipschitz, which uh, can be used for both the Sitter universe and black hole universe. You see? Here, there is some kind of kastner like solution. For the sitter, you have this solution. What is in between, I don't care, but we found exact solution. Okay, in fact, actually, a very good student, Tobias Roots, found it. Uh, when we can get in this theory exact solution for the a uh, black hole metric, not singular black hole. All these ugly things you can forget, the leading thing is actually this term, which shows us how fast gravitational constant is changing. And then, okay, if we will use this function, then there are exact solution for these functions A and B, which are changing bringing us from black hole metric to so-called de-sitter metric. For instance, for x going to plus infinity, we have black hole, and when x goes to minus infinity, we obtain the static de-sitter. And what we are getting? We are getting a black hole without singularity. Instead of singularity, black hole happens to be filled by de-sitter space. And in this case, also, the black hole exists only above, if its mass above some minimal mass determined by the limiting curvature. 
this a minimum. For Planck, limiting curvature, it would be Planckian mass. Here, a conformal diagram on which I don't want to pay attention, but uh, you could ask the question, what happens with near horizon metric yeah, in this particular solution? And then you will find that near horizon metric, when mass is close to the minimal mass, reminds you the metric in the vicinity of extremal black hole, which has no Hawking radiation. And in fact, as we check, Hawking radiation disappears also because in this particular case, if you start with large black hole, then uh, at the beginning, temperature behaves like it should behave according to the Hawking, but then when mass is 30% larger than the minimal possible mass for the black hole, okay, temperature reaches maximum possible value and then starts to vanish. And finally, for the minimal black hole, it vanishes and black hole stop to evaporate. Therefore, what kind of picture we have? You can have black hole, then the black hole starts to evaporate, reach the minimal radius, then stops to emit any radiation, and this black hole is black hole with internal part, which is like the sitter. So it's a pieces of the sitter which are stable and which can fly around us and be, for instance, the candidate for that matter. Okay, so at this point, I finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Slava, for your very impressive talk. Uh, maybe just to uh, one question, if somebody has, if somebody has, just to, before to switch to the next talk. Oh. Well, I, I guess there is no urgent, uh, urgent question. Very, very good. Okay. Uh, very good, because usually uh, we have no time for questions, but we are now come to the next, uh, to the last talk. So I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, Slava, can you comment about what uh, Penrose, during his Nobel lectures, he was saying that there is always singularity, as you explained. No, but okay, <laughs> he was saying that there is always singularity and uh, certain condition, namely this energy condition, epsilon should be larger than zero, epsilon plus p should be larger than zero, and epsilon plus 3p, strong energy dominance condition, should be satisfied. So yeah. all things are good. What is are, co your comment about uh, Lifshitz Halatnikov uh, statement? No, Lifshitz Halatnikov statement is about so called cast, uh, about this billiard unit. What? Belinsky Lifshitz Halatnikov. Okay. Maybe... Hello. It's a different story, but. Different here... story, okay. Maybe... Yeah, it's a different story, but clearly the Penrose Hawking theorem, as they are formulated, it looks like they have nothing to do with real life. Because we know that one of these conditions which was used, namely P plus epsilon plus 3P larger than zero, is violated by existing dark energy. Therefore, okay, theorems are theorems, and physics is physics. Any theorem which you prove have loophole, okay, when you try to apply it for something. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Slava. Let's go to the, our last talk. It is a talk by our uh, part of our organizer. So this is a talk by Alexei Koshilev and Sravan Kumar. And who will speak? Uh, actually, we both will speak. I will start. And Sravan okay, will you, you will start. So uh, now we have a uh, part of a talk, of a common talk by, is it a common talk as I understand? Or um, you will tell us yes. about two different... We'll continue on each other, yes, you'll see. Yeah. Okay, but in any <laughs> case now, the yeah. Alexei uh, Koshilev will, uh, will speak. Please, okay. share screen, you know, with how to do as yeah. better as I. 
Well, I hope, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, in fact, uh, we put uh, me and Straun ourselves to speak uh, last, uh, because indeed we are uh, co-organizers of this seminar, so it's logic that we are speaking last. And on top of this, we both were collaborating with Alexei Starobinsky quite intensively for last actually few years, uh, more actually around five years, oh no, around six Ten, years. Seven so. years. Oh, yeah. even seven. Yeah. And this particular collaboration with Alexei Starobinsky in short, can be named as non-local inflation. And just, just question, you see my mouse pointer here? Okay, uh, so uh, uh, in short, uh, this collaboration can be named non-local inflation. And motivation for this is, of course, obvious, uh, because uh, Starobinsky inflation originally formulated like inflation generated by R squared term, and even though it can be rewritten like some scalar uh, tensor model, uh, uh, originally it was like R squared uh, generated inflation. And uh, we know that particular uh, R squared uh, Lagrangian is not renormalizable. So uh, this is why we came to idea that uh, it's um, must require some generalization. And this is how, uh, <clears throat> uh, and now I want to say a little bit how collaboration with Alexei Starobinsky emerged from this perspective. But before I will come exactly to collaboration itself, let me just say, and I just say in, in advance, it will be a talk mostly about our experience working with Alexei Starobinsky, which to me was extremely valuable and <clears throat> extremely important because I believe I gained a lot. And what I understood when I not simply meet Alexis Trabinsky during some conference, but when I started to communicate with him and exchange ideas and exchange emails and collaborate on paper about some projects, I understood that this is extremely sharp and quick person who thinks extremely <clears throat> clear and who throws ideas ideas with some incredible speed. And his ideas uh, were far beyond uh, what uh, I could think during the same time, let's say. And he was always giving comments which are exactly right to the point. And uh, his, uh, all his comments and all his contributions to our papers, uh, which were written together, they were <coughs> some sense uh, masterpiece parts of these particular publications. And what I was really impressed, he was a very curious person. He was really, uh, he really liked to jump on new ideas because what we suggested him to co collaborate on was infinite derivative generalization of gravity. Many people tell me that uh, this, uh, Nobody should do just because it's very complicated. But he was saying, no, why? We should do it because it can provide some ideas. <clears throat> and also he was very courageous and he was trying to <clears throat> find uh, as much as possible in most complicated computations, which we did in our project and in all previous things, uh, <clears throat> all previous uh, achievements he implemented during his career. And uh, personally, when I met him for the first time and started to speak intensively during uh, some meeting in Dubna, I remember that uh, from the very beginning, I understood that there's a person who is always full of life. He's very enthusiastic, very active, and <clears throat> very interested in many, many different ideas. And this is how uh, now how our collaboration started. It started... Uh, uh, around the year 16, I think it was end of year 15, uh, it was, we were thinking about uh, developing uh, Starobinsky inflation in non-local generalization of R-squared model. 
And then somehow one day me and uh, my collaborators, uh, Leonardo and Leslav, we came to quite uh, astonishing idea. Why not to contact Starabinsky? Why not to suggest him uh, to be part of the project? Because at the end of the day, we try to generalize his inflation model. And uh, we have written an email to him. I cannot say that we were absolutely hopeful about his positive reply. We were <clears throat> thinking that it's like 50-50 uh, uh, because he's extremely busy person with a lot of ideas already and it is yet another model on the market. But apparently, surprisingly to us, he replied and uh, his reply was, was great. He was not asking about this model or whatever. He just simply... Uh, replied with email with a couple of precise comments on a draft, what should be implemented, what should be corrected, how does he see this? And uh, I just remind you that wh why we did it, and I will show in the next slide uh, what the complexity of the model. Uh, we did this in an attempt to embed the uh, squared inflation in some uh, potentially uh, UV complete and uh, unitary model. And this is how uh, this uh, first paper uh, came out. It was in April of 2016. And uh, this title, as well as actually other titles, they were suggested uh, by Alexei Kinsky. And here I especially like this word occurrence. But the next paper, when we continued and tried to um, push forward this idea now in a bit different company with Alexis Straminsky and with Ravan Kumar, it was even more interesting. We were writing this second paper for a while. We were doing a lot of computations. We were uh, deriving many different uh, relations for perturbations in infinite derivative case. And we tried to find out some uh, good title for this. And we came with a title like R squared inflation to probe gravity. But then Alexis Starabinsky about this, he said, no, 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 it's too modest. We have to write to probe non-perturbative quantum gravity. <clears throat> and this is how this title appeared. And uh, in this particular paper, it was a lot of development related to this model. And uh, what is apparent, actually, very pity is that uh, uh, we still have a lot of ideas uh, thrown by Alexis Tarabinsky in this direction, which we unfortunately could not finish with his participation because it was so astonishing, so sad, and so abrupt news that he... <clears throat> passed away. It was so <clears throat> unbelievable and so hard to imagine. We hope to finalize and uh, bring to life uh, projects which were originally discussed with uh, Alexis Starabinsky. And uh, I guess uh, Sravan in next, uh, in his uh, turn, will speak about uh, what, uh, how this direction will develop in. I just want to say two things. One of them is that uh, in year 2020, we have written a short and concise uh, essay, which got a honorable mention from the Gravity Research Foundation, which we were very happy about. And this essay in concise and very nice uh, uh, and neat way uh, very much thanks to Alexis Tarabinsky formulates idea how we join infinite derivative gravity, R squared inflation, and how from this perspective we can approach quantum gravity and describe what we observe on CMB. And uh, to give you some taste of what we were working on, it was this model and it is still this model, and well, Sravan will not agree, Sravan will say that we already generalized this model. <clears throat> We're working on this particular model, which combines uh, Einstein gravity 
and also non-local generalization, infinite derivative generalization of R squared gravity. This is uh, the model under investigation. This is a candidate to be uh, renormalizable and unitary theory in Minkowski space-time. And the importance of this action it lies in the fact that uh, this action is the most general one which describes uh, linear fluctuations in Minkowski and the Sitter space-time. Since this is exactly what we need to describe CMB, this is what we <clears throat> were studying, because this is the most general possible action which we can write. And uh, in our papers, we named analytic infinite derivative of gravity, but the great bonus which we got computationally is that original Starobinsky inflation solution nicely and exactly embedded here without any approximation. It means that this model, simply speaking, realizes one and the same background, but because of these extra factors, differs on in at perturbation level. And this is what we were exploring. And I very much hope Sraun will say more. <clears throat> so this is what we were exploring. And this was one of the interesting ideas which Alexis Strabinsky expressed and which we failed to realize uh, uh, together with Professor Strabinsky. We very much hope that we will finish it, even though it's clear that we understand how to do it. But the idea is that we still don't know what would be the Einstein frame for this particular model. It's given that we can bring it to Einstein frame, but this would be very interesting a reformulation can bring some idea, maybe, or maybe some computational simplifications. We don't know exactly. Actually, it's not like we need to bring any model to Einstein frame. I mean, this frame is perfectly fine and we can do everything. It's just a little bit a different point of view, just a different frame. But this was uh, one of the idea and uh, some other uh, things which we were discussing together with uh, Alexis Trabinsky. I believe will be covered by Stravan. So here I will stop and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay, so the next speaker is Ravan. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I expected that you would like to show us inspired yeah. paper <laughs> uh, page. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Irina. So um, I would like to continue what Alexia has started. So our journey, non-local journey, with uh, Starobinsky in exploring uh, Starobinsky's universe, which is basically embedding his famous model of inflation in a UV complete setup. And this is seven years of collaboration of Alexei Koshlev and myself with Professor Starabinsky. And so in nutshell, so as uh, Alexei Koshlev mentioned, we started with a brave, uh, we took a brave step of taking local theory to non-local with a very complicated action indeed. Uh, Starobinsky was very encouraging in the, uh, taking this brave step and studying cosmology uh, with the uh, non-local theories. And uh, what the outcome is, you can see in this plot, the Starobinsky inflation, R-square inflation, uh, which has a precise predictions, pretty much well with the uh, cosmological data, and the generalized model in the non-local setup can give different predictions we studied in detail in the, in the last papers. And what I think uh, Professor Starobinsky is, in my, in my view, of course, uh, everyone, I believe everyone agree with me. He's a remarkable scientist with a theoretical brain and observational eyes. He's always a person who has, uh, who thinks about foundations, uh, of physics and also 
he is interested he is always interested in testing them that's what i learned from starobinsky and uh, i think that's what i will i keep it for the rest of my life so yeah this is a collaboration so this is what what we wrote together the last uh, book chapter uh, of the, of the handbook of quantum gravity edited by kasimo bombi modesto and shapiro so these are the this uh, book chapter lists all our contributions uh, along with uh, lexi starobinsky in the direction of non local inflation and in fact in the uh, recent years we uh, even generalized we even wrote a uh, most general lagrangian that can uh, lead to r square like inflation and uh, give consistent with the data and give new predictions that's something uh, what we have achieved in the last years uh, i just want to give a brief uh, uh, introduction to what what we achieved so as alexi uh, koshlev already mentioned uh, this lagrangian so it is a generalization of stellar gravity which has uh, some interesting uv completion properties uh, in the recent years we have shown that this lagrangian uh, also give observationally give different outcomes compared to what we know in the effective field theory of inflation because in the effective field theory of inflation we truncate terms and we don't care about ghosts but if we want to avoid ghosts at the uh, high energy scales we need to expand the lagrangian to uh, including all the infinite derivative terms and we showed really how such a setup can be distinguishable from the effective field theories of inflation and also we showed a di different point of view of what quantum gravity means and what quantum gravity predictions could mean the collaboration with sarbinsky is very is extremely stimulating so he he is uh, whenever we interact whenever we stuck with the calculation his suggestions are brilliant one of the very, very difficulty studying with this model is as alexi koshle mentioned there is no einstein frame so everything has to be done with jordan frame all the calculations all the perturbations and we did achieve not only uh, linear perturbations we also went to non linear level and computed non gaussianities and there is no reference for uh, computing a non gaussianity in jordan frame r plus r square so the the first paper of maldacena was on computed with the scalar field in the einstein frame so we had a lot of struggle and the insights of starobinsky are amazing so when when we uh, when i approached starobinsky look at this i am not getting exactly the result which is expected the maldacena consistency relation in jordan frame and he made uh, he really got into the calculations and he suggested where the mistake is in, indeed you the, it is the mistake when we were struggling it was due to how to do the field redefinitions and it was due to starobinsky we could achieve and even compute non gaussianities in, in such a complicated lagrangians and it was uh, in 2016 when i uh, started to collaborate with starobinsky it was already towards the end of my phd and that was the time i started reading his seminal paper and uh, the way i learned is all always in the lecture notes with a scalar field as a starobinsky uh, called as starobinsky model and uh, lecture but the jordan frame understanding is not covered by any popular lecture notes unfortunately but when i started reading this it was like every line uh, for to understand every line i need to learn a lot of things and come back to the paper again for example the first paragraph of uh, uh, this paper uh, starts saying about meisner's meisner's initial chaos i didn't know about it before uh, reading this paper so it was absolutely learning this three pages paper took me several months of learning and understanding different aspects of it and of course the as uh, professor linde already explained how the model was started and how it has evolved over the years and this is something i the reference which has uh, uh, had absolute joy in, of reading and learning about really how quantum gravity is uh, how close the quantum gravity uh, concepts are are related to cosmology so this is basically the beautiful um, 
review uh, written by Alexis Starobinsky in 1981. It, it contains everything about uh, cosmology, inflation, particle production. Um, I think I, it's the best reference of uh, for, for me in my point of view to learn about Jordan frame and the inflationary cosmology. And so it was, um, I would like to tell it some memory, uh, tell you some memories I had with him. So the first time I met him in this uh, conference in Germany, at that time I was just first year student and I did not really know uh, who Starobinsky is and I was presenting a poster in front of him and I was, I was working on a model uh, with three form fields motivated by string theory and I was just explaining him ah, the model I am working predicts uh, gives better prediction than Starobinsky model I didn't know it was a funny incident and later I le learned it is the Starobinsky intro of me who was listening to my poster and he was very encouraging and he gave very nice comments and later in 2016 uh, I met him, it was initiation of the collaboration, and uh, it was again a conversation with him, okay, uh, how to do calculations uh, in non-local gravity, it is very complicated, uh, there is no Einstein frame, he asked the, asked the question, okay, why do you go to Einstein frame, do it in Jordan frame, so I, it was, I was just nervous to say, like, okay, I didn't know anything about Jordan frame, but it was a nice conversation with him that he gave a lot of inputs on how to do the calculations. And uh, as Alexei Koshlev has already mentioned, the qualities of Starobinsky, and, uh, and I would like to comment a few things in the direction. So whenever we go with him, the, we, we send him the updated draft with the new calculations. He's very precise and accurate uh, in giving comments. The comments are always valuable. I just want to share couple of emails, I mean, the details are not important, but where the way you see how he responds with going to equation by equation and asking questions really. So it was uh, in 2022, uh, whole night I was exchanging emails with Starovinsky and uh, checking some calculations and he was doing it and uh, he was quickly responding uh, to all the calculations in the paper so it was very impressive so that is something uh, I felt like a, a quality I should never lose that uh, doing capability of doing calculations and I believe I'm yeah close to the end so it's it's always a joy whenever uh, Professor Starobinsky checks the calculations and say okay everything is fine all the uh, um, he agrees with everything and it was absolute job or he say, okay, go and submit the paper in archive. It was, so there's one uh, general comment. So whenever he is a person, he comments about calculations and sometimes if there is a, something he has mistaken, he said, no, 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 I, it, I, it, I was, uh, he corrects himself and, and he also very meticulous and very precise in giving comments. So that is, that is really, really remarkable. And uh, it was, this was one of the last uh, email I have exchanged with Professor Starobinsky. Uh, it was like when I, when I attended a conference and I heard uh, some criticisms on inflation and I, I wrote to him, okay, why, why there was a paper by Simons criticizing uh, that R plus R squared model is uh, incorrect it is a quantum correction it cannot be uh, correct uh, description of the universe so well he was immediately responded and he explained all the uh, details why the paper was uh, uh, was mistaken and uh, in understanding the concept of inflation some of the points actually mentioned by andre linde in the previous talk so one thing he he mentioned exactly that inflation is basically non perturbative generalization of Einstein gravity because you introduce a new degree of freedom and he was explaining that it cannot, it cannot be uh, treated as some uh, motivated from conform, conformal anomaly with some correction. So it is a non perturbative modification. Indeed, as uh, Professor Andre Linde explained, it is R square term is a new mm -hmm. modification of gravity. So it's also, um, this is one of the famous 
paper of Hawking, Hedgehog, and Real, where they explained the Starobinsky model of the brilliance of Starobinsky model of inflation and how it can uh, give solve the initial conditions problem. So uh, and can be embedded in other frameworks of quantum gravity, uh, such as string theory and all. So every conversation with him is always learning. And one of the things that I learned from Starobinsky, I was a few a couple of years ago, I was stuck by the uh, paper of Schrodinger on elliptic digital space. I was asking a lot of questions to him and he didn't agree on uh, Schrodinger's elliptic digital space and he explained the reasons and it was really pivotal for me to under, uh, find a new direction of research and uh, going into the foundations of uh, quantum field theory in curved space time, which I have been working in the last couple of years and his inputs are really amazing and it was last december 2023 i finally re read and started to understand Stravinsky's sto stochastic approach you all heard how brilliant it is it and i when i read it in the december uh, last year i felt like okay in the new year i should speak with Stravinsky and uh, learn more about stochastic approach which was very useful for a paper which i was working on back then on CMB anomalies and testing uh, uh, a new um, construction of inflation quantum fluctuation. I was excited about this result and I felt like I should speak with Stravinsky and discuss with him and get his um, feedback. Unfortunately, we lost him and it's a huge loss, uh, but I will keep uh, the memories and I keep things I learned from him for the rest of my life. And as, as I mentioned before, one, Starobinsky once in, in, the, in one of the conversations, he said, Jordan frame is a physical frame and Einstein frame is a calculational frame. I think it is important to understand the physics and we, we should understand physics from the Jordan frame. And I was very much uh, impressed by this paper when I found this uh, recent paper by Mueller and Toporinsky, they point out a new understanding of beginning of universe in Jordan frame, which is missing in the Einstein frame. So there, I think there are a lot of, still even after 40 years, what Starobinsky has started, still we are exploring it. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable. And in mathematics, uh, for, uh, there is this mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan who derived amazing results in his life. But even after 100, 100 years, people are still exploring and doing PhDs. I think Stravinsky in physics is like Ramanujan. So anyway, I think all the years of working with him changed the way I do physics. And he has inspired me a lot. And I feel it is important to do theoretical physics with observational eyes. So we should push in that direction, at least this is my point of view. And uh, I think Starobinsky's legacy will inspire not only current and future generations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stravan, for your interesting remarks. Uh, thank you. And now there is some time to have more comments if somebody want to do this. I received a letter from, for example, for Sergei Vernov. He want to make a few comments about uh, his work with Alec, Professor Alexei Stravinsky. Sergei, are you here? Yes. Okay, uh, are you ready? Do you want to share your screen? Yes, just but I have with... no light uh, to share my screen. Alexei, please give me. Yes, Alexei, please give yes. me. Yes, I'll give it. Now you have it. Mm -hmm, thank really? you. Five uh, minutes, no yes. more, because we are yes. out of time. Uh, I yes. want to say uh, a few words about our joint paper with Alexei Alexandrovich Stravinsky. Uh, really, um, was, uh, it was be, uh, written in 2017. Before this, also in 2017, we write this paper about Bianchi one cosmological model and crossing circularity. And in this paper, we uh, present early time and later time asymptotic solution in Bianchi 
one universe field by, with conformal coupled massless cloud field. And uh, Alexander Yuvich Kalinchik presents the result of the, this our paper on uh, Gisborg conference in Moscow. And after his talk, uh, Alexei Alexandrovich Tabilsky told that really he know not only asymptotic solutions, but exact solutions. And this exact solution really have been found in his diploma paper when he was a student. So what uh, he, and he sent us a few pages of his uh, uh, master thesis and we use it and uh, uh, this master thesis has been written in 1971. So, and what after this, we write our joint paper. And in this joint paper, we mention it, what, um, that as a solution of this model uh, have been obtained uh, many years ago, already 47 years ago. And in the paper, we uh, uh, study the property of the solution, which are, is very interesting for the point of view of possibility to describe singularity crossing. It was the main goal of our paper. So I want also <coughs> show um, maybe this reference. Yes, this, this is reference on the Starabinsky master degree. I think it is uh, maybe unique uh, situation that uh, some result that uh, some person get uh, that he was student, he had been published more than 40 years later and uh, will be useful uh, after all. So it's uh, Starabinsky was very unusual person, very uh, in the important scientist, and uh, I am uh, very glad that it was possible to collaborate with him. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Sergey, for your remark. Uh, more questions, please. Oh no, more comments, <laughs> I would say. Maybe somebody uh, will want to say something. Uh. Just feel free. Uh, usually our seminar is unlimited in time. So if somebody wants to say, please tell me or just uh, if we have some photo or, or something to show. Um, so maybe you can show what... Uh, can you do yourself? Question. Because I'm not, uh, I'm from Institute. I'm not very familiar with this Kazion uh, computer. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. You I, can I, show. Uh, because, uh, okay. You see? Oh, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay. Is this a movie or this is a... Uh, uh, both. A... Uh, ah, both, okay, okay. very good. Mm -hmm. Я был тогда еще, тогда еще молодым, но и достаточно сильным, но я, соответственно, помогал скачивать 
короля спустили на фоне, когда ты там обсерватория, там на учетном этаже, и там в Чемсвитом году еще лифта не было, я, говорит, помогал подтаскивать его королевского дудана на четвертом этаже. И в действительности я первый ход, он вот рассказывал свою работу по рождению Кити, обращайтесь Черный дырок уже тогда, это начали все раз говорю, это не тот момент, который он написал в своей книге, это было на три месяца раньше. Вот. Но это, значит, была первая встреча. А я вам действительно хочу рассказать подлинную историю, значит, наших с ним последних встреч. Значит, прошло уже, считайте, с 1973 по 2014, значит, сколько там, 30... 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 лет. Да, 40 лет. 40 лет. Это был, значит, я был, это моя последняя поездка в Англию. Я там был, значит, по случаю поручения мне со Садой Мухановым Полины и Грудера. Вот. И, ну и вот, значит, мы там, как говорится, я потом с ним с ним все думаю, я вам, кстати, напомню, как, как вы сами понимаете, то, что сам Сигмунд Фойкин говорить не мог, а он, он каждый раз набирал, поэтому он, естественно, выражался всегда очень лаконично, то есть вот каждое его слово нужно было, как говорится, достаточно, вот. И это уже относилось не к, не к, не к тому, что я потом сказал, а вот к тому, к тому что вот тут обсуждало, Обсуждалось много раз на этой конференции. Это вот моя эртографная, даже квадратная инфляционная модель. И вот мы с ним сидим. Ну и я, значит, там, естественно, такой, так это, немножко стал, стал вспоминать, что вот как, как мне приятно вспомнить, что я именно у вас был в Англии, именно, а я как раз был в Англии именно в тот момент, когда я фактически эту модель придумал. Это был конец 1979 -го года. Я провел два месяца в Кембридже, как раз в, и, и в группе Стивена. А вот, и сама моя вот, работа была направлена как раз я отправил фактически еще отправил оттуда, оттуда из Англии. Вот. Ну так вот, так значит, я вот ему стал рассказывать, вот, ну, в таком, как, как это в ну, естественно, вот так приятно вспомнить, что, как говорится, провел говорится, время. Вот, вот, я был в Кембридже в вашей группе, как раз в тот момент, в тот момент когда я писал свою вот самую цитированную работу про эту квадратную модель, и он мне сказал, вот это последние слова, которые я от него слышал. I underestimated. Ну, слова «и», значит, относились, естественно, как вы понимаете, по окончанию относились не ко мне, а к этой модели. Ну, вот, вот у меня последние слова, которые я подслышал от Сиги находится. Вот, ну, так вот, так вот я хочу теперь отрисовать то, что так вот, в некотором смысле, прощение к молодым, вам просто придется сталкиваться с тем, что ваши первые работы, они... И не получится. Сначала сразу должно было признать, так вот, не бояться, не нужно этого бояться, это в нашей, в нашей профессии определиться, довольно найти. Через это оно должно, должно пройти, так что и не бойтесь того, что ваши первые, первые, первые работы будут и не так, не так оценивать. Вот я за, вот я за это и поднимаю вопрос. Okay. Okay. Alexei, what do you think? Maybe you can summarize what uh, was Alexei Stravinsky uh, talk about. Uh, you mean uh, briefly translate? Uh, yes, yes, briefly translate because I just realized only in the beginning that uh, this was in Russian, not in English. So sorry, sorry. Uh, for... I can. Uh... I can briefly translate uh, because I cannot uh, say that my memory is so huge that I can memorize so many 
But uh, maybe my main idea is yes. Speech at once, even though I expect that you will ask me to translate. Uh, in short, it was uh, um, it was a short uh, clip, uh, as I understand, made by Sergei Vernov, and this happened in November 2023, so roughly uh, just a very short time before Alexis Trabinsky has passed away, and this happened in Kazan, so it was some social dinner, some banquet, and uh, well, in general, it was some um, propo some toast, some proposal for what to drink. And Alexei was uh, telling a story how he about his encounter with uh, Stephen Hawking uh, in uh, Russia, if I understood, if I remember correctly, what he said in Moscow, and uh, that uh, during this visit, it was. Uh, uh, exchange about uh, different topics and uh, in particular about black holes uh, and radiation and also during one of the conversations Stephen Hawking uh, accept Stephen Hawking affirmed that uh, inflationary model of uh, uh, Alexis Tarabinsky was underestimated from the from the beginning and uh, uh, the message which uh, Alexis Trabinsky wanted to convey to others, and now thanks to this recording, is, is conveying to us that, and especially to younger people, as he emphasized uh, to younger researchers, that it is uh, more than <clears throat> how to say it is very much probable that uh, in uh, theoretical research, first papers at the beginning may be underestimated even if they are very good and uh, you should push and go forward uh, and don't afraid such setbacks they that you just have to hope to overcome this so this is a brief translation okay thank you very much you translate my main part my more essential part yes thank you okay let's me wait a couple minutes, maybe somebody want to say more. In fact, I invited Sasha Dargov. Uh, Sasha, are you here? No, this means that something happens. Also, I dare to say that Vilenkin, Sasha Vilen Alexander Vilenkin also wrote a message that he would like to speak, but unfortunately, he is ill, so he is very sorry for that. If not, maybe we will ask all speakers if they are not against what we, what we put always talk in the uh, YouTube and in our site. If somebody is against, please uh, let us uh, about this. Because we suppose that, uh, as I understand, we suppose automatically to put all in internet. Correct? We are, we are also happy to upload the slides in our web page so if all speakers can send slides. Yes, the slides are also very, very welcome. Yes, yeah, so indeed slides are welcome and the uh, recording was especially encouraged by Ludmila Viktorovna, so I think it's totally fine if we keep recording of this uh, event. By the way, Ludmila Viktorovna is still in our institute, so let her thanks once again because she participated in all this meeting, especially her, her, her very interesting uh, presentation and her very interesting talk about Alexei. Yes. Okay, if there is no more comments, let me thank you all 
for your particip participants in this event. Thank you very much and see you on our next seminar. As I understand, the next seminar will be the 2nd May, okay? Okay, so, see you. Yes, it will be 2nd May, yes. 2nd May, yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Organizing. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed Thank you. it. Thank you. Yeah.